Dropping a chicken, huh? Hey, guys. Yeah, what, is... what do you know? Chicken's turning out to be a rooster all of a sudden. <laughs> cock a doodle doo. <laughs> cock a doodle. In case anybody here is interested, from here on in, the name is just plain Charlie Nix. <laughs> Witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Trigger Man. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Foremost Mystery Writers. Our story, written by Max Ehrlich, is different from any of the other tales you have heard in this program. Its mystery is not that of the supernatural, but of the unknown quantities in the human soul. And so, because it has suspense and complete credibility, we give you Trigger Man. Was that the door? No. No, not yet. Not that it matters. You can't get very far with a slug in your guts. But I can sit here. And when I come through that door, I'll show them what Chicken Charlie Nix can do with a gun. Sure. Maybe it'll be for the last time. But what can I lose now? Funny how it all comes back to you in the end. Just a year and a half ago that it all started. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I was standing back in the doorway waiting, waiting for some sucker to come along. It was down at the waterfront and it was plenty dark. I stood there, the rod cold in my hand, waiting. Finally, I heard footsteps. A man and a woman. I waited until they were almost opposite the doorway and then... Hey, buddy. Got a match? Why, yes, I think so. Never mind. Get your dukes up. Tell him he's got a gun. Oh, stick up, huh? Aren't you smart, sucker? Come on, reach. Get those hands up before I let you have it. Yeah. It's better. Okay, lady, let's begin with you. Oh, Tom, I... Hand over that purse. Better do as he says, Ann. All right, Tom. Thanks, lady. Thanks very much. Okay, buddy, let's have your wallet. I said come across with your wallet. Not tonight, chicken. What do you mean? Hey, wait a minute. How come you know my name? It's my job to know it. In your face, too. The name's Riley. From headquarters. Tom Riley? Plain clothes? Yeah. Keep up those hands. Keep them up or I'll drill you. I know you won't, chicken. Tom. Not for a lot more than I've got in my wallet. Tom, what are you doing? He'll kill you. I don't think he will. Will you, chicken? Keep away from me, Flatfoot. Don't come a step near you, here. Another step and I'll splatter you all over the sidewalk. You haven't got the nerve, chicken. You know it and I know it. Now, drop that gun. Keep away, keep away, do you hear? I ain't afraid to shoot. I'll tell you, I'll let you have it. Then what are you waiting for? What? You... That was for the gun, chicken. And this is for you. No, hold me up. No, no, you yellow belly rat. Pull the gun on me, will you? Oh, Tom. It's okay, Ann. It's all over. You could have been killed walking straight into a hold-up man and knocking the gun out of his hand. Well, I knew he wouldn't shoot, Ann. You know, you knew? 
But how? His name is Charlie Nix. Chicken Charlie. Well, he... Oh, he carries a gun, yeah, but he's not a gunman. Because he's never used it and he never will. Just plain chicken-hearted. Yellow. That's why they call him chicken. Still, still you took an awful chance, Tom. There's always the first time. <laughs> not for Chicken Charlie. Now then, you see if you can find a phone, honey, and call headquarters okay. while I keep an eye on this yellow skunk here. Yeah, that's the way it was. I just didn't have the nerve to put the blast on anyone. Sometimes in my room, I'd put my gun on a table and just look at it. I'd keep thinking, if I only had the nerve, I'd be one of Angelo Danelli's trigger men instead of his errand boy. The rest of the mob would respect me instead of slapping me around and calling me chicken. That's what got me more than anything else, the way they laughed and called me chicken. It wasn't that I didn't try. That time I held up Riley, I was going to let him have it. I wanted to, but I don't know, at the last minute I got all cold inside. My fingers got stiff and numb. And it cost me a year and a pen. The day after I got out, I was sitting in the Boulevard Cafe, having myself a beer, when in walked the boss, Angie Danelli. It's great having you back, chicken. Thanks, Angie. Thanks. By the way, I saw an old pal of yours the other day. Yeah? Who? Tom Riley. Riley, huh? Yeah, it's too bad you didn't knock him off that night, chicken. Yeah. But one of these days, Angie, I'm going to meet him, and then I'll... Sure, kid, I know how you feel. After all, when a guy takes your gun away and makes you look like a chump. Yeah, yeah, he made me look like a chump, all right. But I'm different now, Angie. That you're in a clink, well, I, I got a different kind of nerve now. Wait and see. Sure, I'm, I'm gonna... sure, but take it easy, kid. There's plenty of time, plenty. You just got out of stir, and you got yourself to worry about. What do you mean, Angie? I... Did my time, didn't I? I'm in a clear. Sure, chicken, sure. But if you ask me, the pen didn't do you any good. You, well, you look kind of all in. You don't feel so good, do you? What? What makes you say that, Angie? Oh, I don't know. Your face ain't got any color, and you're breathing hard all the time. Well, I, I, I feel okay. Sure. I ain't saying anything's wrong with you, chicken. But you never can tell until a good doc checks you over, huh? Yeah. Maybe you're right, Angie. Maybe... Maybe I ought to see a doctor, huh? Now you're talking sense, kid. Tell you what I'll do. I'll take you to my own doctor, Dr. Leonard. He's a big specialist, and he'll give you the once-over right. Yeah, yeah, but he... He probably comes high, and forget I... Forget just... it, chicken. Forget it. I'll take care of it. Won't cost you a dime. Hey, that's pretty white of you, Angie. <laughs> Think nothing of it, kid. After all, you're one of my boys, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. am. Well, if there's one thing Angie Donnelly does, it's to take care of his boys. A couple of days later, Angie Donnelly set up an appointment for me with this Dr. Leonard. I went to his office and he gave me a real checkup from soup to nuts. And when he got through, I... Well, I didn't like the look on his face. Sit down, Mr. Nix, and uh, let's talk. Doc, what's the matter? Did you find something wrong? <clears throat> Care for a cigarette? Never mind, Mr. Allen. Doc, give it to me straight. Is it good or bad? I'm sorry, but it's bad. You mean my... my chest? It isn't your chest. It's your heart. My... My heart? What about it? Well, you've got a severe aneurysm there. A what? What's that mean? Yeah, it means that you've got a serious weakness of the heart muscle wall. Yeah, yeah, but how serious? I'm sorry, Mr. Nix, but you haven't got more than six months to live. Six months? Yeah, that's what he said. Six months to live. For a while, I didn't get it. You don't get things like that right away, and then... Six months, and He gave me six months to live. Someday I'll be just walking along and maybe sleeping, and then it'll... it'll come. It's tough, chicken. Plenty tough. Yeah. I know how you feel. Nobody knows how I feel. Except maybe a guy in a death house. Yeah. That's what it's like. Like knowing when you're gonna burn, waiting for it. Take it easy, chicken. Yeah. 
Have another drink. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andy. You're, you're okay, okay. Maybe the doc was wrong. There's always a chance. No, no, Angie. Check me twice just to make sure. There ain't a thing I can do, not a thing, except wait for it. Just sit around and wait to croak. Listen, kid. You've got six months to live. Okay. You know what I'd do if I had six months to live? What? What would you do? I'd live. Huh? Yeah, I'd spend all my time living. Champagne, dames, I'd have them all. I'd do all the things I ever wanted to do but didn't have the nerve to do before. You see what I mean, kid? I'd live a lifetime in six months. Sure, sure, but that takes dough. You can get the dough? How? Oh. From me. Huh? Look, chicken... You always wanted to be a trigger man, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I'm hiring you right here and now. At 500 a week. 500? But, Angie, you know I ain't got the nerve Sure you have, but it's different now. You don't have to be afraid of a thing. Not a thing. Well, you can go around blasting guys like clay pigeons if you want to. But suppose the cops nail me. What do you care? Suppose they send you to the death house. You got nothing to lose anyway, have you? Your heart's bad, ain't it? You've only got a little while anyway, either way. Yeah. That's right, Angie. That's right. What can I lose? Danelli was right. This was my chance. I packed a new gap and started to look for Riley. Riley, the dick who'd set me up. Yeah, he was going to be number one. He'll be coming along here any minute, kid. Yeah, yeah. This is it, chicken. There's Riley. There he is. No, chicken, not yet. Wait till he comes closer. Look, Angie, hey, I... The first one that comes hardest, kid. The rest are easy. <laughs> Look at him, pal. He knows from nothing. Take your beat on him. You can't miss. Okay, chicken, go ahead. Let him have it. Go ahead. Blast him. <laughs> you did it. You did it. Uh, yeah, I... I guess I did. Flat on the sidewalk, colder than yesterday's hash. You did it, Charlie. Angie, I... I you... You just called me Charlie. Sure, kid, why not? You're not chicken anymore. Now, maybe we better get out of here. away up the street, leaving the body lying there in a pool of blood as the clock strikes 12 for murder at midnight. to Murder at Midnight, to the story of Trigger Man. Where are they anyway? I'm getting kind of anxious to see them. Even, even with a slug in my gut, I'll be able to give them quite a reception. Funny how a guy can change. How different it's all been since I put the blast on Riley. That was my first and the toughest one. After that, it was easy. There were plenty of guys in Angie Danelli's way, and I aimed to please. Whenever I watch one of them fold up with that funny expression on his face, why, well, it kind of helped. It helped me to forget how it was with me. It was like a champagne drunk. But then the hangover would come, and... I'd remember that I had less than six months to live myself. Yeah, I was a different guy, all right. Take what happened a couple of days after I got Riley. We was having a meeting up at the hideaway on a new job when a character named Bummy Devine started shooting his mouth off. Hey, chicken. Still carrying around that pop gun of yours? What did you call me? Chicken. Ain't that your name? The name is Charlie. Charlie Nix. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you know? Chicken's turning out to be a rooster all of a sudden. Cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> Cock-a-doodle. 
In case anybody else here is interested, the name from here in is just plain Charlie Nix. <laughs> they didn't laugh after that. No one did again, ever. I was it. I took chances where no other trigger man would. Why not? What'd I have to lose? In a few months, I'd be through anyway. There was a difference. Meanwhile, I lived. I painted the town red, bought myself tailored suits, hit the clubs every night, the gambling joints. <laughs> and the dames, why well, I had to fight them off. You can do a lot with 500 bucks a week. Sure, I was hot, plenty hot. The cops couldn't figure out at the beginning who was doing all the fancy gun work, but they were getting warm and they were getting close. I had to watch myself. And then one night, we were knocking off a fur warehouse. I was in the lookout car out front when suddenly... Hey, Charlie, a prowl car. Yeah, come on, Mike. Let's get out of here. Hey, they're shooting at us. Tommy guns. Hang on, Charlie. Here they come right after us. Hold it steady, Mike. I'm going to try to nail a tire. Charlie, Charlie, what's the matter? Uh, I'm hit. Keep, keep going, Mike. Got a ditch in my. I. Uh, uh, uh. When I opened my eyes, there was a smell of chloroform, and the doctor was just putting away some instruments. Mike was there too, with a gat in his hand, making sure that the doc would cooperate. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? I, I don't know. What happened? The doc here just dug a slug out of your chest. Oh. How am I, how am I doing, doc? You'll be all right. Lucky you've got a good heart. Otherwise, you'd never have made it. What? Did, did you say my heart was good? That's right. But I don't get it. I... I Thought I had a bad ticket. They told me I didn't have more than a few months to live. <laughs> With that heart, my friend, you can live to be a hundred. That is, if the police don't interfere. I spent three weeks late up after that in bed. And every day the boss would send me flowers, comic books, and all kinds of stuff. A real thoughtful guy, Angie. But I was thoughtful, too. There were some things I had to add up for myself. I had to find out whether I was living on borrowed time or not. As soon as I could walk, I made a beeline for Angie Danelli's specialist, Doc Leonard. But I found out right away that Doc Leonard didn't live there anymore. A dentist was in the office instead. Then I looked up the superintendent. Yes, I'm in charge here. What can I do for you? If it's a bottle it of... It isn't. I'm looking for Dr. Leonard. Dr. Leonard? Oh, the one that was in the dentist's office before. That's right. You know where he went? No, he didn't leave any forwarding address. It's a funny thing about him. Yeah? Why? Why, he paid us a month's rent in advance and moved in, equipment and everything. But he only stayed two days. Moved out at night. No notice, nothing. Just came and went. I see. Never could figure it out. That's the way it was. Sorry, I couldn't be of more help, mister. That's okay. You've told me enough. All I want to know. So that was it. I had the answer. I went home, took my old gun out of the drawer, slipped it into my shoulder holster. It felt good there. Just like old times. I was just putting on my hat and coat when the phone rang. Hello. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? Fine, Angie. Fine. Funny thing you calling up just now. Yeah, why? I was just thinking of you. Where are you now? I'm over at my apartment. Uh, listen, kid, do you feel well enough to do a little job for me tonight? I feel fine, fine. Well, that's well. Drop over to my place right away. Okay, I'll be right over. And, Angie. Yeah? Thanks for everything. The flowers and stuff. <laughs> Pal 
funny how a guy acts sometimes. I remember in the cab on the way over, I was like ice, cold inside and out. I should have been excited, but I wasn't. I came up to Angie's apartment and knocked on the door. Yeah, who is it? Me, Charlie. Oh, okay. Come on in, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Well, you're up and around, huh, kid? It's great, great. Yep, not that it makes much difference. You see, Angie, my six months is supposed to be up tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know something, Angie? I feel fine, fine. And yet... I'm supposed to croak. Well, it's just like I said, kid. Maybe Doc Leonard was wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe he was wrong, you know, made a mistake. Sure, sure. So, this afternoon, I went up to see him. You would... You did, huh? Yeah, yeah. And you know what, Angie? He doesn't live there anymore. No. In fact, he only set up practice there a couple of days. Kind of set me to wondering. Uh Uh-huh. Wondering, uh... What? Whether this Doc Leonard wasn't a doctor after all, but just a phony. I, uh, I don't get it. Why, uh, why should he be? Suppose you tell me, Angie. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh? And suppose I tell you, Angie. This Doc Leonard was your boy. Between you, you framed me with this bad heart gag. You needed a gunster who could take chances and... I was your pigeon. Wait a minute, Charlie. I've It was easy, wasn't it, then, Ellie? Talking a chump like me into it. When I thought I only had six months to go. You knew I wouldn't be afraid anymore. Sure. What could I lose? And so you got me to do your dirty work for you while you were somewhere else with an airtight alibi. And when the heat was turned on, you knew it'd be on me. (laughs) You're wrong, kid. You see, you were supposed to live six months... And that's all you're going to live. Don't do any reaching, Angie. Don't! You... You taught me how to use a gun, Angie. You should have just let me stay. Chicken Charlie Nicks. Yeah. Yeah, he got me in the belly with his first one. But I got him before he could repeat. There he is. Lying on his own rug, soaking in his blood. As for me, well, there ain't much I can do but wait. Somebody must have heard the shots, called the cops. Funny how I feel now. How different it is. When you think of it, If I'd stayed Chicken Charlie, I wouldn't be here now with a slug in my guts. Like the doc said, I could have lived to be maybe a hundred. Well, if it ain't old Chicken Charlie. Hello, copper. What did you call me? Why, we've been looking all over for you, Chicken, but it looks like somebody saved the state some dough. Not yet. I've still got enough stuff to stay where you are. Don't come any close to you, hear? No? Why not, chicken? Because I'm a killer, that's why. Because I got nothing to live for anyway. Keep away from me, do you hear? Keep away from Oh, what? Give me that rod. Oh, stop, you can't. Sure I can, punk. Once a chicken, always a chicken. <laughs> His eyes wide and incredulous, the hunched figure slips from the deep armchair, falls to the floor, next to the body of the man he killed. And somewhere in the distance, a clock in a church steeple starts chiming for... Murder at midnight. Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Wendy Barry.
Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door into a gay little world of homicidal maniacs, vampires, ghosts, werewolves, and uh, assorted forms of sudden and gory death. <laughs> friends, if you ever walk through a cemetery at midnight and see a girl whose hair is on fire and is carrying her head under her arm, you know what to tell her, don't you? Just say, uh, keep a cool head on your shoulders, toots. <laughs> and run like crazy. Hmm. I suppose you think that kind of advice will help her. Why, of course, Mary. What else could you say to a girl whose hair is on fire? Wait, I know what you'd tell her. You'd say, my dear, why don't you cool off with a glass of Lipton's iced tea? <laughs> I declare, you sure think of Lipton's at the strangest times. But you know, folks, come to think about it, this is a strange time of year. The days are hot, and yet the nights are apt to be a bit chilly. Yes, this is the time when people keep cool with a refreshing pitcher of Lipton's iced tea while the sun's on the rampage, and then later, after sundown, a hot cup of Lipton seems to taste just right. And do you know the reason why Lipton's hot or iced is always so welcome and satisfying? Well, it's because Lipton's has that famous brisk flavor. That word brisk... B-R-I-S-K means that Lipton tea tastes fresh and, and full-bodied. It's never flat or wishy-washy. That's right, folks. You just don't know how good tea can be till you've tried Lipton's. And now, friends, get ready to try a new kind of inner sanctum story. It's called The Murder Prophet. And it's an original radio play by Milton Lewis, who copied it from a tombstone. <laughs> Yes, and our star tonight is that glamorous Hollywood movie star, Wendy Barry, who plays the role of Claudia Dale. All right. Clear the floor and give your flesh room to creep. Ready? Now, let's hear Claudia tell us the story in her own words. <laughs> At exactly midnight, I saw him for the first time. My headlights picked him up when he hailed me along a lonely stretch of road near my home. I wouldn't have stopped, but the storm was so fierce, I felt sorry for him. I drew up to the side of the road. Thank you. Going far? No, not far. Where to? I'll let you know. Oh, what's that? Where? There on the side. Tombstone. Oh, there's a cemetery where I picked you up. Yes, Birchlawn. Cigarette? No, thank you. I don't smoke. He said nothing for a few minutes. In the reflection of the dashboard light, I saw his face for the first time. Sunken eyes. Hollow cheeks. Mouth set in a queer grin. A skull, barely covered with a thin layer of milk-white flesh. With a start, I, I realized he was staring at me. I've seen you before. Oh, I, I don't think we've met. No, I know you. Are you sure? Yes. I would never forget someone so beautiful. Oh, really? You're Claudia Dale. Why, yes. You're married to Howard Dale. That's right. But I, I don't seem to place you. No, you wouldn't. I know quite a lot about you. Do you really? Your first husband was Willard Banks. How did you know that? He died eight years ago, a suicide. Who are you? You don't know me. Be careful, you're speeding. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize... You're trembling. How do you know so much about me? I just know. Oh, really? I suppose you have second sight or some such rubbish. It is not rubbish. Then tell me where I'm coming from. Pittsfield. You guessed. You went there to visit a sick friend, Martha Walston. But you, you couldn't guess that. You're going too fast. You're losing control. No, I'm not. I'm quite all right. I, I can go fast if I choose to. I shall go as fast as I wish. Would you care to know more of yourself? No. No, I do not find your little trick particularly amusing. Besides, I... What, what else do you think you can tell me about myself? Your future. Uh, Nonsense. Your husband is dead. Howard? Murdered. Oh, you're lying. You'll find his body on the floor near the piano of your living room when you get home. 
that are two bullets in his head. Get out of here. Get out of this car. Get out. You hear me? Get out. Very well. It happens that this is where I wish to go. Good night, and thank you, Mrs. Dale. You vanished into the shadows on the side of the road. And then I noticed something white and shining queerly in the spot where he disappeared. I looked closely. It was another tombstone in another cemetery. I raced madly for home, fighting the hysteria that seized me. The nightlight was burning in the living room. It couldn't be true. Howard would take me in his arms and kiss me when I stepped into the house. I rang the bell. No answer. Somehow I managed to get the key in the lock. I ran into the living room. Don't move. Who is it? Right behind you. I've got a gun. Oh, a gun. Do it in the body. Who are you? Turn around. Oh, you. You murdered him. Keep quiet. Don't come near me. Sit down. Don't touch me. I said sit down. Please. Sorry, I had to slap you. You were losing control. You don't have to scream for the police. Here's my badge. You? Detective Sergeant Quinn. Homicide. Oh, I thought you were... Yes, I know. Drink this. Thanks. Feel better? Yeah, much. Who is he? My husband. Sure? Positive. When was he killed? About 20 hours ago. Before yesterday morning. How do you know? One of the bullets went wild, hit that clock on the mantel. Where were you yesterday morning? Pittsfield. I stayed with a sick friend, Martha Wallstone. Now, look at these things. I took them out of his pocket. Are they all his? Yes. Where... Where's the snake ring? There were no rings. But he had one. It was quite valuable. He was never without it. I gave it to him. All right, now, look. Did he wear it on the third finger of his left hand? Yes, sir. There's a mark, but no ring. When did you come here? I drove in behind you. You left the front door open. I think I know who killed him. Who? A man I met on the road coming here. He knew my husband had been murdered. He did, huh? He even said his body would be near the piano. When did you see this guy? Oh, 10, 20 minutes ago. Picked him up on the road. Where? At Birchlawn Cemetery. Where'd you drop him? At another cemetery near here. He... He seemed to walk behind one of the tombstones. Oh, I know it sounds mad. But it happened just as I said. What's his name? I don't know. But he looked like... Like a human cadaver. Like a man who's dead and... You don't believe me. Why'd you kill your husband? What? What are you saying? You heard me. I told you I was in Pittsfield. Why'd you go there? Martha was ill. Were you there at four yesterday morning? Of course. Stop shouting at me. I told you who killed him. What are you trying to do to me? Isn't it enough to come home and find Howard like that without you trying to... Oh, in heaven's name, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Not a scotch, lady? No. No, thanks. Here, keep the change. I'm leaving. Sit down, Mrs. Dale. Don't go in. Ew. Yes. Won't you please sit down? Yes. Didn't expect to find you here. Nor are you. Are they making it difficult? It's a nightmare. You told them about me? Yes. You shouldn't have. They wouldn't understand. Did you kill him? Would you care for another drink, Mrs. Dale? No. Who are you? I'll tell you later. Why'd you come here? To talk to you. I knew I'd find you here. Yes, yes, you knew. You're not so skeptical now. No. What did you want to tell me? That you are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen and that I love you. I've loved you since I first saw you seven years ago. When you came here to live with your husband. Is that why you... Why I killed him? Is that what you meant to say? Yes, I... I'm not an ordinary man, Mrs. Dale, but I'm not a fool. 
Now, on this card, you'll find my name, address, and telephone. Do you really believe I'd phone you? Yes. There will come a time when you shall want love. Good night, Mrs. Dale. Good night. Hello? Operator, get me police headquarters and hurry, please. Yes? That's him, Detective Quinn. That's Garth Dragman. Thank you, Mrs. Dale. Do you mind coming down to headquarters, Mr. Dragman? Not at all. Did she tell you that I murdered her husband? Yes. I thought she would. I'm not angry, Mrs. Dale, and what I told you earlier this evening still goes. I'll come along right now, Mr. Quinn. I didn't sleep a wink that night. Twice I got out of bed and drove to police headquarters. The lights were blazing in Quinn's office. I went in the third time. I couldn't bear waiting. Oh, Mrs. Dale. Well? Glad you stopped by. Checked everything Dragman said. Seemed he was in the same bar and grill where you met him tonight when your husband was killed. You believed him? Naturally. Bartender and several regular customers backed up a story. Seems they all left together after the place was closed to play poker. Well, what about the things he said to me in the car? How could he know about the murder before you or I? That I don't know. Perhaps he does have second sight. Odd looking fellow, isn't he? Can't arrest a man for murder because of that. He's criminally insane, I tell you. I know he is. My dear Mrs. Dale. Oh. What's the use? I loved Howard. I loved him to the point of insanity. Otherwise, there was no accounting for the things I did when I left police headquarters. I was determined to find the man who murdered my husband. It was towards dawn when I made up my mind what to do. I went to Garth Dragman's home. I was about to ring the doorbell when... Don't ring, Mrs. Dale. The door is open. Come in. You... You were expecting me? Yes, I was expecting you. Do you still think that I killed him? Uh, I don't know what to think anymore. Do you want me to find the person who murdered him? Yes, more than anything in the whole world. See, I have strange gifts, Mrs. Dale... And I do believe I understand the mind of a criminal. That mad impulse to crime. That strange, twisted desire to take a living being. A creature of arrogance and power. And make it a corroding, lifeless mass of flesh fit for worms. (gasps) You're shocked? Crime is a shocking, evil thing. And only a man with a brain of a genius can succeed at it. And only a man with a greater brain can trap a successful criminal. I'll find your murderer for you, Mrs. Dale. On one condition. What's that? That you marry me. I felt my body turn to ice. I knew I was talking to a madman. I was sure I was talking to the man who'd murdered my husband. It's not so hard to predict a murder. I can do it. It's easy. I predict that there'll be at least one murder every week on Inner Sanctum. Good gracious, yes. You you might say it's worth a character's life to appear on this program. Oh, don't feel sorry for them, Mary. Don't forget they can always make a comeback as a ghost on next week's show. In fact, I predict that Claudia's husband will be around one of these Tuesdays. All right, now it's my turn to make a prediction. And I predict that during the coming fall and winter, more people will drink Lipton tea than any other brand. Oh, you said that last year. Yes, and it came true then, just as it will now. Folks just naturally seem to prefer Lipton's. If you'd ask a tea expert to explain this preference, he'd say it's because Lipton's has a brisk flavor. You see, that word brisk... B-R-I-S-K is a technical word. Brisk means that Lipton tea always tastes fresh and tangy. Yes, full-bodied and vigorous. Never flat or insipid. So, folks, even if you're not a regular tea drinker, you should try Lipton's. That brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. (sighs) All right. Let's get back to the other world now. The world of creeping, crawling horrors. 
I'll bet you think that Garth Dragman can't really foretell murders. Or do you think that Claudia doesn't have the courage to trap this homicidal Romeo? Or is he the killer? Well, we let our star, Wendy Barry, in the role of Claudia tell you. Go ahead, Claudia. Shock him into the shakes. Two weeks later, I married Garth Dragman. He was the strangest man I ever knew. He would disappear for days at a time... and then suddenly turn up without warning. He had all the money he wanted... yet I never knew where it came from. There was a closet in his room... which was always kept locked and bolted. I knew from the way he acted about it... that the closet contained the answer... to all the things I wanted to know about him. One night while he was away... I obtained tools and tried to force the lock. Good evening, Claudia. Oh, God. You didn't expect me back, did you? <laughs> no, I... I knew I... you'd try to open that closet someday. Oh, well, why do you keep it locked? So that no one but myself shall know what's in there. Not even I? You in particular. But, God, I... You'll not attempt to open it again, will you, Claudia? No. Forgive me for striking you. I, uh... Not quite myself tonight, I... Sometimes do things I regret when these moods come upon me. He sat down. He seemed terribly exhausted, completely spent. But there was a strange, wild light in his eyes. He seemed like a man intoxicated with some strange drug that few men know the taste of. You do forgive me, don't you, Claudia? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. See, it's something that, that few people know, Claudia, but a person who has... Extraordinary powers carries an extraordinary burden. You mean your gift of prophecy? Yes, I uh, didn't want to mention it. It seems to upset you so. Oh, it doesn't frighten me any longer. Did you read in the newspaper about a woman's body being found in the river? She'd been murdered, garroted. Yes, it was in this evening's paper. They don't know who she is. I can tell you who she is. Josephine Ford. A stupid girl, Claudia. I could have told you that she'd be murdered three days ago. How do you know these things? Because I see them. A sort of vision. Now I'm seeing another vision. It's a house, 346 Harbor Street. Near the waterfront, a young woman lies in bed reading. She's very attractive. In an hour, she'll be dead. When the police come, they'll find her body decapitated. The criminal did this to destroy her identity. But who is the criminal? What difference does it make? He'll never be caught. Uh, uh, Garth, while you were gone, Martha Wallstone telephoned. She's ill again. Oh. She asked me to come up immediately. Why didn't you go? Well, I was waiting for you to get home before I left. You want to leave immediately? If you don't mind. It's really an emergency. You may go, Claudia. I shall go to sleep. I'm extremely tired. It took only a few minutes to get to the waterfront. I found the house at 346 Harbor Street. I went in. The lamp in the bedroom was burning. I looked at the bed. I... I fainted. Hey, Mrs. Dale. You think you can sit up now? Detective Quinn. Yes. Hardly expected to find you here. I came because Garth Dragman predicted this would happen. Oh, Mrs. Dale. Oh, you still don't believe me? You're a strange woman, all right. You accused this man of killing your husband, and then you married him. I suppose you're going to accuse him of this murder, too. Yes. This and heaven only knows how many others. Mrs. Dale, do you realize that you haven't got a single piece of evidence to back up your contention? I'll get the evidence tonight. Will you let me have a gun? No. Will you be near my house? I... I need protection. Oh, after all. What must I do to convince you what he is? I've risked my own life. I'm willing to risk it again. He's a monster. Are you going to wait until he murders me before you believe what I say? All right. I'll give it a try. I'll come back to your house with you. If you want me for an emergency, smash the window pane. We drove back together. I dropped Detective Quinn on the corner. The house seemed deserted when I came in. But I wasn't taking any chances. I went to the kitchen, got a knife, hid it in the folds of the long-sleeved gown I was wearing. I went into Garth's room. He wasn't there. But the closet door was open. 
What I saw in there nearly made me ill. Clothes. Dark clothes. Some of them soaked in blood. I forced myself to examine them. Then I found something that made my heart beat faster. A little jewelry case. I'll take that, Claudia. Oh, God. Give me that jewelry case, oh, no. please. No, don't take it. Thank you. Garth. Get away from that window, Claudia. Go on. Oh, don't shoot, Garth. You were so anxious to see what's in that closet. Well, now you have. And perhaps you'd like to see the latest addition to my collection. It's in this box. That box? Yes, Claudia. A hat box. Garth! Sit down, Claudia. <sighs> What are you going to do? Tell you who killed your husband. You? No. You. You're insane. I've written out a confession for you to sign. What'll happen if I don't sign it? Well, I credited you with more imagination. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Yes, read it. Please. Sit over here, away from that window. Yes. I, Claudia Dale, murdered my first husband, Willard Banks, for his insurance by administering poison. My first husband? Yes, Claudia. See, I mean to make this document strong enough to send you to your death if I wish. I've got all the details here, just how you murdered your first husband, how you killed your second. Shall I go on? No. You know it's all a lie. Will you sign it? Of course not. Just what is your game anyway? If you want to kill me, why don't you shoot? You've been very successful before. There's no reason you shouldn't succeed again. Go on, shoot. You put me in a very difficult position, Claudia. You see, you have found out certain things about me. Things that could cost me my life. I will not tell you again to get away from that window, Claudia. I should prefer to see you live because I love you. But I shouldn't hesitate to murder you. You love me? Yes, you haven't taken me in your arms once since I know you. The right time had not arrived. What do you consider the right time? When I feel that you understand me. When I feel that you, who murdered two men, understand the deep and strange cravings and desires that race in my blood. You really believe I'm a murderess? Of course. That's why I love you. Then the time is now. The time? To take me in your arms. Claudia. He still held the gun. He wasn't more than two inches from me. I turned my lips up to him. I twisted my body to get out of the range of his revolver. When I felt his lips touch mine, I slowly let the knife slip into my hand. Slowly, caressingly. I drew my hand up towards his neck. Then I plunged the blade in. Gloria! Detective Quinn! Hurry! I'm going. What happened? I killed him. And here's the proof that he murdered my husband. I, I found it in the jewelry case he had in his pocket. It's the snake ring that was missing from my husband's body. Now do you believe me? <laughs> That's the whole story. I realize that you, as the district attorney, must know all the facts. There they are. Thank you. There are a few points in the story that interest me particularly. First, the confession that he asked you to sign. What about it? The confession says that you went out in Pittsfield at 4 a.m. when your husband was killed. She gave your friend Martha Wallstone a sleeping pill, drove her down here, shot your husband, drove back to Pittsfield, turned Miss Wallstone's bedside clock to 4.15 and wakened her. And you gave her the medicine. She thought it was 4.15 and went back to sleep. Garth was very clever at things like that. He had extraordinary brilliance of the insane. And just one question. Was that the way you murdered Howard Dale? I? Oh, but Garth murdered him. The ring proves it. He never had the ring. You put it in the jewelry box. I, I can't believe what you say. Garth was a homicidal maniac. He predicted the death of the people he murdered... My dear woman, don't you know yet? Know what? Garth Dragon was a detective working out of my office. <gasps> That's how he knew about those deaths. Oh. He was put on the case because we suspected you of murdering your first husband as well as your second. A detective? Yes. 
And you're going to die for killing him. It's extremely daring and clever of you to murder him. But you never would have gotten away with it if he hadn't kissed you. He kissed you because he fell in love with you. That poor fool. <laughs> That just goes to prove that you should never pick up hitchhikers who come out of cemeteries at midnight. And I bet you've guessed the moral for our story. It's taken from a famous quotation that uh, Harry the Hangman uttered during a nightmare. Never steal the rings of people you murder on account of that's robbery. <laughs> My goodness, you call that a moral. That's one of the most immoral things I've ever heard you say. All right, Mary, I'll take it back. Yeah, here's one you really like. There's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip ton. That's why teaspoons were invented. <laughs> well, that's very clever. But I guess the reason they're called teaspoons is because people drink tea so many times during the day. Yes, folks enjoy that brisk Lipton tea not just at mealtime, but between meals as well, such as when friends drop in for a visit. That's why it's a good idea always to keep a good supply on hand. So, folks, ask for Lipton tea in the larger, more economical size packages. And now here's a cheerful little thought. You can let a man murder you once, but um, you'd have to be a stiff to let him do it again. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's inner sanctum mystery novel is Puzzle for Wantons by Patrick Quentin. Yes, and next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a woman with canary yellow eyes, murderous eyes. Everyone she looks at, she wants to kill. And you know what? She keeps a harpoon in her house. Well, well, you never know what's going to harpoon next. <laughs> And I'm afraid it's time to close the squeaking door. So, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Oh, Our host. Hello oh. there, Blackie. Hello, Roger. It's about time you came over and talked to us. Blackie, it's good to see you. I was hoping you could come. All you had to do was urge me with one invitation. <laughs> oh, Mary, this is Roger Masters, our host. Roger and Miss Mary Wesley. Oh, this is a real pleasure, Miss Wesley. I've heard about you. Oh, since I've known Blackie, I'm afraid a lot of people have heard about me. Oh, Blackie has a way of getting around. Yes, everything, including me. Now, Mary, you know Don... At the sound of the next loud noise, one subject will be dropped. <laughs> Say, Roger, huh? is that your brother Harvey at the piano? Oh, yes. Under that delightful coat of tan is my very undelightful brother. He's just back from Georgia. With Georgia. Uh, I beg your pardon. Will you say that again, please? He's back from the state of Georgia with a bride-to-be by the name of George. Oh. She's the redhead uh, to the left of the piano. What number of bride-to-be is she? When I run out of fingers, I can't count. <laughs> but you'd think it was true love by the talk they give each other. <laughs> Must be great listening. Yankee drool and southern drawl. Oh, <laughs> Say, I haven't seen our hostess. Well, there should be down by now. I can't understand what's delaying her. Perhaps a diamond. She always fusses when she wears it. Is the family diamond really as big as they say it is, Mr. Masters? Miss Wesley, the Masters diamond is the biggest thing in our family. And wearing it is about the biggest thing we do. We're rather useless lot, you know. I don't know that at all. Stick around for 40 years and you'll find out. <laughs> Say, Roger, what kind of a party is this? Look who's coming. Oh, I don't know that man. Well, but... I do. It's Inspector oh. Faraday. All right, everybody. Quiet here. Huh? Stop that piano. What's the matter, Inspector? Don't you like music? 
Blackie, what are you doing here? Enjoying myself till now. What brings you here, Inspector? What brings me here? Just that the master's diamond is missing. What? And Mrs. Masters is upstairs murdered. What? And I'm going to stay here till I find out what this is all about. When's the stone cracker coming? Joe be a pretty soon, Pete. Ain't it a shame, ain't it? And what a shame. So we gotta bust up this rock and cut somebody in besides. We either cut Joe in to bust this rock, or we bust rocks for a bunch of years. But ain't it a shame, ain't it? What you using for a brain, Pete? This your master diamond is as easy to spot as a gorilla in a birdcage. It's gotta be busted up. Is it really on a level that he can slice it in one whack, huh? I've seen Joe work. First he looks at the rock, all which ways. Second, he throws light on it, like he was looking for something on its inside. Third, he draws all kinds of lines on it, this way and that way. Then he puts it on a table in a little cup. Yeah? Then he's got a hammer in one hand and a chisel-looking thing in his other hand. And he puts the chisel on top of the rock, and he goes tap with the hammer, and right there in front of you, that one big, beautiful diamond, is a lot of little rocks. Ain't it a shame, ain't it? It ain't a shame when you gotta eat. There's money in your pocket because you sold those little rocks. Yeah. And nobody can trace nothing to us because old lady masters never saw us. Yeah, Pete. We did this one right. We grab what we're after and nobody sees us to tell the cops what happened. Hey, Lemmy. Huh? What's that extra? I don't know. Open the window, huh? Yeah, sure. Do you hear that? Hear it. It's shouting at me. Close the window quick. Yeah, sure. Hey, this is bad. Damn's croaked, huh? Hey, you gotta do something. Yeah, but what, Lemmy? But why? I don't know. I don't know. I gotta think. They'll get us for murder, Lemmy. Unless I get an idea first. I gotta. I gotta. <laughs> Search next, Rollins. And let's make it snappy. I want to get out there in the living room and question that whole bunch together. Blackie's next on the list, Inspector Faraday. Blackie, huh? Good. Get him in here. Okay, Blackie. You're next. How are you this evening, Rollins? Okay, Blackie. I don't have to ask you how you are, Faraday. I know. As confused as ever. Uh, don't bother to make wisecracks, Blackie. And don't bother to sit down. Around you, everything's a bother. Quiet, Blackie. I'll start with your coat, Blackie. Uh, you're not starting with anything, Rollins. We're not searching this guy. Oh, but... Faraday, are you sick? Here, Rollins, start with my coat. Uh, the only starting we're going to do is you. Out of here. What? Well, I don't get this, Faraday. You catch me at the scene of the crime. I admit to you that I was upstairs about the time of the murder, and all you want to do is get rid of me. Now, is that being smart? Uh, there's a law against all I want to do where you're concerned. Concerned? Say, I'm glad you mentioned that, because I'm plenty concerned. Here I am in, in a house with a body, and, and you find it first... Say, how did you do it, Faraday? Well, the upstairs maid phoned me, and I told her not to say anything to anybody. While you were still downstairs... Hey, it's none of your business how I found the body. Now get out of here. Are you sure you don't want me to give Bronze my coat? I said get out of here. Oh, please now, Faraday. Be yourself for a change. I admit I was upstairs for a few minutes before the maid found the body. I know that. I admit I'd like to own the master's diamond. I know that. Well, then why don't you think I'm a first-class suspect? Because you're much too smart about this whole thing. You don't deny anything. You don't offer any alibi. You don't even try to get away from me. So you don't figure in this case at all. I don't figure, and you can't. All right, Faraday. Have it your own way. I intend to. Now, get out of here. Say please. Please. Get out of here. <laughs> so long, Faraday. Yeah, for my money, you can make it longer than so. <laughs> Very good, Inspector. Very good. Gosh, Inspector, you shouldn't have let him go. Rollins, you think I'm a sap? He wouldn't have that diamond on him. He'd... He'd laugh at me for weeks because we didn't find it. But don't you think he had anything to do with this? Put two men on detail to follow Blackie wherever he goes. I not only think he had something to do with this, I think maybe he did it. Oh, for once, Mary, I really enjoy just sitting here in my apartment and not even thinking about mm -hmm. murder. But, Blackie, what I'd like to know is why did Inspector Faraday let you go? Maybe he's getting smart. You mean it's a trick? 
Neither a traitor. He knows that this time he has nothing on me. Oh, darling, what does he ever have on you, really? <laughs> That's a good question. Come in. Oh, Blackie, she's so beautiful. I wish you'd said no. I'm just so sorry to put you to all this bother, Blackie. But I've just been so anxious to meet you. And I'm just so distressed. And I just know you can be so much help to me. So? Oh, you're Georgia Aiken, aren't you? Harvey Masters' fiance. Uh-huh. I saw you at the Masters' party. Now, Miss Aiken, this is Miss Wesley. Hello. How do you do? That's a wonderful suntan you have, Miss Aiken. <laughs> I'm from the South. Maybe you all can't tell it, but I am. That's why I met Harvey. We've just come back from Georgia where we had so much fun. Oh, won't you sit down? Oh, you're so kind, but no. I just dropped in because I wanted to meet the wonderful Boston Blackie. I've heard so much about you and well I thought you thought. Oh, oh I'm I'm sorry. I guess maybe I'm in the way here. Oh dear me, no. What I want to talk about is the thing that's happened to Mrs. Masters. And I'm afraid it's going to mean trouble for poor dear Harvey. For Harvey? Why? Well, the police will find out he inherits all his mother's money. But what about his brother, Roger? All of it goes to Harvey. He said so, and he ought to know. That's one reason he made up with his mother. Well, I don't think there's anything to worry about. The police believe that Mrs. Masters was killed by whoever stole the diamond. I don't think they'll ever suspect Harvey. But they'll find out so much more (laughs) about Harvey when they begin to investigate. He and his mother hated each other. He's going to be in so much trouble when these things get out. And you're so wonderful, Blackie. I wish you'd help. You say Harvey hated his mother? Yes. He'd been away for six years because of her. And they didn't speak for years before that. But she was giving last night's party for him, wasn't she? Yes, this was supposed to be a kind of a reunion. But it wasn't doing so well. Even before poor dear Mrs. Masters was killed. Excuse me. Come in. Is Georgia Aiken... Oh... There you are, Georgia. Well, Harvey, darling, what are you doing here? Looking for you, dear. There's been a call from police headquarters, and we have to go down there for a few minutes. I wanted us to go together. Mother's maid said you were coming down here. Oh, Harvey, darling, this is that so wonderful Boston Blackie. And this is Miss Wesley. That not so wonderful Wesley. Hello. How do you do? What brought you up here, Georgia? Well, you're going to need help, Harvey. You know it. Yes, I know, dear. Uh, Miss Aiken says you're the sole heir to your mother's fortune and that you and your mother were more or less enemies. She thinks that that's cause for you to worry. Oh, I don't think it is, do you? No, frankly, I don't. But the police will probably investigate you. Well, that's quite all right with me, I expect. Well, if you'll excuse us, Blackie and Miss Wesley, we have to get to headquarters. Of course. Goodbye, Blackie. You've been so wonderful. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Wesley. Goodbye, Miss Aiken. It's been so nice to meet you. Goodbye. Bye. So long. Harvey, darling, are we really going to police headquarters? Listen, you. Harvey, darling, you're hurting my arm. What's the idea? Who told you to go to Blackie about me? I only want to help. Harvey, you're hurting me. Listen, you. Open your mouth about me just once more to anybody, and I'll shut it permanently. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. Two jewel thieves, Lemmy and Pete, steal the fabulous Masters diamond. When Mrs. Masters is later discovered dead, police believe she was killed by the robbers, despite the fact that she had had a long-standing quarrel with her son, Harvey, recently returned from the South with his fiancée, Georgia Aiken. As we return to our story, Lemmy and Pete, who stole the Masters diamond are in their hideout. Oh, Lemmy, ain't you got an idea yet? Shut up, will you, Pete? How could I think when you talk to me all the time? But, Lemmy, when they find us with a diamond, they'll get us for killing that master's dame. Wait a minute. I got it. Yeah? What are we going to do, huh? Get rid of the diamond. What? After going to all that trouble to grab it? Oh, Lemmy, no. The only way to duck getting wrapped for murder. Gee, Lemmy, and that diamond was going to net us a pile of dough. Way to the shame, ain't it? I know exactly how we can get rid of it, too. I guess that's good. But it's such a beautiful hunk of ice. Ain't it a shame, ain't it? <laughs> Be careful what you say on the phone, Mary. Faraday or Rawlins are either listening or waiting downstairs to nail me when I go out. Blackie, you really think so? I'm sure of it. 
I'm also sure I'm going to stay right here in my apartment until Faraday solved this case. Well, I'm going to be home for the rest of the evening, darling. Call me if anything happens. Sure, Mary. With Faraday alone on a case, a lot is probably going to happen, and I hope it does to him. What's the matter, Faraday? Can't you think of anything to say? Well, I guess the inspector is downstairs, after all. Oh, there's the door, Mary. I'll call you later. All right. Night. Night. Come in. I thought you were in the building, Faraday. That telephone line was as open. Well, who are you? My name's Lemmy. You Boston Blackie, huh? I'm Boston Blackie, huh? You got the right joint, all right, Pete. Come on in. I offer most of the invitations around here. Habit, I guess. Close the door, Pete. Just stand there quietly. Yeah, sure, Lemmy. We got a little favor to ask you, Blackie. How little? Well, it ain't gonna be no trouble to you. Just the little delivery job, that's all. Delivering what to whom? And just how many years in jail will it involve? How about making sense? Okay. The master's diamond. Does that make sense? Properly handled? That can make dollars. Well, it can't be handled. It's too hot. You have the master's diamond? Yeah. My pal has a gun in his hand. In a couple of minutes, he ain't gonna have the diamond no more. You're gonna have it. I'd rather have the mumps. Come on, take it. Here. Yeah, this is a fine thing. I get held up and forced to take something. Now that I have the diamond, what? Get going. Where? Out the door, down the elevator, out onto the street. We'll be right behind you. When I get out on the street, what do I do? Take the diamond at the headquarters and turn it in. Oh, fine. All Faraday has to do is to catch me with that diamond. Get going. We lifted that rock, Blackie, but we didn't bump that dame. So you're taking it to headquarters to take the heat off us. <laughs> Rollins, the chances are Blackie's got the diamond and we'll try to sneak it out of his apartment. That's why we're waiting here for him. Now, if he's on this elevator, Rollins, you grab him. Right, Inspector. Here's the elevator. Now, get ready. All right, Blackie, stand right where you are. Come on, Pete, let's go. Faraday, whoa. Hold on to him, Rollins. Oh, hold on to him, Rollins, for what? The master's diamond. Faraday, quick, grab those two guys going out the front door. I'm not in anyone but you. Don't be a sap, Faraday. Grab them, quick. I don't want them. All I want is you. Uh, with the master's diamond in your pocket. It's not in his pocket, Inspector. Of course, I just took it out. So, you stole the diamond and killed Mrs. Masters, huh, Blackie? Faraday, you're under delusions. Maybe. But I bet you'd like to change with me. You're under arrest. Look, Faraday, before you get me all the way down to headquarters and have to let me go, be a smart guy and listen to me, will you? You don't have anything to say, Blackie. I caught you with the master's diamond, and that's that. Well, go ahead and tell me. I need a good laugh. Well, laugh at this, then. Those two guys who stepped out of the elevator with me and beat it out the front door when you and Rollins held me up gave me the diamond. You expect me to believe that? I don't expect anything of you, Faraday. But if you'll send out an alarm for a couple of guys by the name of Lemmy and Pete, you can get a confession out of them. I'll give you the description. Yeah, I suppose you think these two guys killed Mrs. Masters, too. No, as a matter of fact, I'm sure they didn't. That's why they brought the diamond to me. I was supposed to deliver it to you. Okay. When we get to headquarters, I'll send out a general alarm. Pick these guys up. Why take me to headquarters, then, if you believe I didn't steal the diamond? Because I want you to see me work. I've got an angle on the murder that doesn't include you. I feel sort of slighted, as a matter of fact. Who are you after? Roger Masters, one of the victim's sons. What's his motive? Money. He's his mother's sole heir. It's that simple. It's not so simple as you think, Inspector. I heard Harvey Masters was the sole heir. Oh, well, I read Marilyn Masters' will just a little while ago. She cut off Harvey without a cent. Well, in that case, maybe we ought to go see him. That's a pretty good motive for murder. This is Harvey's room here. The maid said he went to bed hours ago. I never objected to waking anybody up, Lanky. Oh, well, I know that. Let's go in. Wait. I'll turn on the light. Uh-oh. Quick. Let's cut him down. He may not have been hanging very long. That chandelier doesn't look too strong. What's the matter with you, Faraday? Can't you see he's dead? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he is. Well, this ought to prove three things, Faraday. What? My friends Lemmy and Pete didn't kill Mrs. Masters. Rogers didn't kill her. But Harvey here did. Too bad it doesn't. It doesn't? 
Then why would Harvey commit suicide? Look closely, Faraday, and you'll see that he didn't. He's been murdered. Huh? That stool there, look at it. It's only a foot high. And Harvey is at least two and a half feet or three feet off the floor. Hey, you're right. I'm going to grab Roger Masters. He killed his mother and now his brother. And I'm arresting him before he kills somebody else. I do declare, Blackie. It's just so thoughtful of you to drive me back to the master's mansion at this most distressing time. Well, I was sorry you had to go to the morgue to identify Harvey's body, Georgia, but Faraday insisted. Well, here we are. Won't you come in? No, thanks. Well, I'll take you to your door. I'll get out on your side, too. All right. Here, give me a hand. Here. You're all right, aren't you? Yes, of course. Thanks to you. I'm just so grateful. I, I don't know what to do. Well, if you need anything, let me know, will you? You've been so kind. You sure you won't come in? No, I have to get back downtown. And I don't think you're going in either, unless you let go of my hand. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so sorry. I just wasn't thinking. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Aiken. When you get back to Georgia, your state can brag about one more peach. Well, well, how is the so wonderful Boston Black? Oh, cut it out, will you, Mary? But Georgia thinks you're so wonderful. And I think you're so wonderful, too. Well, that's fine. Don't you want me to think you're that wonderful, Boston Blackie? Well, do you have to like me with an accent? Oh, now, stop it, will you? I'm trying to think. About Georgia? I can remember her without thinking. That's what worries me. Say, um, where did I pick this stuff up? What stuff? This tan powdery stuff on my fingers. Well, let's see it. What is it? What? What's makeup? Makeup? I think the shade is suntan. In fact, I'm sure it is. That's funny. Darling, you didn't pat sweet Georgia on the cheek, did you? Will you please forget about her? That wonderful suntan of hers. I'm beginning to think it came right out of a bottle. No, it didn't, Mary. Her tan is real enough. I didn't get this makeup on my fingers from her un unless she had it on her hands. Well, why would she have suntan makeup on her hands? That, sweetheart, is a wonderful question. But it'd be just as good... As it would be if I said it with a southern accent. Southern, western, or Yankee. The accent around here is on murder. Pardon me, I'm going to see Miss Georgia. The state? No, the girl. But if my hunch is right, I think the state is going to see her. You might as well talk, Roger. You did it, didn't you? We know you did it, Roger. No, no, Inspector Faraday, I didn't. You did. You killed your mother, you killed your brother. You know you did it, Roger. Talk. I didn't. I tell you, I didn't. Your mother told you the diamond was missing. You saw your chance. You killed her. No. You figured the thieves would be blamed. We know the thieves didn't kill her. You killed her. No, no. We have the thieves locked up. They confessed to the robbery. Not, not to killing your mother. We know they're not killers, but you are. Now, talk. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. We know you killed your mother. Because you killed your brother to cover up. You were upstairs when your mother missed the diamond. What do I have to do to make you leave me alone? Talk. Admit you killed your mother. And your brother Harvey. No. Yes. No. Yes. 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 All right. Yes. 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 I killed. Well, that time. You killed them both, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I killed them both. Good. Rollins, get Masters out of here. Okay. Come on, Masters. Uh, okay. Now I get Blanky on the phone. I want him to know that when I want a confession... I get one. Never mind the phone call, Faraday. Huh? Blanky, how did you get in here? Oh, it was very difficult. I opened the door and walked in. Well, for once, I'm glad you're here. Now you know I can get a confession without any help from you. You should be very glad I'm here, Faraday, because you got a confession from the wrong person. Yeah? Yeah. Here's your killer, Georgia Aiken. How do you know? Do you want me to tell him, Georgia, or do you want to tell him in your charming drawl? I don't care what you do. All right, I'll tell him. Faraday, your theory about how Mrs. Masters was killed is correct. Only it was Georgia who was upstairs with Mrs. Masters when she missed the diamond. So she killed Mrs. Masters, realizing the robbers would be blamed for the murder. That's crazy. She had no motive. Money was a motive, Faraday. Harvey told Georgia he was inheriting his mother's fortune. Georgia wanted Mrs. Masters out of the way, so Harvey would inherit it. Then why did she kill Harvey? 
Money was the motive again. With Harvey dead, she would inherit from him. Now I know you're out of your mind. For two reasons. Harvey was hanged. How could a girl handle a big guy like that? And how could she inherit from a guy that she wasn't even married to? I'll answer the first question first, Faraday. This little Georgia Peach is not exactly a dainty little girl. Hmm? I checked and found she was an athlete a few years ago and still is a champion tennis player and swimmer. Yeah. Yeah, I guess she is pretty strong at that. But how could she get a rope around Harvey's neck without getting banged up herself? She probably drugged him with sleeping tablets. After he was knocked out, it was a fairly simple matter to hang him. Yeah, I guess so. But what about question two? How could she inherit from a guy she wasn't even married to? Look at this girl's hand, Faraday. Hmm? It's beautifully suntanned, except on the third finger left hand. There's a ring of white around it, isn't it? Yeah, like a wedding band was on it. A wedding band was on it, Inspector. Because Georgia and Harvey were married months ago, down south. As his wife, she would inherit from him. Even you ought to know that. But that white never showed on her hand before this. No, it was covered with suntan makeup. But I took a hand to help her out of the car a few hours ago. Some of it came off her fingers. Here, Faraday, take her. She's all yours. Well, lady... How much trouble am I going to have with you signing a confession? I'll sign anything. What do I care? I admit I killed him, and I'd do it again for a chance at the same amount of money. The funny thing is, Georgia, Harvey lied to you. He wasn't getting a cent from his mother. What? And Roger got it all. So let this be a lesson to you. Next time you murder for money, make sure you kill the right people. <laughs> Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The signal oil program. The signal oil company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, lie or consequences. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Before the whisper tells you his story, I think you'd enjoy hearing about a signal gasoline station in San Francisco, California, that's been run by the same owner, Frank Miley, for 20 years. When I tell you that many customers have been dealing with Frank Miley the full 20 years he's been serving San Francisco, you'll know he really has something to offer. And that something is longer car life. You see, Frank Miley, like all signal gasoline dealers, has made his customers' cars his life's business. He knows cars thoroughly, and the little tricks that keep them running smooth and long. When customers leave their cars with Frank Miley's signal station, they know every part, including the important unseen parts, is going to receive the thorough, conscientious service it needs. Because Frank Miley, like your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer, is in his own business and will be there year after year to back up his work. Well, that in a nutshell is why cars serviced by independent signal dealers with signal quality products actually do go farther. And it's why now, when your car has to last out the duration, is a mighty good time for you to get acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, The Whistler. To the men who live by matching wits with the hardened criminals who deal in narcotics, the threat of violence is always present. But sometimes that violence has unexpected consequences. Witness the experience of Mark Hoskins, veteran detective of the narcotics detail. It was late one fall evening that Mark, with his fellow officer, Red Andrews, was making his way down a blackened alley toward the hideout of two criminals prominent in the dope trade. Is the door right at the top? Hope we're not. But if we should need it... To... Spotted it this afternoon when I cased the setup. 
be ready to see you. No, nobody but the druggist. I just bought a package of cigarettes. Okay. Well, come on. Let's go get your promotion. What do you mean by that? We've been on this assignment a long time. If we crack it, you know the old man will give you a promotion. Why just me? Are you kidding? You're the fair-haired boy. I'm a dog around this department. The chief's had a knife in my back a long time. He likes an excuse to twist it. You'll get the promotion. You sound jealous, Mark. Maybe I am. Come on, let's go. Better stay in close to the wall. Right. Red, look out! Somebody under the stairs! You bet there's somebody under the stairs. Stay behind you, Mark. Huh? There's another with a blackjack. Oh, I see you. What? Let's go, Joe. I knew I'd catch up with you, Finley. Uh, no, you haven't, Tucker. Oh! Oh! Oh, nuts. They got away, Mark. Mark! Hey, Mark. Mark, you all right? Hey, Mark. Oh, they really let you have one that time, didn't they? Hey, what's going on up there? I heard shooting. Come here. It's all right. We're police. Well, what's wrong? Look, did you see a couple of guys duck out of the alley? Yes, yes, just after the shooting. They jumped into a car and drove off. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Hey, what's wrong with this guy? They blackjacked him. Look. Yeah? Go into that drugstore on the corner. You can go through the back door. Call an ambulance while I take care of him. Police ambulance? Yeah. Well, who shall I tell him was it? Red Andrews. Okay. <laughs> Come from? The alley. I came in the back door. Look, there's a cop out there hurt. Looks like it may be fatal. And the other one asked me to call an ambulance. What were they doing? Well, after some crooks, I guess. Can I use your phone? Sure. Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Huh, let's see. Yeah, there's the police department number. I yeah, wonder how bad that guy's hurt. Say, there's been an accident. Location, please. Behind Small's Drugstore, 18th and Hunter. Two of your men tangled with some crooks. Yeah? Well, one of your men is out cold, and the other asked me to call an ambulance. Uh, my name is Peters. What about the crooks? Oh, they got away, both of them. Our man badly hurt? Yes. The other one, said his name was Red Andrews, asked me to hurry in here and phone. He was working over the one that was out. Okay, we'll get a car right over. Thanks. Goodbye. Say... Did I hear another shot while I was in there? Sounded like it. Well, I'd better go see, I guess. I'd go with you, only I'm on, alone here. Can't leave my store unattended, you know. I got the police all right. They said they'd send an ambulance right away. Hey! Who, who are you? You, you're the one that was knocked out. Those crooks. I gotta get... And him! Crooks. Look, he's hurt now. I gotta get... Who's crooks? Yeah, yeah. Now, look, just take it easy. An ambulance is coming. I'll be... i got to take a look at this. this. Hey. Hey, this man isn't just hurt. He's dead. Sorry to have to bring you down to the station, Peters, but you understand. You're the nearest thing we have to a witness. I understand. I, I think I've told you everything I know. Well, there's just one thing I don't get. Red Andrews was shot. He must have been dead when you called for an ambulance. No. No, I don't think so. He's the one who asked me to call. Oh. It was the other guy who was out. Mm -hmm. Andrews was kneeling down over him. But, well, when I got back, Andrews was dead and the other guy was up. He was walking around kind of like he was in a day. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Well, we're not going to hold you, of course, but we'd like to be sure you stay in town. Oh, of course. Well, all right. That's all for now. I want to get over to the hospital and see Hopkins. Well, Hopkins, you managed to butch another one, didn't you? Take the knife out of my back, Chief. We got a tough break, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red Andrews got such a tough break that he killed him. Couldn't you guys have been on your toes? They must have been tipped off. They were laying for us under the stairs. Yeah? Well, regardless of how it happened, I'm holding you responsible for catching the guys that did it. I don't like to have my men bumped off, especially men like Andrew. Do you think I'd have let it happen if I could have helped it? Uh, I don't know. Well, that's not the point, anyway. The point is, is after you were knocked out, somebody killed Red Andrews. Well, Beretti and Finley must have come back. Probably, but it's up to you to prove it and bring them in. Uh... 
Well, Mark, some rather startling developments took place while you were unconscious. You and Red Andrews exchanged positions in a most peculiar manner. And the chief putting you on the spot to explain it. Well, now that you're out of the hospital, you better do some checking up. First thing will be to locate Beretti and Findlay again. Better check your gun first, though. They're desperate characters, you know. Oh, how do you explain that, Mark? You don't remember firing your gun last night, do you? They knocked you out before you even drew your gun, and yet your gun has been fired. At least there's one round missing. And now, back at the scene of the crime, you've found another clue. An empty shell from your gun. Some shells from Andrew's gun, too. But they were fired after you were knocked out. So your gun had been fired, and now you know where. At the spot where Red was shot. Does that suggest anything to you, Mark? No. No, it couldn't be. I didn't like him, but I wouldn't have... I couldn't have been that much out of my head. Could I? I've, I've got to find out more about this. Good morning. Good morning. Can I get something for you? Were you the druggist on duty here last night? Yes, it's hard to get help these days. I have to work night and day. Yeah, I, I understand a guy called an ambulance from here last night. Yes, that's right. Did he say anything to you? Just that there were a couple of officers in the alley and that one of them had been hurt. I see. How long was he in here? Oh, about four minutes, I guess. Did you see anyone else while he was phoning? Mm, no. No, I didn't. But see here, who are you? I'm the guy that was knocked out. Oh, well, you you seem to have recovered. Yeah, outside of a lump on the back of my head. Well, the fellow didn't tell me anything other than the report he made to the police. Okay, thanks. Yes? Uh, is your name Peters? Yes. Uh, you're the guy who called the ambulance about that affair behind Small's drugstore last night, aren't you? That's right. Come in. Oh, thanks. They told me at the department you'd probably be willing to answer some questions. And, uh, who are you? Take a good look. Don't you recognize me? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, you're the one that... The one that was knocked out. Yes. I believe you reported to the chief that Red Andrews was kneeling down working over me when you left to call the ambulance. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's what I told him. And the report also states that as you entered the alley after hearing the shot, you saw two men run out of the alley, jump into a car, and drive off. Yes, that's what I saw. Good. Now, listen carefully. Were you in the drugstore long enough for those men to drive around the block, enter the alley from the other end, kill Red Andrews, and make a getaway before you got back? Oh, let me see. I imagine it took less than five minutes, but, well, yes, I believe there would have been time for that. Thanks a lot, mister. I guess that just about answers my question. I've got a hunch that's exactly what happened. I beg your pardon, but I don't think so. Huh? Why not? Because when I left to call the ambulance, you were lying flat on your face across the alley. If they'd have driven back, they'd have run over you. Or if you'd been up and around... I think they'd have shot you, too. You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Your theory of Finley and Beretti having come back and killed Red has been blasted. This is beginning to simmer down to far too few suspects, isn't it? From the way the evidence is pointing, you're going to be incapable of weighing it in an unbiased manner. It's placing too much suspicion on you. Of course, you're not ready to face an admission yet, not even to yourself. But if you won't admit killing Red, you'd better find out who did. You know that Red fired several shots after you were knocked out. 
But that doesn't mean that Finley and Barretti couldn't have fired some, too. Maybe they shot Red during the fight and it didn't kill him instantly. Maybe he had the bullet in him all the time he was working over you. It's worth investigating, Mark. The uh, coroner could help you there. Hello, Doc. Oh, hello, Hoskins. Glad to see you. Doc, can I speak to you for a minute? Certainly. Sit down. Thanks. Look, you did the autopsy on Red Andrews this morning, didn't you? Yes, yes. Terrible thing. You determined the cause of death? And that's right. He died of injuries sustained from a gunshot. Doc, were you able to tell from the nature of the wound how long Red lived after the shot was fired? Oh, yes. Definitely? Definitely. Well, what would you say, Doc? Could he have lived ten minutes, five minutes? Well, if Red Andrews lived ten seconds after that shot was fired, it would have been a miracle. What? Yeah, you shot through the heart, close range. Died instantly. Well, there goes another theory. Red couldn't have been shot by the crooks at the start of the fight. And they couldn't have driven back in the alley without running over you. But who else could have done it? Who else had the opportunity? Silly, isn't it, to suspect yourself? But the fact remains that Red Andrews was the fair-haired boy of the department. Everybody knows that. And the chief knows that you were jealous of his position because Red stood between you and promotion. Do you suppose it could have been possible that your subconscious resentment of Red could have been translated into irresponsible action while you were knocked out? Possibility or not, you better crack this thing before the chief gets such an idea or before he puts someone else on the case to start crying around. Oh, hello, Hoskins. Hi. Say, uh, did the lab stuff on Andrews come through you? Uh, yes, yes, I did the analysis. You handled the ballistics report, huh? Yes, a bullet was fired at close range from a thirty-eight service pistol. Oh, was, huh? Yes, probably by a gun that had been stolen from some officer. Probably. Did... Did you retrieve the bullet? Mm, yes. Mind if I have a look at it? Oh, sure. I have it right here. Ah. Here you are. Well, would it be all right if I borrowed it? Well, if the chief's assigned me to the case, I want to make a comparison, okay? Oh. Well, <clears throat> oh, I guess it's all right. Uh, if you'll be personally responsible for it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But uh, you be sure to take good care of it, all right. It'll be best to know for sure, won't it, Mark? Jumping to conclusion isn't good detection. You'll be perfectly safe down there in your basement. With that pillow muffling the gun, no one will hear the shot. Then you can dig the bullet out of that sawdust barrel and compare the rifling with the one that killed Andrews. Then you'll know, won't you, Mark? be no doubt. The riflings are the same. The bullet that killed Red Andrews was fired from your gun, Mark. Looks as though you'd solved the murder beyond a reasonable doubt. All the circumstances have pointed towards you all along. And now you've found the clinching clue. Maybe it would be best if you try to cover up what you know. Or is it too late? Does the chief know something, too? Could that be why he's sent for you? Hoskins, I don't understand it. Here we got a clear-cut case of first-degree murder. Motive, opportunity, corpus electi, everything. And yet you stammer around about the proof. Well? Well, it seems obvious who killed Red. Does it? Certainly. The crooks you were after. So bring him in. This is becoming a pretty mess, isn't it, Mark? You don't dare bring in Beretti and Finley. As long as they're suspected, suspicion will be removed from you. But if you bring them in, they'll prove that they didn't do it. And then there'll be only one suspect left. You, Mark, you. But the chief's going to put another man on the case soon if you don't turn up something. That bullet. You'd better do something about that before another detective starts snooping around. How about a switch? A bullet from a different gun instead of the one they dug out of Andrews. Maybe worth a try, Mark. Say, I... I brought the bullet back. Sorry I was so long. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, yes, the Andrews bullet. Yeah. Hope you haven't been worried about it. Huh? Well, no, no, I wasn't worried about it. 
We made a set of microfilm pictures of the balloon when it first came in. Pictures of the right bullet. And now you've substituted another. That'll look mighty bad for you, Mark. You're getting in deeper and deeper, aren't you, Mark? First, your own deduction has stamped you as a criminal, guilty of manslaughter. Now your efforts to cover up are going to make it look like premeditated murder. You're wasting precious time now, Mark. Three days pass, and then there's something else. What does this mean, Mark? A note asking you to see Ben Tolan, one of the best detectives on the force. Uh, the sergeant gave me your message, Ben. Uh, oh, yes, Hoskins. Come in. I want to talk to you. You, uh, you know what's happened? No, I don't think I do. Well, a couple of days ago, the chief assignment of the Andrews case. Oh. I know what it'll mean to you to crack this case, and I didn't intend to get in your way. But it's a funny thing, Mark. I just did some routine checking in order to look busy. But I ran to a mighty strange thing. Oh? Yeah. I went to the lab, and they told me that you'd borrowed the bullet. Yes, I... I wanted to check it. I... Yeah, I know. And the trouble is, you got mixed up. The bullet you returned isn't the right one, Mark. I... Do... What do you mean? They made a microfilm of the right one, and the one you brought back doesn't fit. Doesn't it? No. Why did you switch it, Mark? What makes you think I switched it? Maybe I brought back the wrong bullet, but there's no... I know you too well to think that you'd return the wrong bullet by mistake, Mark. You're too good a detective for that. What are you driving at? Just this. The bullet gave me some other ideas, and I checked up on them, too. So? I know who killed Red Andrews. You know? I think you know, too. Only I decided that I'd let you crack the case if you could. Well, Mark, you still have a chance to do it. So Ben Tolan knows. He's found out about you, hasn't he, Mark? But it would seem that he's still trying to give you a chance to confess. He thinks it might be easier on you that way, doesn't he, Mark? But he's wrong. It won't be simply a matter of a few years for manslaughter. They'll hang you, Mark. And that's what you're thinking while pacing back and forth in your room. That's like you're trapped. The only way out doesn't make sense. Or does it? If Tolan is found dead, he can't tell. <laughs> yes. Then again, only you would know. Uh, that's a well-isolated house where Tolan lives, isn't it? Well, there he sits, Mark, completely unaware of the danger. Why don't you pull the trigger, Mark? You think it might be better to let Tolan know why he's going to die? You, you could take him by surprise. He hasn't a gun in sight. Tolan? Uh, what? Oh, you, Hoskins. Yeah. Surprised? Mark, what are you doing here? I've been trying to get a hold of you. Uh, what's the idea of the gun? I came to settle something with you, Tolan. What's the matter with you? You're acting screwy. You've been acting funny for days. Funny, have I? Well, maybe it's funny to you. You're not in my spot. Well, you wouldn't be in such a spot if you'd keep your head. Although I suppose the blow you received... Sure, sure. But I'm not taking a chance. I'm trying to prove that. What are you talking about? You're not turning in that evidence you collected, Mr. Tolan. I'm sorry, Mark, but I waited as long as I could. What do you mean? I left a complete report after work tonight. It'll be on the chief's desk tomorrow morning. So he beat you to it, Mark. No use to kill Tolan now. Then you'd be facing two rats. But wait. Yes. You're going to hang anyway. A man can only pay the supreme penalty once, Mark. You're thinking you might as well take Tolan with you. Pay him for his dirty snooping. You might have covered up if it hadn't have been for him, Mark. But he's exposed you. It's his fault. Mark, Mark, put down that gun. Don't be a fool. I'm not a fool. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. For the first time in days, I'm thinking straight. Now, for the first time, I see exactly what I have to do. You're crazy. Maybe, but my last chance is to try a getaway. I might make it, only you aren't going to be around to know. You had to turn in the dope on me, didn't you? All right, you're going to pay for it. What are you talking about? Just this. Maybe I did kill Red. But I didn't do it on purpose, and I'm not going to lay down and take the rap for it. 
You were hurt badly, weren't you? What do you mean? I don't know where you got the idea, but you're wrong. You didn't kill Red Andrews. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, here are two tips for making your gas ration coupons go farther. One, accelerate gradually. Never force your motor by stepping down hard on the gas pedal. You're sure to save precious gasoline in this way. And here's the second tip. Use the gasoline that's scientifically engineered to give you maximum miles per gallon. Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. For years, more and more Western drivers, who keep careful record of mileage, have been switching to Signal gasoline. Even today, although certain gasoline ingredients have gone to war, and no gasoline can give you the brilliant performance of pre-war Signal gasoline, the Signal Oil Company is still producing the finest gasoline that can be made today. And Signal still places the emphasis on miles. So the next time you trade one of your ration coupons for gasoline, remember, your best buy today is Signal Go Farther Gasoline. And the place to get it is your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Mark, you are about to kill the one man who knows you didn't kill Red Andrews. But how can this be? You're a good detective. And all the evidence pointed unquestionably toward you. How could Tolan have discovered something you overlooked? And yet he's told you that you didn't do it. What? I, I didn't kill Red? No. No, no, look, I'll tell you. There was a very obvious clue. You'd have caught it if you hadn't been so busy covering up for yourself. I saw it immediately. Go on, keep talking. You cornered these crooks in an alley behind the drugstore. And they were trafficking in illegal sale of drugs. Get it? Drugs, drugstore. Well, all I did was to go on from there. Well, where did that take you? To the druggist. He was the brains of a dope ring. Now, when you and Red traced the peddlers that close to his store, he figured that you had the dope on him, too. So when Peters went into the phone booth, the druggist slipped out the back door and into the alley. Red was bending down, facing her. The druggist went to help him. He bent down, jerked his gun from the holster, and he shot Red. He was back in the store by the time Peters came out of the phone booth. Yeah, he had my gun. Why didn't he kill me, too? Peters had told him that your injury looked fatal, that he didn't have time to check closely, but he figured that he'd taken care of both the cops who had anything on him, but he didn't. And if you haven't been fool enough to obliterate his fingerprints on your gun... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that'll cinch it. And tomorrow morning, you'll be in jail for the murder of Red Andrews. <laughs> Not you, Mark. Not you. Well, Mark, you almost convicted yourself of murder, didn't you? From now on, you'd better be careful whom you decide to kill. You almost shot Tolan. And Tolan is the one who saved your hide. From yourself, Mark. The Signal Oil Program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil Program is broadcast for your entertainment by The Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil Program, produced by George W. Allen, with story by Dwight Hauser, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther 
with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of Astounding Science Fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Time and Time Again, by H. Beam Piper. It happened during a routine skirmish in the Great War. Patrols advanced from the defense perimeter under jet cover and preceded by napalm throwers. The enemy defended in depth and mopped up with guided 98s fired from 40 miles to the rear. The blast area was 10 miles in circumference. And the medics didn't find much to pick up over 500 yards in. Come on, come on. All right, now back it in here. Look out, it's lousy with mud. More, more. Now, now, cut left. More, hold it. Stretches. Come on, Travers, get those men out. Yes, sir, get a move on, line them up. Come on. Easy, easy, you want to kill them. Okay, take it away. Left those Joes where they was. Half of them won't last till the plane comes. As long as they're alive, they'll be treated. Get those tags out, Travis. Start taking names. Yes, sir. This one must have been a thousand yards in. Get his dog tag out. What a mess. Here. Hartley Allen, Captain G5 Chem Research AN 73D. Number SO 23869 403 J. Hartley? Allen Hartley. Oh, that must be the Hartley that wrote uh, Children of the Mist and Conker's Road. Never heard of him. Major, Major, I think maybe he's partly conscious. Had I better give him another shot? Go ahead, Sergeant. There isn't much else we can do for him. It's a rotten shame. Yeah, ain't it always. Okay, Captain, let me have that arm. There. Oh, God. Tom. Tom. Uh. Get up, Alan. Can't stay in bed all day. I remember that. Clear as if it were real. Up and at him. Hit the deck. Remarkably vivid. It's strange. Alan, are you all right? I'm all right. What's wrong with my voice? Huh? Huh? Why? Well, what are you doing? Practicing singing? My voice has changed. <laughs> Is that all? You're growing up. Happy birthday. Ha- happy birthday? Hey, wake up, son. Wake up. I am awake. It's impossible. I, I am awake. Well, the way you slept through that alarm, I'd say it was impossible. Come on, out of bed. I don't understand. You went to bed at a decent hour. You could wake up the next morning. Come on, son. Breakfast waiting. Out of bed or I'll turn it over. All right, all right. It- it's a dream. Maybe, but you're wide awake now. I am. I, I'm awake. Well, half awake anyway. That's the bell at St. Boniface, isn't it? What, what day is it? Are you kidding? You forget today's your birthday? No, no. No, I, I didn't forget. Neither did I. Here, son. 
Happy 13th birthday. <laughs> you won't guess what's in here. A rifle. A light twenty-two rifle. Oh. Oh, now, how did you know that? I remembered. Did I spill the beans sometime? No. Oh. I could have sworn it would be a surprise. Well, go on. Open it. Hmm. You like it? Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect, Dad. Uh, we'll have to lay down rules about using it. And I'll have to teach you how to operate it. I don't believe in letting a boy handle a gun until he really knows how. <laughs> if I let you play with that thing before I teach you about guns, you'd blow your head off. I suppose so. I'll be shaving, Alan. Come down to breakfast when you're ready. Well, it's a big day today. You're almost a man. Almost. <laughs> you're still groggy. Snap out of it, Alan. I, I will. It... There's a dream in it somewhere, but I'm not sure which. What? Ne 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 never mind, Dad. I'll be right down for breakfast. What you going to do today, son? Well, I want to do some reading this morning. I oh, guess. That's always a good thing to do. After breakfast, suppose you take a walk down to the station and get me a Times. Didn't it come? What, the Times? Well, they don't deliver. <laughs> Be a good idea, though. Maybe I'll talk to Sam Ashburn about it. Here's a half dollar, Alan. Get anything you want for yourself out of the change. Thanks, Dad. Uh, finish your milk before you go. Oh, <laughs> sure, Dad. Thanks for the money. You're big enough to handle it now. Hurry back. I'd like to finish the crossword puzzle before lunch. Here you are, Alan. One times. Tell your father the the puzzle's a stinker this week. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Ashburn. Look out for the trucks when you cross the highway. I'll go across Elton's lot. It's a shortcut. Elton's? <laughs> You'll have a hard time crossing there, son. There's four buildings on that block. I thought they burned down. Well, I've seen them this morning, big as life. I guess that didn't happen yet. What'd you say? N -n Nothing, Mr. Ashburn. I was just muttering. <laughs> uh, my days, youngsters talked up. Uh, yes, sir. Bye, Mr. Ashburn. Monday, August 6th, 1945. Okinawa 1, bombing Japan. Hey! Hey, Alan! Huh? Alan, wait up! Hey, Larry Morton! H hi, Larry! Hi, Al. You going to Sunday school? Uh, no, I have some things I want to do at home. Oh, get him. Fancy pants talk. Things I want to do at home. Oh, go chase yourself around the block. Go jump in a garbage can. Go take a flying jet to the moon. Hey, hey that's a new one. Flying jet to the moon. You thought up a new one, Al. Yeah. I wish I could stay home from Sunday school when I wanted to. How about us going swimming at the canoe club after? Oh, I wish I could. I gotta stay home. We're expecting company. A couple of aunts of mine. Dad wants me to stay home when they come. Uh, aunts are a pain. Nothing I can do. You see the football movie at the Grand? Boy, what a team. Notre Dame. I thought you'd like Cornell. Cornell? Huh. They couldn't beat Vassar. Well, you're gonna go to Cornell, aren't you? Me, Cornell? Fat chance. I'll bet you do. I wouldn't take your money. Well, I know you wouldn't, but you'll go to Cornell, all right. Ha, Cornell, far above Cayuga's waters, there's an awful smell. Just the same. You'll go to Cornell. Hey, Larry, I, I gotta go. Well, so long, Al. I'll see you. So long, Larry. See you. Stuck in this corner, seven letter word, the mixing proportion. Titrate. Huh? Titrate. Mm. T I. -t <laughs> it fits. Now, now how, how did you know that, Alan? That? Well, I read it somewhere, I guess. Oh. What you reading now? Tarzan again? No, not, not Tarzan. <laughs> it's refreshing to see you with a book. Sometimes I think I ought to forbid comic books in the house. Hmm. Yeah, they must be raising the devil with those bombing raids in Japan. How long do you think the war in Japan will last, Dad? Oh? Hmm, I'd say to the middle of 1946. They'll have to invade those islands foot by foot. I don't think so, Dad. I wouldn't be surprised if the war was over very suddenly. How, by magic? 
There isn't a thing on earth will make those Japanese surrender. You expect somebody to make a pass and it'll be all over by this afternoon? Something like that. Mm, I wish you could. A lot of boys dead in the invasion of Japan. Mr. Hartley, excuse me, please. Oh, hello, Mr. Gutchell. That's Frank Gutchell dead? That's right. Excuse me. I didn't mean to disturb you, Mr. Hartley. Mm, it's all right. Lovely day, isn't it, Mr. Gutchell? Uh, Mr. Hartley, the Lord's Day is always beautiful. Mm. Of course, Mr. Gutchell. Mr. Hartley, I I wonder if uh, if you could lend me a gun and some bullets. My little dog's been hurt, and it's been suffering something terrible. Oh, that's too bad. I want a gun to put the poor thing out of its pain. Of course. Uh, how would a 20-gauge shotgun do? You wouldn't want anything heavy. I was hoping you'd let me have a little gun. Maybe, oh, uh, so big. Pistol? So I could put it in my pocket. It wouldn't look right to carry a hunting gun on the Lord's Day. and People wouldn't understand that it was for a work of mercy. Of course, I understand. You're, you're a very religious man. The whole world is evil, Mr. Hartley. Yeah, sometimes it certainly looks like it. Well, I have a Colt 38 special from the auxiliary police outfit. Well, that's fine. Now, you've got to bring it right back, Mr. Gutchell. I might be called out. Now, you'll have to promise to get it right back. Uh, Dad, uh, uh, wait a minute. I, I just remembered. Uh, remembered what? Well, aren't there some cartridges left for the Luger? Then you wouldn't be without the Colt. That's right. I have got a German automatic I could let you have. That way I wouldn't get stuck. You'd have to return it promptly, though. Oh, wait, Dad. I'll get it. I know where the cartridges are. Be careful, are. son. Well, Mr. Gutchell, it sure turned out nice. That's all right. Hello, police headquarters. This is Blake Hartley. Frank Gutchell, who lives on Campbell Street, has just borrowed a gun from me, ostensibly to shoot a dog. What? No, he has no dog. He intends shooting his wife. Now, listen, he'll walk home. If you hurry, you can get a man there on time. What? No, but I wish you'd get my pistol back to me. It's from the First World War. All right, all right, then you'll take care of it. Goodbye. There you are. What kept you, Alan? Well, I couldn't find the cartridges at first. I'll show Mr. Gutchell how it works. It's all loaded, ready to shoot. This is the safety. Just push it forward and up. There are eight shots in it. Did you load the chamber, Alan? Sure. It's on safe now. You understand how it works, Mr. Gutchell? Oh, yes. Yes, I understand. Thank you, Mr. Hartley. Thank you, Sonny. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Gutchell. Return the gun when you're done. Yes, I'll be done with it soon. Goodbye. Alan. You shouldn't have loaded that gun. I guess it's all over now. I had to keep you from fooling with it. I didn't want you to see I took out the firing pin. You what? Gutchell didn't want that gun to shoot a dog. He's a fanatic. He sees visions, hears voices. The voices probably put him up to this. Well, I'll submit that any man who holds intimate conversations with disembodied spirits isn't to be trusted with a gun. What are you talking about? While I was at it, I called the police upstairs. I put a handkerchief over my mouth and told them I was you. You? Well, why did you have to do that? I couldn't have told them this is little Alan Hartley, 13 years old. Then suppose he really wants to shoot a dog. What kind of a mess will I be in then? No mess. If I'm wrong, which I'm not, I'll take the rap for it. Dumb kid trick, you know. But if I'm right, you'll have to front for me. You give me a lot of cheap boy hero publicity, which I don't want. This is crazy, Alan. This is absolutely crazy. Maybe. We'll have the complete returns in 20 minutes. Mr. Hartley? Mr. Blake Hartley? That's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Kaborski from Homicide. Here's your Luger. Thank you. I don't know how you spotted that guy, but when we busted in, he was pointing that gun at his wife and swearing a blue streak because it wouldn't go off. I'm, uh... I'm glad I was able to help. You know, they may even have some kind of a citation for you, Mr. Hartley. I, I, I don't think that's necessary. In the department, we figure a little publicity never hurt nobody. Even a lawyer, huh? I really would prefer it if it kept quiet. Well, whatever you say. Uh, we'll want you to drop around in the morning for a statement. I'll be glad to. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Sonny. Uh, goodbye, goodbye, Sergeant. Sergeant. Uh... Why don't you take the citation, Dad? Well, you were right. You saved that woman's life. Now, 
Let's see you put back the firing pin. Sure. There. All right, Alan. Suppose we have a little talk. But I explained everything. You did not. Yesterday, you wouldn't even have known how to take this pistol apart. Today, you've been using language and expressing ideas that are outside of everything you've ever known before. Now, I want to know... I hope you're not toying with the medieval notion of obsession. What? Well, you say I'm changed. When did you first notice this? Last night, you were still my little boy. This morning, I don't know. You've been strange all day. There's been something. Alan, what's happened to you? I wish I could be sure of myself, Dad. You see, when I woke this morning, I hadn't the least recollection of anything I'd done yesterday, August 4th, 1945. Oh, but that's serious. You don't know how serious. My last memory was lying on a stretcher, injured by a bomb explosion. I was 43 years old, and the year was 1975. 1975? Well, that's right. You'll be 43 in 1975, but, but... But a bomb? Yes. During the siege of Buffalo in the Third World War... I was a captain in G-5, Scientific Warfare, General Staff. Buffalo? You mean Buffalo, New York? There'd been a transpolar invasion of Canada. I was sent to the front to check on service failures of a new lubricating oil. A week after I got there, Ottawa fell and the retreat started. We made a stand at Buffalo and that was where I got it. I remember being picked up and getting a narcotic injection. The next thing I knew, I was in bed upstairs and it was 1945 again. And I was back in my own 13-year-old body. <laughs> Oh, Alan, you just had a nightmare to end all nightmares, that's all. I thought it might be that at first, but I rejected it. It won't fit the facts. But it's ridiculous, all this battle of Buffalo stuff. You picked up something listening to the radio. All the commentators have been going on about another war after this one. You've just got an undigested hunk of H.V. Calvin born in your subconscious, that's all. But that all. isn't everything. I remember four years of high school, four years at Cornell, seven years as a reporter on the Philadelphia Record, three novels, Children of the Mist, Rose of Death, Conqueror's Road. You think a 13-year-old can dream up all that stuff? But it's the only possible explanation. Maybe, but I can speak five languages today that I couldn't yesterday. French, German, Chinese, Russian, and a little Spanish. Although I've got a Mexican accent you could cut with a knife. But, but how did it happen? I, Alan, I, I can't believe it. All I know is here I am. I, I, I've been reading up on time theories. Nobody seems to know much about them. Evidently, time exists parallel as another dimension, and I got kicked backwards along it. But how? Oh, it may have been the radiations from the bomb or the narcotic injection, or both together. But the fact remains, I'm here with full knowledge of my future identity. This... This is quite a shock, Alan. But you do believe me, don't you? Yes, I suppose I must. You seem so strange, as if you weren't my son. I'm your son, all right. Same body as yesterday. I I've just had an educational shortcut. <sighs> Wait a minute. If you can remember the next 30 years, suppose you tell me when the war is going to end. This one against the Japs, I mean. Oh, sure. Well, the Japanese surrender will be announced at exactly 7.01 p.m. on August 14th. That's a week from Tuesday. A week from Tuesday. Hey, you better make sure we have plenty of grub in the house by then. Everything will be closed up tight till Thursday morning, even the restaurants. I remember we had nothing to eat in the house but some scraps. A week from Tuesday. Well, that's pretty sudden, isn't it? Not after today. What do you mean? What happened today? Oh, plenty. Uh, what time is it, Dad? Hmm? That's 11.16. Is your watch right? Well, to the seconds, why? Well, it'll come at exactly 11.17.40. What'll come? The radio announcement. What are you getting at? Something important on the radio? Well, we'll see. Well, don't bother, Dad. It won't work. I remember we had a tube burned out. Well, there is something wrong. When is this announcement of yours? Oh, now I remember it. I, I memorized it in journalism school in 1954. What, what time is it? 11, 18 o'clock. Well, we're breaking into the program now. President Truman has just announced that an atomic bomb has been dropped on the Japanese industrial city of Hiroshima. The bomb was dropped 16 hours ago, and the announcement was delayed to ascertain the results of the explosion. A man named John Howard Peterson read that announcement from the Washington newsroom with NBC. I... I don't believe it. No? Well, listen. But... That's the Burke Platt factory whistle. A and the bells of St. Boniface. Now, next, the whistle at the volunteer firehouse. You like it? 
Then it's true. It's true. Sure. Then Larry Morton came by on his bicycle. Hey, 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 Al. Al, you hear? You hear about the bomb? An atomic bomb. Yeah, we heard. Boy, atomic bomb. Oh, boy. I gotta go find my pop. He's on the golf course. Bye, Al. Bye, Mr. Hartley. You knew. You knew about it. The next bomb hits Nagasaki. I thought that stuff about atomic energy was so much fantasy. Was it? Was that the kind of bomb that got you? Oh, that was a firecracker to the one that got me. It was a guided 98, exploded 10 miles away. And that's going to happen in 30 years? I remember it. How about... Well, uh... How about me? Oh, wait, wait. Never mind. I don't think I'd better know when I'm going to die. I couldn't tell you anyway. I had a letter from you just before I left for the front. You were 78 then, and you were still hunting and fishing and flying your own plane. <laughs> but another war... And fought on American soil. Oh, Ellen, I wish this hadn't happened to you. It happened. I remember it. But if I can help it, I'm not going to get killed in any battle of Buffalo. But if you remember it, if time exists as a parallel dimension, then every tick we're getting closer to that Third World War. Dad, you know what I remembered when Gutchell came to borrow that gun? Well, I suppose that you suspected him and warned me. No, 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 that wasn't it. The other time, the first time when I was really 13, I wasn't home. I'd been swimming at the canoe club with Larry Morton. When I get home about a half an hour from now, I found the house full of cops. But if the gun didn't fire... What makes you think it didn't? Gutchell talked the 38 out of you. He went home, shot his wife four times in the body, once behind the ear, and used the sixth shot to blow his own brains out. That's what you remember? Yes. The cops traced the gun. They took a very poor view of your lending it to him. You never got it back. But here it is. Oh, not the way I remember it. But I didn't want you in trouble, so I warned you. Dad, I found out the future can be changed. <laughs> One man can't change the whole future. I stopped a murder and a suicide. I know, but... With uh... 30 years to work, I can stop a world war. I'll have the means, too. The means? Unlimited wealth and influence. I've got a good memory, Dad. I wrote a list out this afternoon. Salt, jet pilot, citation, ponder, middle ground... What is this, a cold? Horses. That's a list of Kentucky Derby winners from 1946 to 1970. Huh? You sure? Oh, I learned that list on a bet of the officers' club in Cincinnati in 1971. Assault paid eight to one. You figure out what we can take in. But gambling. Oh, this isn't gambling. It's a sure thing. When we get rolling, we'll make the Rockefellers look like pikers. Hmm. Assault at eight to one. Mm-hmm. I suppose I could scrape up $5,000. Hmm. In ten years, that'll make a lot of money. Uh, any other little thing you have in mind, Ellen? Well, by 1952, we start building a political organization here in Pennsylvania. In uh, 1960, I think we can elect you president. President? Isn't that going a little too far? Well, why not? Who wouldn't vote for a politician who was always right? Hmm. Besides, that's the one thing we've got to change. In 1960, we had a man in the White House who was good to his wife and sang a nice tenor, and that's about all. He followed up so completely, we ended up at war. Now, I think President Hartley might be a little more trusted to take a strong line. But I don't know anything about international decisions. I do. I know all the wrong ones. If we can stop one murder, we can stop a war. It's worth a try, isn't it? I guess so. Hmm. Uh, how do I start? Well, as I remember, just after the bomb announcement... You got a phone call from the city fusion party about the next election. Well, there's a lot of talk about a reform ticket. Well, that call is going to be important, Dad. It's the turning point. Now, now you've got to know... There it is. Well, what do I do? Well, answer it. Go ahead. But... Don't worry. I'll tell you what to do. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, this is Blake Hartley. Judge Cribbins. Yes. Uh, just a moment. Alan. Oh. He's asking me to run. Oh, my head. Alan. Oh. Alan, what's the matter? Oh. Alan! He passed out. Alan, what do I do now? Alan, listen to me. Alan! Alan, what's the matter? Captain. Captain Hartley. Captain Hartley. He was all right, Doctor. I gave him the shot and he was all right. Well, he's dead. 
All right, Sergeant. Make out the tag. Hartley Allen. Captain. Dead April 8th, 1975. Alan. Alan, what happened? Alan. Alan. Uh, huh? Alan, are you all right? Uh, oh, I did. I've got Judge Crimmins on the phone. What do I tell him? What? what? Alan. Are you all right? You passed out. Sure. I'm all right. Hey, today's my birthday, isn't it? What'd you give for my birthday, huh? Don't you remember? The Third World War? What Third World War? Dad, what's the matter? You're looking at me funny. You don't remember. You're back again, aren't you? Back to 13 years old. Sure, I'm 13 today, for corn's sake, Dad. You must have died up there. It was only a mind transfer. That means I'm on my own. I have to do it myself without your help. Help for what? If it's the grass, I said I'd cut it tomorrow. No, no, it's not the grass. I've got to save your life, Ellen. I can't let you die that way in 1975. What are you talking about, Dad? You sound goofy. I've got to change it all by myself. Change what? Never mind, Alan. You don't know yet. Come on. Let's have lunch. Sure, Dad, but now, how about my present now? What'd you give me for my birthday, In huh? a minute, son. Go on in. Okay, well, hurry up, Dad. Huh? Sure, all right. Hmm. Now, where did I put that list of horses? You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Time and Time Again, written by H. Beam Piper and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Jack Grimes, Peter Fernandez, Joe DeSantis, Joseph Bell, Clark Gordon, Herm Dinkin, Dick Hamilton, and James Dukas. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. How many of us have missed the moment, had wished we had spoken our minds, stood our ground, defended our faith, but instead we hung back and did or said nothing? There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. So spoke Brutus, but misery is only the beginning of our story. The end is death. Edgar, you don't look too well. Hmm. You know what's wrong with me? I've lost $250,000. What do you mean, lost it? Swindled out of (laughs) $250,000. But I know the man. And what's more important, I know where he is. Well, can you get your money back? Can I? I'm going to make that man crawl. Our mystery drama, Confession, based on a story by Henry James, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Paul Hecht and Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Let me 
set the scene for you. A spa or watering place in a southern state where people come to sample the mineral waters to regain health. A beautiful old hotel with a grand front porch upon which an army of green rocking chairs face the street. Every winter, for 200 years, the town sleeps, waking in the spring when the fat and the overindulgent make their annual pilgrimage to the spa. Among them, John Guest, 50, and David Savile, half his age. I'm David Savile. And last night I had that dream again. There I was with John Guest, an enemy of my brother's, trying to apologize for not having defended him against the revengeful quirk in my brother's nature. But when I woke up, I remembered it was not only a dream. It had happened. How many times over how many nights would I have that instant replay of that nightmare? It always begins the same way. I'm at the spa. It's summer. I'm trying to convince John Guest. And he won't listen. Mr. Guest, you don't like me, I know that. Oh, you're mistaken, David. It's not that I don't like you. I detest you. You represent everything I found objectionable in a generation of weaklings. You object to my age. Well, I'll spare you the catalog. Isn't it because I was present during a terrible moment between you and my stepbrother, Edgar? I mean, to this day, I swear to you, I wish I hadn't been there. Were you there, David? I hardly noticed you. You kept so mute during your stepbrother's extraordinary performance. And I've made many mistakes in my life, but no matter who was at fault, I could never close my eyes and watch a man being degraded and humiliated as I was. I am sorry, truly. I don't need your apologies. Now, have you said everything you wish to? Because if you have, I'd like to go back inside the hotel and join my daughter. It's about Laura that I wanted to speak to you. I love Laura. Oh, you do? Yes, in the weeks you've been away from the spa, Mr. Guest, we've been seeing quite a lot of one another, and I've come to realize how much I love her. But what's all that got to do with me? I'm only her father. Her love life is her own. I think she cares for me. Well, it won't be for long, I promise you. But I tell her how you stood in a corner and did nothing but watch her father destroyed... Oh, now, my advice, David, is to forget Laura. But I can't. Or try. It'll be less painful. You're very hard, Mr. Guest. And you become calloused when your back's to the wall. But compared to your stepbrother, Edgar, I am a pussycat. Then why bring Laura into it? I'm to take it all, is that it? Say nothing to my daughter? Well, I intend to tell her everything and let her decide. Let her find out what you really are. There's nothing I can do to make you change your mind. Oh, it's too late now. Where were you when I was getting clobbered? All right, all right. I asked you to come in here to show you something. This envelope. Do uh, you recognize the stationery? you recognize the handwriting? It's your confession. You had it all along. I found it among Edgar's papers. You give it to no, me. No, not so fast. It's mine. I paid for it. You, you, you give it to Mr. me. Mr. Guest, I am much younger than you are. Force does not intimidate me. Now, don't you see I love Laura? Why in the world would I want to make an enemy of you? You already have. You give me that letter. Please, please, Mr. Guest, don't get yourself too upset. Since I'm in possession of what you want... Don't you think you and I could come to some kind of an understanding? That was a chapter in my life I'd give anything to forget. At heart, I am a mild-mannered person, but that day, I wasn't. I have an older brother, Edgar, who's just the reverse. At college, he was a boxing champ. He's a big man. His very height and strength frighten people. Even me. I can remember back when it all began, one evening when he stopped by my apartment. David, I'm glad you were home. Edgar, you look terrible. Your face is gray. Well, what have you been doing with yourself? Overworking and uh, under-enjoying it. Uh, 
What's the name of that place you go to in July to play golf? Oh, you mean the spa in Charlottesville. Yeah. Uh, what's it like? Well, it has a nice inn, good food, 18-hole golf course. <laughs> the main attraction is a real Hope Jones pipe organ built 100 years ago. Hmm. Unfortunately, nobody knows how to play it. But why do you ask? Well, I'll be frank, David. Uh, uh, I'm scared. Uh, my blood pressure's high. My uh, heart's acting up. The... Uh, the doctor says I'm overdoing it, and uh, and what actually am I getting out of life? <laughs> Being alone and making money. Well, don't you get any exercise? Uh, hailing a cab, maybe. Uh, getting out of it in front of my brokerage house, taking the elevator up the office, and uh, uh, yeah, and maybe sitting there all day. Oh, I don't think you're living properly, Edgar. You can't disregard the old body just like that. Uh, I'm 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 all right. Just tired. Yeah, from sitting around. Of course, if you've made your will and you think a coronary is the way you'd like to go, well, you're doing just fine. I made my will. If this keeps up, I won't have much to leave. But I'm taking a flyer on what looks like a good investment with um, a man who knows what he's doing. Now, look, how about for a few weeks you let me take you in hand, eh? After all, you're my stepbrother or <laughs> I'm yours. Come on, why not? Okay, doctor. Uh... What's your prescription? Meet me in Charlottesville. I'm going there after the 4th. I'll book a room for you, take the cure, do exercises, and hmm, maybe I could even get you out on the fairway. All right, David, that doesn't sound bad. Uh, I'll be down the 15th. Uh, you know, I think a lot about you, too. It's unfortunate that we're different generations, that we're so far apart in age. <laughs> you know, I often wonder why Mother and Dad adopted you when I was over 20. Well, you were at college, out of the house. I guess they wanted another youngster. Yeah. We've let too many years go by without spending any time together. It'll be nice doing Charlottesville with you. Yeah. Well, that's no one's fault. You went into the investment business. I went into designing houses. Our, our worlds are different. You got married and divorced. <laughs> I'm still a bachelor. Hmm. No woman on the horizon yet, huh? No, nope, no, nope, but I'm still hoping. Well, speaking as a much divorced man, I still believe there's nothing like the right lady. The first day in Charlottesville was overcast, so no golf. A few diehards went out, but I didn't feel like getting caught in a sand trap during a rain shower. So I wandered through the town and into the historic church, empty of parishioners, but filled with glorious music. Intrigued, I climbed the back circular stairs to the organ loft and stood behind the instrument. I couldn't see who was playing. <laughs> I, uh, I know I'm not supposed to applaud in a church, but... <laughs> Just couldn't help it. Go right ahead. I hope I haven't embarrassed the organist. I'm the organist. You? Mm -hmm. In this church? Uh, no, I'm just visiting. I can't believe it. Why are you surprised? Oh, I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. Was I that bad? No, I'm sure I'm not the first to tell you that you're marvelous. My father will be pleased. All those lessons paid off. Actually, it's only my hobby. Uh, my name's David Savile. I'm over at the inn. I haven't heard such playing since I went to Mass at Notre Dame. Please, you're overdoing it. No, no, I mean it. <laughs> Didn't sound like any old hobby to me. But it is. With all that talent, don't you want to play seriously? I guess maybe I should. I mean, to play like that and not make a career of it, that's wicked. I thought you were going to be nice to me. Now I'm being scolded. You you live in Charlottesville? Hmm? No, I, I'm just visiting. I thought it might rain. The church was open, so I came in. I like to wander into churches and try out the organ. I, I did it all the time. I was in Europe, and this little church reminds me of Europe. Yes, not many of them have a real Robert Hope Jones in the organ lot. We better run for it. I, I don't know how long these summer rains last. Yeah, we'll both get soaked. Why, why don't we wait it out? I'm meeting someone. I don't want to miss him. Oh. So, I'm taking off. It was nice to meet you. Yes. I hope we see each other again. I'd been thinking of Edgar. All six foot two of him in a highly nervous state and 
hoping that this place would be beneficial. But just when I should have remembered him, I forgot him. I tell you, a room has been reserved in my name. Edgar, Edgar, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I thought you were coming in tomorrow. Tomorrow? What's the matter with now, you? Calm down, Edgar. Don't take everything so hard. Oh, Mr. Hoskins, this is my brother, Edgar. Uh, how about the room next to mine, 414? Where are your bags, Edgar? I didn't bring much. The bell captain's got them. Mr. Savile, I have 414 for you, brother. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. They wouldn't have a bar in this place, would they? Yeah, sure, sure. Of course they do. Yeah, well, let's head for it. I'll register later. Oh, uh, I'm expecting a gentleman. Please let me know when he arrives. Um, lead the way, David. Okay, but you'll have to go easy once you start the cure. The waters they prescribe here have no alcoholic content. <laughs> ah, that's better. So, how come you didn't let me know you changed your plans to get here early? The coincidence of coincidences. I've been tracking somebody down. And of all places they were headed for. Charlottesville, Virginia. So I grabbed the first plane to Richmond and a cab here. Hey, you look pretty beat. How'd you feel? Worse, worse. For lots of reasons. Oh, it's hot. You didn't warn me about the weather. Oh, it's because you've been racing around. Take it easy. You're going to stay for the cure. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to cure myself of the two things that bother me the most. Oh, your health and? Uh, and my bank account. Oh, come on, not here, Edgar. Forget money, investments, the market. Boy, is it hot. Uh, bartender, another one with a little bit more ice. Uh, is that room 414, uh, is it air conditioned? Oh, come on, Edgar, would you calm down? I'll try, but it won't be easy. You want to know what's wrong with me? I've lost $250,000. What do you mean, lost it? I was swindled. But I know where the man is. Well, can't you get your money back? I'm going to make that crook crawl. 250000 <laughs> Was your back turned? <laughs> You're laughing at me. I know, yeah, I know what you're thinking. My old stepbrother finally got what was coming to him. Come on, Edgar, take the chip off your shoulder. This man who took you, you, you say you know where he is. Mm, he's on his way here, David. He'll be staying in this hotel. At the inn. People who equate dollar signs with their sign of life too often discover that when the money disappears, the bottom drops out of their existence. Edgar Savile is one of these. Not that we're against money, mind you, but most of us would rather be alive and scratching than be buried in the most expensive casket. Am I right? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Two brothers, Edgar and David, sit in the famed inn at Charlottesville in Edgar's room. They are as unlike as stepbrotherhood could make them. The younger one, David, an architect and designer, is here for two weeks of golf and leisure. The older one, Edgar, a muscular 50, is taking the mineral baths to try to regain his health. <sighs> I think this is the first quiet breath I've drawn in years. David, I know what the problem is. A strict diet of 24 hours a day working the market. Uh-huh, not playing the market. Oh, no. No, I think it began when Ellie left me two years ago. Uh, first, uh, well, it was a blow to my pride. M maybe even to being a man. And I've never gotten over it. The only thing I do well is to sell. Buy and invest money. And uh, that's not what Ellie wanted in a husband. You see, I had no other interests. Well, why in heaven's name didn't you call me? We live in the same city. Uh, I was probably too proud. I had to be Mr. Big, uh, Mr. Strong. How could I come weeping on your shoulders? Uh, you were also Mr. Dumb. Yeah, well, it's complicated. I uh, fly off the handle sometimes for no reason. I, I get so angry I can't stop myself. So I overreact. And I, I, I know I do that. And this latest episode has been too much for me. 
You you want to know what happened? Edgar, I, I, I really don't understand the stock market, and if you can explain it to me in one-syllable words, please go ahead. Okay, well, this man, John Guest, he's been a successful investment advisor for years. But this time, he promoted a stock that had absolutely no substance. Well, what was it? Well, it was essentially a company that distributed water in Florida because of the heat, humidity, and uh, parasites. They had the technology how to handle that, all relating to ecology. Well, it was an exciting idea. And uh, Mr. Guest, <laughs> he'd advised some friends of mine, and uh, he all thought it was an exciting idea. So we met the guys, got the figures, got the facts. And you invested and you lost it. So how is this man responsible? Because he knew it was phony all along. To make a long and painful story short, a month ago the stock was suspended from trading. And Guest was barred from Wall Street in any official capacity. Well, did you ever suspect it wasn't on the level? Mm, here and there are things I didn't like. But I didn't know until Guest was blown out of the water. I know it's a lot of money, Edgar, but don't you take risks when you play the market? It's never happened to me before. He's coming here, and uh, he doesn't know I'm here. And uh, I may have no legal recourse, but I'm going to push him up against the wall if I have to do it with my fists. You have no idea how angry I am over this, David. I, I, I don't care what I've lost. But someone's going to pay, and it's John Guest. Okay, okay, Edgar. Well, I'll get that. Hello? Uh, who do you want? Oh, uh, it's for you, Edgar. Yeah, thanks. Hello? He is? What's the room number? Huh? 1515. I got it. Thank you. John Guest just checked in. Now what? Yeah, now we take ourselves a little stroll up to room 1515 and knock on the door. I will do no such thing, Edgar. He isn't going to go away. He just arrived. And you're going to put business behind you. I don't care how much you've lost. So first of all, I want you to appreciate this place, huh? I wanted a room with a view. Well, come over here. Come on. Over to the window. Take a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. Real nice. Say. Hey, you see that? That girl walking towards the summer house. Yeah, so? I, 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 uh, <laughs> I met her this morning. Uh, she, she was in the church, uh, practicing on the pipe organ. Hmm? She plays marvelously. I didn't know you were interested in pipe organs. <laughs> you want to know how stupid I am? I, I never asked that girl her name. <laughs> Edgar, you and I are going for a little walk. Congratulations, Edgar. You have walked around the main property two and a half times. Don't you feel better? Yeah. yeah actually, I do. I'm uh, I'm surprised at myself. Feel tired? Not at all. Yeah, paths haven't been too crowded because it's been raining on and off. Hey, let's stop in there. Uh, what did you call that little place? Oh, uh, Summer House. Uh, it's the same one we saw from your window. Uh, uh, bench. I think I'll just rest my weary bones. Smart of me. Look at it come down again. Yeah, it won't last long. It's been doing this on and off all day. Oh, here comes someone keeping up his circulation, huh? Hello. <laughs> you made it just in time. Oh, oh yeah. Yes, I did. Well, hello, John. But Edgar, I imagine I'm the very last person you would have ever expected to find during your vacation. Mm -hmm. I'm not running away from you. I see no reason why we can't mend our fences. My fences aren't in very good shape, Mr. Guest. About yours, I don't know. Edgar, it seems to be letting up. I'm going to leave you two alone. Nice to have met you, Mr. Guest. Uh, Edgar, would you call me when you're ready for dinner? I'm 
in the middle of finishing some sketches, Edgar. I would like to change before dinner. Yeah, well, I'm not ready for dinner yet. Mr. Guest is in my room with me. I'd like you to come over. Look, Edgar, if there's going to be trouble, would you mind very much if I sat this one out? I do mind. I want you as a witness. Please get over here. David, I've asked you here to witness several statements I'm going to have this gentleman here make for us. John, this is my stepbrother, David. To begin... John, some time ago, did I or did I not tell you I had word that Florida water was not worth what it was being quoted? Yes, you did. Once or more than once? More than once. And what did you, as my investment broker, what did you tell me? Well, I told you to keep buying. Yeah. Even though you knew what I told you was true. I didn't know it then. I knew they were buying up many smaller companies in the ecological field. It looked great. And when I heard the SEC had you on the carpet in Washington for your dealings in Florida water, what did you tell me then? I'm really embarrassed to be here. I I really don't see what use I am. Well, David, will you shut up? I'll tell you when you can go. It's not pleasant for me either to have your brother here. I didn't plan on making this pleasant. I repeat... Did you advise me, John, that your dealings with this company were being examined? Well, no, I didn't. And isn't it true that subsequently you have been barred from Wall Street? Yes. And why would that be? You know why. I want my brother to hear why. Now, Edgar, will you back away from me? I'm going to break every bone in your body. I lost a fortune in stock that you knew was worthless. It wasn't worthless. Now, you get away from Edgar, me. Edgar, Edgar, please hold it. What good is all this? So you lost money in stocks. Forget it. Are you crazy? A quarter of a million dollars? <laughs> Forget that. They're going to reorganize. And what'll I get? A penny on the dollar? I'm going to take my loss out of your hide. Edgar, stop. Get out of my way, David. Okay. Okay, Edgar. I'll do what I can to make good personally. Ah, that's better. But I'm not through with you yet. In that drawer, the table by the window, there's a pen and some uh, uh, hotel writing paper. Go get it and sit there. Now, are you ready for what I'm going to dictate? Edgar, what's the point of all this? He's already said he'd pay you back something. Will you mind your own business? I know what I'm doing. I'm protecting the next guy. That's all. If Mr. Guest has done something illegal, the SEC will see that he doesn't do it again. I want his confession in writing. Now, write this. I, John Guest. Now, what if I don't write what you call a confession? Ha! <sighs> Did I hear you correctly? What if you don't write? Uh, well, I would say you run quite a risk, John. Because I'm not giving up. I'll follow you. I'll find you. A- at your home. In a hospital. Uh, uh, do you have any family? I don't know very much about you, but I will find out. Oh, it's a threat, then. Call it... What you like. Just pick up that pen. I hereby, at the request of Edgar Seville, whom I have wronged and cheated, declare myself a swindler. Edgar. Go on, Mr. Guest. Write it. Have you? Uh, I'd like an answer, Mr. Guest. Have you written that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, now sign it. And date it. Witness his signature, and then uh, I want your signature right next to his. Edgar, I think you're mad. I really don't. John, if you are afraid that this confession may fall into the wrong hands, uh, perhaps you'd like to buy it back. You would? Yes. Uh, because if so, I'll... Uh, Take 75000 off your hands within seven days. I haven't got it. Then get it. You must have salted away a couple of bucks on your cut of my 250000 and a few people I know. I'll give you 
one week. For every week I wait beyond that, it's another 25,000. Now, don't you think that's fair? You're not uh, eating your dinner, David. Well, I'm not exactly hungry. The events of this afternoon hit me harder than I thought, Edgar. Well, well, it doesn't seem to have affected John Gass' appetite. I see him over there at that table by the window. Yeah, well, that's him and I'm me. (laughs) David, I don't like you being angry with me. I was so looking forward to our being here together. Uh, As I told you in New York, we've been too long apart. Yeah. I suppose I am behaving naively. (laughs) After all, $250,000 is a lot of money, and who knows how I would have reacted. I'll turn the other cheek, probably. Uh, Now, your friend guest over there is getting to his feet. See that? Hey, there's a young girl coming to his table. Yeah, that's the girl whose name I don't know. The girl who played the pipe organ in the church? Hmm. Are you uh, interested in that girl? Well, you're not. Oh, and she's having dinner with a man who tried to swindle me. My life is getting more complicated than I can cope with. Since I've been here, there's been nothing but disorder. What are they doing now? Turn around and look, David. You've uh, got to take life in stride. I thought I knew most of the answers, but I don't anymore. I can't see what good that man's confession is going to do you. Either he pays up or he doesn't. In any case, I don't think that kind of excitement is good for anyone. I'm sure it isn't for me. People reveal themselves by their belief. A contented man will content those around him. An unhappy person creates unhappiness. In short, what you believe depends very much on what you are. I shall return shortly with Act Three. David Savo, in an effort to restore his stepbrother's failing health, finds himself embroiled in high finance and revenge. However, the bad guy is not all bad, nor is the good guy all good. And to thicken the plot, there is a girl. But the problem that pursues the young architect is, what does he do now? Good morning, David. Out of bed? It's a beautiful day. The sun is out. Uh, Do you want to know what time it is? No, not particularly. Oh, you've been up long, Edgar? It's 11 o'clock. I've been to the mineral baths. I've been hosed. I've been pummeled, bathed. I've uh, drunk uh, what tasted like sulfur. I've had breakfast, and I've talked to the manager. 11 o'clock? Hey, I'd better get moving. Uh, the big local news of the day is that John Guest checked out. <laughs> Took an early train to New York, and uh, his little lady friend is staying on at the inn. What's your schedule? Well, I'd like to get in a little tennis, but it might be better to wait till the sun dries everything off. Maybe I'll go for a short walk. Uh, Would you mind if I don't come with you? I've got some letters to write. Oh, go ahead. I'll see you in the dining room for lunch. Uh, David. Uh, Yeah? Uh, Try to understand it the way I see it. I've been investing for years, but I've never, never had my own investment advisor knowingly sell me a phony deal. David, you frightened me Standing behind that tree I'm sorry I've been waiting for you I thought I saw you last night In the dining room at the end Uh, Yes, I was there with my brother I was there with my father Your father? Yes Is that so strange? John Guest is your father? Yes. Since you know his name, you may as well know mine. It's Laura. Oh, how do you do, Laura? Your last name is Savile, isn't it? Uh, Yes, yes, uh, David Savile. But if you know my father, why didn't you come over and say hello? I I only met him yesterday. Uh, My stepbrother has business dealings with your father. I wish Father would give it all up. You know, he left early this morning to go back to New York. 
got up at six. He didn't even spend one day here, and it was supposed to be a rest. He's never taken a day off since Mother died. You're the only child? Mm, yes. If you've just met Father, you don't know him. He's a happy man by nature. But yesterday at dinner, I was shocked. I can't bear to see him embittered and unhappy in his world of finance. What's it worth if it destroys you? Yes. Yes, you're right. He ought to have a hobby. I dream of the time we can go abroad. I'll study music seriously and he can... I don't know what. Sit by the window in a small hotel watching the Thames or the Seine or the mm. Rhine. Something like that. I've never asked you, what do you do? Oh, uh, I'm an architect and I also do interior design. For corporations? And no, mostly for people who are tired of traveling, who have seen enough places, and who want to settle down in a house of their own. I think I've just said the wrong thing. Mr. Savile, Mr. Savile, come quickly. Oh, it must be Edgar. Something's wrong, I know it. Yes, I'm glad you're here, Mr. Savile. Uh, you're Edgar's brother, aren't you? Uh, yes, yes. They called me from the inn. What happened? We have him next door, lying down. Is he is he all right? Uh, Mr. Savile came here this morning for his regular hydrotherapy. He's on his fourth day. The baths are always attended. Everybody's monitored. Uh, he was placed in his bath. The mineral water is turned on, and he hadn't been there more than five minutes when he collapsed. But he has been revived, and he seems all right. Well, could I see the doctor? Well, he's just gone out, but I'll have him call you. He advised Mr. Savile to return to the inn and rest and avoid treatments for a few days. The impression I get is that you don't regard this as serious? Oh, no, no, no. Your brother is only about 50. He'll recover completely. Sometimes these things are precipitated uh, emotionally. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I'll arrange for a car to bring him up to the inn. David, may I sit down? Laura, uh, will, you, will you have breakfast with me? I, I haven't ordered yet. How is your stepbrother? Oh, you heard. Yes, one of the maids was talking. Yes, he collapsed at the baths yesterday. I'm I'm keeping him in bed. He doesn't look too well, so I'm really not sure what to do. Uh, what have you heard from your father? Anything? Yeah, a letter from him this morning, the poor man. Bad news? Just that he had to raise cash, had to sell our house, but not my piano. He feels his luck has run out. Laura, I'm I'm doing quite well, and... I have some cash which I haven't yet invested. Now, if you call your father, w would you tell him that, that you've met someone or, 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 or know someone who would be happy to place a sizable funds at his disposal immediately, if it would help? I can't tell him that. He wouldn't accept it. Are you sure? I wouldn't let him. I couldn't. Why do you make such an offer? You hardly know me, and you don't know Father at all. Because I love you. I've loved you since I first heard you in that church. <sighs> that's the first time that's been said to me at breakfast. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the first time I've ever said it anywhere. To anyone. certainly not going to any hospital. Edgar, at least let me get in touch with your own doctor and get him to come here to Charlottesville. I, I, I just need a rest, and, I, and, and I'm getting that. Besides, I had good news, and that's perked me up. Uh, see this letter? It's from my lawyer. The day before yesterday, Gus paid him $75,000. Do you think if I hadn't put the heat on Gus... It would have happened. Oh, look, he's a man of conscience. He's probably ruined himself to do it. Did you return that paper he signed, or are you waiting till he gets back here? Return guest confession? Why should I? You're going to keep it? I certainly am. How else could I keep punishing him? But he's paid back what you asked for. David, 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 don't you see? What I've got in writing just may stop him from ever trying that trick again. 
on someone else. You're letting him go through life with the threat of exposure hanging over his head? That's the penalty. David, Father's returned here, and I want you to meet him. I haven't told him anything about you, not even your name. Just that I met a man I'd like him to know. He's just buying a newspaper at the counter. He'll be right out. Oh, Laura. Over here, Father. Oh, what a beautiful night. Oh, is this, uh... Father, I'd like you to meet David Savile. David's an architect. Savile, of course. Is this the, uh, young man you were talking about? You know him? We have been introduced. Good evening, Mr. Guest. Laura, do me a favor. Forget this man. You're really not that hard up for friendship, are you? Father, you never talked to me like that before. I'm going to say something else to you I've never said before. Uh, Laura, please leave us. I want to talk to Mr. Savile alone. All right, Father. Mr. Guest, for whatever I saw that day in my stepbrother's room, I'm terribly sorry. I wish I hadn't been there. It was wrong. I don't need you to tell me that. I swear to you, if I had known then that you were Laura's father, I'd have stopped everything. I don't care how much stronger Edgar is. I, I, I wouldn't have cared. I, I'd i have dragged him away. Yes, you think so. You wouldn't. You're a coward. I, I don't know what to think. The thing's done. I mean, to have a witness. You have no idea what that means. I'm a man of spirit. I thought I was a fighter. I know I did wrong, but to be humiliated like that with with someone watching... Mr. Guest, please, let's let's forget all this. Put, put it out of our minds forever. I'm trying to come to terms with myself. There were circumstances your brother doesn't even care to hear about. But he was cheated. No getting away from that. Please, can we not talk about this anymore? I had to make good for myself, for my daughter. Mr. Guest, it's about Laura. Life goes on. You want to change yourself, so you change. But I shall never forget or forgive your brother or you. But what about Laura? Or what about her? So you two had a mild flirtation. I love her. Ah, I don't blame you. But do you think that she could ever have any feelings for you if she knew the truth? Even suspected it? But she wouldn't look at you. Who knows what omniscient hand regulates these things? Is there a higher order that punishes? The next morning, I went into Edgar's room. He had passed away during the night. I arranged to have the remains shipped home and took all his effects into my room. That left just one thing to be done. You wanted to see me, David. I haven't much time. Mr. Guest, now that my stepbrother's dead, can't we close the books? I am not dead. And Laura is not dead. It's too late. I don't want you near Laura. Um, perhaps this envelope will change your mind. You recognize the stationery. And you recognize your handwriting. Yes, give it to me. I found this among Edgar's papers. It belongs to me now. It's been paid for. Yes, but it's in my hands. Now, don't you think you and I could come to some kind of an understanding? So Laura need never know. Laura, come in. David, what are you doing? This piece of paper is a wall between your father and me. What is it? I think you know, Laura. There we are. All torn up. Now, we put the scraps in this ashtray. Take a match. And watch what's left go up in smoke. There we are. That's the end of it. He says that's the end of it, Laura. What do you say? Goodbye, David. What do you mean, goodbye? I'm my father's daughter first, David. That's all I want to say. You told her? Yes. It's not good to have secrets from your own family. Goodbye, David. <laughs> Yes? 
What is it you want, David? I couldn't believe what you said just now. Don't you want to go on seeing me? Not really. At least, I didn't get to know you very well, so not seeing you won't make much difference. <laughs> I seem to have run into a world of people who can't forgive. All right, Laura. I leave you to your music. See that you do something with it. You could if you wanted to. Goodbye. David, David, come back here. You're doing it again. Why? When my father was subjected to humiliation by your stepbrother, you just took it. Did very little. Now the same story all over again. Well, you told me to leave. David, you fool. You might at least have given me an argument. Uh, yes, yeah, you're right. I, I suppose I should have. All right. All right, I'm not making the same mistake another time. Laura, we're going for a walk. And then I'll get permission from the church for you to practice here every day. Are you taking me in hand, David? Why not? Somebody better had. Two brothers brought up in the same house, sharing the same early experiences, yet each taking a different road. Had they remained closer as they grew older, perhaps each could have helped the other, and their future could have been life for both. I shall be back shortly. Closing, we bow gratefully to Henry James, who created the tale you have just heard some hundred years ago. We end with his own words. The historian, he said, essentially wants more documents than he can really use. The dramatist wants only more liberties than he can really take. Mr. James, we hope our liberties with the confession have been few and satisfactory. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Norman Rose, Fred Gwynn, and Valika Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Murder, mystery, and intrigue at the turn of the century. Welcome to the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Ben Wright. Sherlock Holmes, the most brilliant mind in crime detection, is without peer. He has more than stood the test of time. He has become an institution, a myth, the best of the best. But he was deeply human. He seemed a man possessed, focusing all his energies on crime detection. Yet he could be humbled by his own mistakes and was deeply attached to his friendship with Dr. Watson. He distrusted women, and yet spoke glowingly of Maud Bellamy as a most remarkable woman. And of Irene Adler, she was to him the woman. A man of almost manic depressive nature, he could be brilliant beyond belief, and yet turn quickly to cocaine when his depression reached deeply into his inner being. With an almost photographic memory, he could recall some small detail in a long-forgotten unsolved case and then use it to solve one on which he was presently working. Although he lived and worked in the bustling city of London, Holmes loved nature. Witness a remark he made in the story The Naval Treaty. Our highest assurance of the goodness of providence seems to me to rest in the flowers. 
Could this be the foreshadowing upon retiring of his desire to become a beekeeper on a small farm in the Sussex Downs? Although Holmes did not cultivate friendships, with the major exception of Watson, he did have some friends, at least Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher, the writers of the out-of-date murder would like us to think so. They enjoyed embellishing the original Holmes stories and adding information to the canon that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle never touched upon. Listen carefully to the end of this exciting adventure, where the story reveals the exact kind of payment Holmes accepts for solving this case. It's a delightful addition to the canon, totally imagined by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. And here they are now, Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Roos as Dr. Watson in The Out-of-Date Murder. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And we'd also like to tell you something you really ought to know. The fact that the one sure way to make good food taste better is to try that good food together with a glass of good Petri wine. Did you ever try Petri wine with dinner? No kidding, that's one bandwagon you sure want to hop on. Take, for instance, a deep red, hearty Petri California Burgundy. Wait till you taste that Petri Burgundy with, let's say, a delicious old-fashioned beef stew. Or maybe try a glass with spaghetti. I'm telling you, when you add the luscious flavor of that Petri Burgundy to the flavor of your favorite foods, you're really living. You're finding out for the first time what good eating really means, on the level. So better keep a bottle of that Petri Burgundy right on the dining room table. And never forget, the best friend a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri wine. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. May I come in, Doctor? No, 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 Mr. Bartell. You know me better than that. Of course you can come in. I'm expecting you. I always look forward to these Monday evenings together, you know. <laughs> me too, Doctor. In fact, I always say this is the one doctor's appointment that never scares me. Oh, that's very nice of you, my boy. Draw up your chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. And uh, what prescription do you have in mind for us tonight, Doctor? Well, now, let me see. Take one measure of subterranean peril, one of aristocratic lady in distress, a sprinkling of assorted villains, a corpse or two, and a little more than a dash of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Shake the mixture well, and you have the case of the out-of-date murder. Well, how did the adventure begin, Doctor? Exactly enough. It was in September of 1900. I remember that Holmes and I went to Eastbourne for a much-needed rest. The first couple of days we spent in soothing idleness. On the morning of the third day, Holmes, a dash of colour back in his cheek and a hint of the old sparkle in his eye, suggested that we should go and call on his good friend Evan Whitnell, curator of a nearby museum. And so, just after lunch on that September day, found the two of us talking to Professor Evan Whitnell in his private office at the museum. It only seems yesterday. Holmes was saying... Professor Whitnell, your recent discoveries in this part of England have made you world famous instead of just nationally famous. My congratulations. Uh, Professor, I do wish you'd tell me uh, about your discoveries. Well, with pleasure, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, less than two months ago, I was excavating on the downlands in this neighborhood when I was fortunate enough to discover a number of underground caves. A cave saturated with a heavy deposit of lime uh, that gave clear evidence of having the property of rapidly mummifying any flesh, human or animal, uh, deposited in them. Good gracious me, that's interesting. And what treasures have you unearthed, Professor? Well, a number of mummified specimens of animals clearly belonging to bygone eras. My prized specimen is the body of a large wolfhound. Uh, the inscription on its collar identified the animal as be, having belonged to some local squire in the year 1748. Amazing. I didn't know that limestone had such qualities of preservation. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, yes, Alan, what is it? 
Lady Clavering, Professor. She asked me to tell you that she was in the museum. Oh, yes, 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 sir. Uh, show her up here, will you, Alan? Very good, sir. Yes, sir. I'm most anxious for you both to meet her. And she, in turn, is even more anxious to meet you. Now, I dined with her last night. And when I told her that you were coming here today, she insisted on meeting you. Oh, wait, no, you scoundrel with a twinkle in your eye. I suspect that Lady Clavering is here to consult me in my professional capacity and that you engineer the meeting. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps I might have dropped a hint. No, no, I warn you, Professor Holmes can't become involved with another case. He's completely run down. Well, don't worry, Doctor. All that Lady Clavering requires is a little advice. Advice? Oh, well, that's a different matter altogether. Yes, I well, I knew you wouldn't mind, Holmes. Ah, oh, Helena, my dear, there you are. Uh, come along in. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Allow me to introduce Lady Clavering, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How are you, gentlemen? Now, uh, here you are, my dear. Uh, sit down here. I may as well tell you, Helena, that our little plot has already been discovered. Oh, dear. And I was just getting ready to exert all my feminine wiles in an attempt to persuade you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm certain that he found you utterly irresistible, my dear Lady Clavering. You flatter me, Doctor. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean it. The professor tells me that you're in need of a little advice, Lady Clavering. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'll put my question simply. Five years ago, my husband, Sir George Clavering, left me. Left you? It was me. How uh, stupid of him. I haven't seen or heard tell of him since. I now wish to remarry. But, of course, I couldn't do that without having my husband declared legally dead. My dear Lady Clavering, I can't help feeling that a lawyer is the proper man to consult, not a detective. Uh, perhaps you're suggesting that there was foul play in connection with your husband's disappearance. Oh, no, Dr. Watson. The Claverings are a strange family, self-willed and headstrong... George and I were not happy together. I think he disappeared deliberately. You reported his disappearance to the police, of course. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. But they've never been able to trace him. Uh, this kind of thing has happened in the family before, Holmes. Uh, tell them about Sir Nigel, Helena. Well, he was one of my husband's ancestors. He walked out one day in 1777 and was never seen again. Extraordinary family. Always disappearing. George mm -hmm. knew of the legend. And he often threatened to do the same thing himself. But your problem, Lady Clavering, is not that of your husband's fate, but rather of your own freedom. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm afraid my advice can be of little consolation to you. The law has specified a number of years that must elapse before anyone disappearing can be declared legally dead. I would suggest that you possess your soul in patience until that period has elapsed. Oh, dear. And I was hoping you'd be able to think of some terribly clever way of getting round the law, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Lady Clavering, uh... Sometimes, perhaps, my methods may be unorthodox, but I assure you that getting around the law, as you put it, is a procedure I do not indulge in. Oh, dear me, now I've offended you, Mr. Holmes, and it's the last thing on earth I meant to do, I assure my you. My friend's a little touchy about matters concerning his professional honour, you know, Lady Cameron. Oh, oh, nonsense, my dear Watson. I'm not touchy and I'm not offended. And now, may I suggest we all examine the professor's latest treasures, and after that, perhaps, he'll take us for a stroll on the downs. I'm most anxious to examine those lime pits of his. <laughs> The uh, lime pits are about a mile from here. It's a nice walk across the cliff tops. Well, I'm sorry Lady Clavering didn't want to come with us. A charming woman, even though she did rub you up the wrong way. A beautiful woman, Watson, but I must confess her charm eludes me. Her lack of concern about her husband's fate seemed completely unnatural. Yeah, not if you'd known her husband, Sir George Clavering. He was a tyrant and a bully, both in his home life and in the village. Hello? Who's this coming towards us? It's uh, Timmy. Daft Timmy, they call him in these parts. Uh, he isn't quite right in the head, poor fellow, but he's perfectly harmless. Has uh, two passions in life, birds and bonfires. Uh, hello, Timmy. I've got something beautiful to show you. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, what is it, Timmy? Look, it's in my cap. See? Oh, isn't it lovely? It's a robin's egg. I found it when I was bird nesting. Did you... Ever see such a blue egg? It's a beauty, Timmy. Where did you find it, my boy? Down by the lime pits. Oh, I'm going to build a lovely fire on the downs tonight. I'll let you come and watch it if you give me a shilling. Now, you be careful, Timmy, or you'll be in trouble again. Timmy doesn't get in trouble anymore now. Not since he had Sir George carried away. Yes. Sir George Clavering used to whip Timmy when he found him on the land. Uh, Timmy, tell me, how did you have uh, Sir George, uh, as you put it... Uh... 
carried away. I told my birds about him. I told them how he used to, to beat poor Timmy. And they said they'd carry him off and drop him over the cliffs. <laughs> and, and, and that's what they did. Because he never came back again. Oh, Lord, here comes Harry, Sir George's brother. Now there'll be trouble. Timmy, you'd better run. Oh, oh no. No, Timmy can't run. He, he'll break his pretty blue egg. Timmy! Timmy! Get off my land. If I catch you here again, I'll take my riding crop to you. Timmy hasn't done anything. Go on, be off with you, do you hear? I'll tell my birds about you. That's what I'll do. Oh, don't forget my bonfire. Infernal scoundrel. Hello, Whitnell. Oh. Hello, Harry. Uh, have you met uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, mm. Sherlock Holmes, the professional nosy Parker, eh? Yes, yes, Helena was just telling me about you. I'm very angry with her for talking to you about my brother. It's a private affair, and I intend it should remain one. You understand, Holmes? Well, oh, pull my soul. The devil with your brother, sir, and with you. I'd advise you to remember that you're not addressing a half-witted villager who can't defend himself. If you know what's good for you, you'll do what I say. Here, Chris. Impertinent brute. He spoke to you as if you were a stable boy, Holmes. Oh, oh, really? He was quite refreshing. I'm reminded of an apposite quotation of my young friend James Elroy Flecker. Thine impudence have a monstrous beauty like unto the hindquarters of an elephant. Yeah. He's almost as much disliked as his brother before him. Uh, tell me, does he succeed to the title when his brother is declared legally dead? Oh, yes. And, and what's more, he's Helena's unofficial fiancé, worse luck. I see. Uh, personally, I'm beginning to get a trifle bored with the affairs of the Clavering family. Let's go on to the Lime Cave, shall we? These caves are amazing. We must be 50 feet below the level of the ground, aren't we, Whitnell? Well, more than that, I should say. Rock formation is most unusual, a series of caves connected by a veritable honeycomb of tunneling. Yes, yes, sir. I, I think I'll light the lantern now. It's getting darker in here, and I haven't explored this particular cave before. Yes, I've uh, had a wall cave in on me a couple of times, so you'd better watch where you're walking. Uh, there. Now we can see better. Let's go deeper, shall we? Uh, but do watch your step. Hmm. It's eerie down here, isn't it? Hello. Oh, what's this in the crevice here? It looks like a mummified bird of some kind. It is a beautiful specimen. Judging by its markings, a black streak here and bars of white in the tail, I'd say it was a peregrine. That's exactly what it is, a falcon. Dating back a couple of hundred years, I should say. And in a perfect state of preservation. Oh, this is a treasure, but... Uh, come on, uh, let's explore deeper. There's be another cave over here. If you hold the lantern up a little, I'll... Uh... Oh, I say. Good Lord, the, the whole wall's collapsed. Watson, you're not hurt, are you? No, 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 Holmes, I'm all right. Why, you've unearthed another cave, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, let's go in. I, I think we can just manage to crawl through. I you. Great Scott, I, I don't believe my eyes. Magnificent. Quick, no. This is a treasure indeed. A perfectly preserved body dressed in 18th century costume, powdered with an all. Yes. And there's no mistaking who it is. Look at that typical beak profile. It's a clavering, and it isn't hard to identify which one. Well, George, you mean the one that Lady Helena told us about this afternoon? Exactly. Without doubt, this is the body of Sir Nigel Clavering, who disappeared in 1777. Uh, let's search his pockets. We might find some identification. Yeah, uh, uh, here's a snuff box of the period. And some coins. Yes, the inscription of George III is still visible on them. Hello, here's, here's his diary. This is unbelievable. What are you up to, Holmes? We're examining the body, Watson. This man was murdered. Murdered? With this wound just above the heart. Obviously inflicted with a sharp instrument, probably a dagger. This is interesting, an entirely new experience for me. The opportunity of solving an unsuspected murder committed well over a hundred years ago. Glance through that diary, Watson, will you, old chap? Let's see if the poor devil suspected his fate. Well, oh, hard to read. All the S's look like F's. The peculiarity of the 18th century writing. They are feying, oh, I suppose I've been saying, they are feying in the 
coffee houses that my brother Harry hath been coveting my wife. But this is amazing, Holmes. See how history repeats itself. It's an exact parallel of the situation existing today. Harry is coveting his brother's wife, Helena, and Sir George has not been seen for five years. What an extraordinary coincidence. If it were one, as it is, it's one of the most ingenious frauds I've ever seen. The clothing appears authentic, so do the coins and the faded ink. The paper of the diary, and due to the peculiar mummification of the body, it would be almost impossible to say how long it's been here. Nevertheless, I am convinced that this is a recent corpse, and undoubtedly that of Sir George Clavering. Well, what makes you so sure, huh? Writing in the diary. 18th century, used an S. It looked like an F, it is true, but never at the end of a word. You will recall, Watson, that you were reading H-A-F, half, for H-A-S, has. That's perfectly true, I was. Well, that would be incorrect and genuine 18th century writing. No, obviously, this is an extremely clever attempt to disguise the comparatively recent murder of Sir George Clavering. It's incredible, Holmes. And yet I believe you're right. I'm sure of it. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do? You and I, old chap, will mount guard over the body. You, my dear Whitnall, if you don't mind, will be good enough to go and fetch the police. <laughs> What do you suppose is keeping the police? Whitnell must have gone over an hour, and the lantern with him. Here we are, crouching in the dark in a smelly cave, 50 feet under the cliffs, with a mummified corpse. Very true, Watson, but I don't. Uh huh. Here comes the lantern. It must be Whitnell, and the police. Whitnell! That you, Whitnell? That lantern's blinding me. Is that you, Whitnell? Answer, can't you? Look out, Watson! <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. And I'm going to take that second to ask you what you think of when I say good food. When you say good food to me, I can see myself really going down on a piece of fried chicken, but, but really fried, you know, crisp and sort of a light brown. And when I see that chicken, I sure want to see some Petri California Sauterne. Because, believe me, Petri Sauterne is a white wine that's the wine for chicken. That Petri Sauterne has a delicate kind of flavor. Delicate like its pale gold color. But what a flavor, and what a wine. If you want a swell white wine, you certainly want Petri Sauterne. Try it and see. And now, back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Case of the Out-of-Date Murder. Well, Doctor, you certainly had me on the edge of my chair during the first part of the story. Oh, I'm glad of that, my boy. Say, what happened when Sherlock Holmes yelled out at you in the cave? I was struck from behind with a spade and knocked out. A second later, the same thing happened to Holmes. You see, we were blinded by the lantern and couldn't protect ourselves. When we came to, we found we were at the bottom of a pit. The walls were narrow and vertical, and I saw no earthly way of our getting out of the trap. But as usual, Holmes... Throbbing. Never mind that for the moment, old chap. Get the coat off in your shirt. Oh, well, no, come on, come on, right. off with it, old huh? boy. Come on, off with it. I, I've already removed mine and tied them together. Oh, what for? Oh, dear me, that blow on your head must have been unusually severe. I'm trying to make a kind of rope, Watson, a rope to get us out of here. Oh, what's the good of a rope unless there's someone on the ledge above us to haul us out? If you think you're performing the Indian rope trick. Is My dear it? Watson, this is no time for your rather heavy-handed humor. Why do you keep whistling like that? You've been doing it for the past 20 minutes. I'm whistling for help. Well, why not shout? The whistle carries further. No, dear. Who's going to hear that? That, Timmy, I hope. Remember, he was having a bonfire on the tip tops tonight. My whistle is that of a nightingale, a song unheard in Sussex at this time of the year. If he does answer it, I'm sure it'll bring him down here. Oh, dear. Well, I hope you're right. Seems to me that Whitnell and the police will never find us here. We shall mummify, just as the filthy murderer intended us to. Courage, Watson, I'm sure... 
It's worked. It's Timmy. Cutting a burning log. We're down here, Timmy. Nightingale. Pretty birdie. What are you doing down there? Timmy. I've tied these clothes together to make a rope. I'm going to throw them up. You ready? Catch. Good. He's caught it. Now, Timmy. Lower it to us. Oh, I shouldn't do this. They'll whip me? No, no, no. Nobody will whip you, Timmy. And we both want to give you a shilling to come up and see your bonfire. Oh, oh, that's different. Two shiny shillings. I'll lower the rope. Here it comes. Ah. That's it. All right, I'll another. You first. All right, Timmy, pull away. Right, here we go. Splendid. I'm up, Holmes. Now I'll lower it for you. All right. I've got it. Look out now. Here I come. Ah. Uh. Thank goodness we got out of that place all right. I don't see the nightingale. Oh, oh, you must have him inside your coat. Well, well, never mind. We'll all go up to my bonfire and get warm. It's such a pretty bonfire. Did you ever see a finer bonfire? Never, no, no, Timmy, it's lovely. It's the most comforting sight I've seen for the last couple of hours. Oh, just one thing's bad, though. Somebody tried to burn a book in my lovely fire. It must have been when I was off getting more wood. I, I found it when I came back, and I pulled it out of the fire and stamped on it. See, here it is. Oh, let's have a look. Hello, it's the diary that we found on the body in the lime pit. Precisely, Watson. Now I begin to see daylight. People shouldn't burn books. Books are nice. Books are like birds and, and bonfires. Well, they're nice to be near. Oh, oh, your nightingale must be cold. I'll get some more twigs to burn. Well, now that that fellow's gone away for a moment, I can see why we were attacked tonight. The murderer knew that we were going to, to the caves. He was afraid that his devilish plot wouldn't stand up under your scrutiny. So he, he watched us. When we discovered the body and sent Whitnell off for the police, he knew that he'd got to get rid of us. And who do you think that somebody is, old fellow? Well, that's easy. There's only one person strong enough to have knocked us both out and shifted our bodies. The dead Sir George's brother, Harry Clavering. I think not, old fellow. Didn't you observe as we entered the caves that pickaxes and wheelbarrows were much in evidence? Yes, that's, uh, that's right. They, they were, of course. Strength was not required under the circumstances. We were extremely vulnerable in the darkness. Any man with a modicum of cunning could have disposed of us, or any woman, for that matter. Good Lord, you're, you're not oh, suggesting that... Uh... Watson! Oh, what, no! Why, thank heaven you're safer. Well, I've had the police with me for the last time, but we couldn't find you. You went where I left you. True. Uh, Whitnell, I want you and the police to take me to Lady Clavering's house at once. After that, I wish to lodge information and make a charge of assault and possibly a charge of murder. <laughs> That, Lady Clavering, is the story of how we found your husband's body. Oh, it's horrible, Mr. Holmes. Horrible. But who in thunder could have planned such a devilish plot? Yeah, why did the murderer attack you and Watson? There, my dear Whitnell, you have the key to the murderer's identity. The man who so cunningly conceived and executed the murder of Sir George could never have bungled the job of disposing of Watson and myself unless he had meant to bungle it. You mean he didn't mean to kill us? Exactly. He merely wished us out of the way while the incriminating evidence was removed. You mean the diary? Of course I do. You will recall we found it partially burnt in Timmy's bonfire. Then it was Timmy who... No, 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 my dear fellow. Surely it's obvious one person and only one. Knew that the diary was the key to the murderer's identity. The man who was present when we discovered it and detected the fraud. Great Scott, Professor Whitnell. Whitnell, you murdered my brother. Evan. Evan, you? Oh, no. I did it because I love you, Helena. All these years has been nothing in my life that meant anything but you. How could you? I thought that if George were out of the way, I could make you care for me. And when I realized that you loved Harry, I, I was mad with jealousy. And so I planned to conceal George's body forever. It was a clever plan. You said so yourself, Holmes. 
If it hadn't been for you, it would have worked. Yes, it was diabolically clever, Whitnall, but I'm afraid that no amount of cleverness now can prevent you from paying for your crime. Sir George, I suggest that you instruct the police to come in. Our work is done. <laughs> Look there on the point. Timmy's bonfire is still burning away. Yes. Timmy's a simple fellow with simple tastes. Well, why are you so gloomy? You solved the case brilliantly. My dear fellow, my, my faith in human nature has been sadly shaken. Oh, chap. Evan Whitnall was a good friend and an old one. Hard to be instrumental in sending him to the gallows. Well, he richly deserved yes, it. Yes, yes, I know he did. That's quite true. But it's depressing just the same. Come on. Let's continue our walk home across the downs. I heard Sir Harry offering you a fee. Did you take it? No, I didn't, but I did accept his offer of an acre of land on the downs over there near the Abbey Ruins. You can see them silhouetted against the sky. An acre of land? What on earth would you do with that? Well, when I retire, and I shall retire soon, I've often thought of bee farming. This would be a heavenly spot for such a venture. Well, I can't imagine you as a beekeeper. Oh, why not? After a life spent unraveling the tangled affairs of human beings... It would be soothing in the twilight of one's days to study the exact and predictable behavior of bees. Singing masons, building roofs of gold. Oh, well. One day, perhaps. Perhaps. One day. Well, Doctor, that was a swell story. You know... I'm sure glad we get together like this once a week. Oh, thank you very much. Next week, why not come over a little earlier for dinner? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't think of having you go through all that trouble. Oh, well, of course, if you feel that way. Well, say, aren't you going to coax me? <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I, I knew I wouldn't have to coax you. Mr. Bartell, I was just going to show you the two thick steaks that I've got frozen in my refrigerator. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'll also put aside a bottle of... Petri Burgundy. Well, in which case, I'll bring along a very hearty appetite. If you pick the steak, I know it's good, and when it's Petri wine, you know that's got to be good, too. Because the Petri family has been making fine wine for generations. They've owned and operated the Petri business ever since its inception, way back in the 1800s. During all that time, they've sure learned plenty about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. And they've been able to take this experience and hand it on down from father to son, from father to son. That's why when you want a wine for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that occurred to Holmes and me in the shadowy depths of the Limehouse District in London. It's a strange tale of death and terror. I call the story The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, Doctor, we'll be sure not to miss it. And meanwhile, don't you forget you promised to contribute to the National War Fund. The National War Fund? Of course, Mr. Bartell. It's a must. The money you give to your war fund not only helps the men and women in our armed forces, and it not only helps our allies, but that money goes to work right in your own community, helping make possible many relief and welfare agencies in your own hometown. So let's all be generous in victory. Give to your community war fund. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. You! No! Please! No! Enter a 
interesting little parcel, isn't it, Charlie? Yeah. Looks like a box of chocolates wrapped in brown paper. Expensive chocolates. Are you going to hide it? Presents are always concealed from the receiver until the day of giving. This will be no exception, Charlie. Well, where will you hide it? In a safe deposit box? No, Charlie. What if we wanted to give it away on a Sunday? The banks are closed on Sunday. Well, where then? It's got to be somewhere safe since it's so valuable. In the offices of a man named Aubrey Mason. Who's he? A most reliable gentleman who operates from an address in the West End. 33 Half Moon Street. I never actually met Harlem Fraser, uh, in person, that is, but I spoke to him over the telephone. That he was an American was obvious by his accent. That he was eccentric, like most Americans I've met, was evident in his peculiar request. Mr. Fraser had purchased a wedding present. We've never met Mr. Mason. I took your phone number off an ad in the weekend newspaper. It says, go anywhere, do anything. We have a reputation in that regard, Mr. Fraser. We try to live up to it within reason. Oh, and that's just fine. The place I want you to go to is in Pell Street near Tower Bridge. What I want you to do is look after a parcel for me. A parcel? It's a wedding present for the daughter of an acquaintance of mine. I just arrived in England and have to go north on business. And now I hear that the date of the wedding is undecided and I don't want to be caught short. It sounds like a very special parcel, Mr. Fraser. It is. Well, it's very valuable anyway. I'll send a man to pick it up, of course. But, um, well, wouldn't the parcel be safer in a bank? I thought of that, but the banks close on Sundays, and that day, I'm told, is very popular for weddings in England. And if the wedding is on a Sunday, you'd be stuck with a parcel in a bank. Well, not only that, Mr. Mason. I might not even be here in London. If the wedding present's in your possession and I'm in the north, I can telephone down and you can deliver it. Well, that seems a sensible arrangement. We'll be glad to act for you, Mr. Fraser. Thank you. Now, where can I contact you? Well, I'm leaving in an hour, and I'm not sure where I'll be staying in Granick. It's best if I ring you in a few days. The parcel is at number 84, Pell Street. The woman there will hand it over. What's the name of the messenger? Cannon. Just plain Cannon. <laughs> I didn't bother to fill Cannon in on the details, merely instructing him to pick up a parcel at 84 Pell Street and bring it straight back to the office. This was a pity in a way, since Cannon's suspicions would surely have been aroused. Fraser had said the package was very valuable, yet it was handed to him by a filthy old crone, landlady of the flophouse slum that was 84 Pell Street. However, Cannon collected the neatly wrapped package, tucked it under his arm, and began his return journey via the tube. What a rush. Mind if I sit next to you while I wait for my train? It's a free country. Oh. Oh? You're an American. That's right. Any objection? No, of course not. I'm sorry if I sounded rude. Trouble is, I have an incurable habit of talking to people I don't know. That makes me forward, doesn't it? I didn't expect an American. Oh, forward in England, maybe, but uh, friendly in the States. Do you know Hiram Fraser? I can't say I do. Uh, should I? He's an American. <laughs> That's rather like the old lady who asked General Montgomery if he knew her son, Private Smith. <laughs> I just wondered. Uh-huh. And uh, where are you off to in such a hurry? Earl's Court. The next train in is mine. You? Mm-mm, no, no, the inner circle, the one after yours, gives me a better connection. You're going to the West End? Yep, Half Moon Street, you know? Yes, I do. I do work there. Oh, there I go again. My insatiable curiosity. <laughs> well, that's all right. Sure, I work there. As a matter of fact, I'm in the process of delivering this parcel there. Uh, how about you? I work in a boutique in Charing Cross. Not a terribly highfalutin one. I'm delivering a parcel, too. And that's what I've got in this paper bag. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was more interested in uh, what you were doing after work. I make it a rule, Mr. Cannon, never to meet the people I gossip with a second time. Oh, oh, there's my head to the blow onto the line. That's all right. I'll get it. You just watch my parcel, huh? Yeah, here you are. 
I, I just made it. Uh, hey, hey, miss, your hat. Uh, miss, your hat. My parcel. Oh, there it is on the seat. What a dizzy dame. Well, maybe they give out free hats in that Charing Cross boutique. Well, this is me. And maybe I'll work the Prince Charming routine on that Cinderella. I suppose a hat's as good as a shoe any day. It looks a very ordinary parcel, Cannon. I wonder what's inside. Uh-uh, Chief. Uh, remember Curiosity Killed the Cat? Oh, I'd no intention of opening it. That would be unethical. Not only that, it'd be immoral. What the dickens is that thing you're fiddling with? Thing? Oh, uh, Chief, this is a fine example of the milliner's art. That? A hat? And until the draft of an oncoming train in the tube whipped it away, it graced the head of a most attractive broad, but uh, she disappeared underground via the tube station. I used that means of locomotion on the way to and from 84 Pell Street. It's not safe to visit that area in a taxi cab. Uh, that is, if you could talk a cab driver into going there in the first place. To Pell Street? Well, I must confess I don't know the area myself. Yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me, Chief, because uh, your club has little in common with Skid Row, I fancy. Cannon, I've learned to accept your descriptive powers with equanimity. Look, you'd better lock up this package in the safe. Okay. We're responsible for it, and Mr. Fraser said it was very valuable. Valuable? A parcel from Pell Street? Mr. Fraser is a rich American eccentric. He's bought a most valuable wedding present, and we have to look after it until he either calls or sends for it. I'll be a good fellow and put it in the safe. Boy, he must be eccentric. You said Fraser? You know that, uh, that name rings a bell somewhere. Yes? Inspector Button near the yard to see you, sir. Oh. Oh, send him in, will you, Miss Fairwiller? Yes, sir. I wonder what Bottomley wants. A donation to the Police Widows and Orphans Fund. Chief inspectors don't collect gratuitous handouts. Chief, you know, someday this class distinction will drive me back to Arkansas. Come in. Well, afternoon, Aubrey. Cannon. Oh, hi there, Inspector. Hello, Inspector. Uh, pull up a chair. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, oh, rum day, isn't it? One minute it's boiling hot, and the next you wish you'd brought your overcoat. I agree. Uh, but you obviously didn't come here to discuss the vagaries of the weather. No, no, I didn't. I came to see Cannon, as a matter of fact. Okay, I'll come quietly, Inspector. I'm serious, as a matter of fact. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm not. What is it you want to see me about? Mind if I ask you a question? Go right ahead. That plaster you have stuck on your chin, had it very long? Well, three days, kept myself shaving, why? I'm not concerned with the reason for the plaster, just that it's been there all day today. I smell a mystery. I don't suppose by any chance you were anywhere near Pell Street today? I uh, know. I was right in Pell Street, number 84, but I didn't park a car illegally. I went by two. Ah, then it was you. The woman gave me a perfect description. Of me? Yes. I never thought for one moment that it would be you, but now she gave such a detailed description that you came to mind immediately. Ah, what were you doing at 84 Pell Street? Well, I picked up a parcel and delivered it back here. See, what is all this? Had you any idea what was in that parcel? Of course not. My job was to pick it up, not inspect its contents. Uh, where's the parcel now? In the safe. Oh, may I see it? Well, of course. But I can't allow you to open it, I'm afraid. Uh, it's in trust, as it were. I'll get it from the safe. Uh, why are you so interested in a parcel, Inspector? As a matter of fact, I'm more interested in the people who called at 84 Pell Street today. Here you are, Inspector. Oh. It's neatly wrapped, isn't it? Yes. Who told you to collect it, Aubrey? An American gentleman, Adam Fraser. Hi, Fraser. Well, what's got into you? No, I, I knew that name rang a bell. That the broad on the tube station. Well, this is obviously no time for your comments on your doubtful girlfriend's camera. Uh, uh, let him talk, Aubrey. What um, girl on the tube station, can? Well, I, I collected the package. I went to the tube and sat on a bench to wait for the train, and... Miss Dame sits down beside me and, uh, well, she seemed surprised that I was an American. and She asked me if I knew a guy called Hiram Fraser. Had you ever seen the girl before? No, never. But if you were collecting a parcel from Mr. Fraser, surely you would have developed the conversation? Oh, may I butt in? I didn't tell Karen anything about the assignment except that, well, that he had to collect the package. 
Well, there seemed no point. It was such a straightforward job. I see. And she mentioned Fraser, and you denied all knowledge of the man. Did she ask you about the parcel? Yeah. Uh, just, just let me think a minute. Uh, she sat down. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she was carrying a parcel too, but hers was in a paper carrier. Yeah, you know, I, I knew something was funny. Yeah, well, what is it? Well, I, uh, you, you know how you do. I, I tried to make a date. Uh, you know how it is. And, and she said, Mr. Cannon, I never get to meet the people I gossip with a second time, or, or words to that effect. Well, what's funny about that? I told you I'd never met her before, and I didn't tell her my name. But she knew my name was Cannon. And just before the train pulled in, her hat blew off. I ran to get it, but when I got back, she was already on the train, and she vamoosed. The, the hat's on the couch over there. You know what this means? Yeah. Yes, she was laying for me, but why? I have reason to believe that the innocent-looking parcel on Mr. Mason's desk contains a fortune in concentrated narcotic. Wow. Then, uh, we'd better open it. But can we? I mean, without the owner's permission. Now, I can obtain permission from the authorities. Well, won't that take a few days? No, 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 not in this case. Where murder is involved, permission is granted almost immediately. Uh, murder? Yes. Acting on information received, I went to 84 Pell Street and found a man, a merchant seaman, with two bullets in his heart. Cannon shifted uneasily in his chair. I confess to feeling a little apprehensive myself. There seemed nothing for it but to wait for Inspector Bottomley to speak. Well, Aubrey, do I ring the yard, or shall we have an unofficial opening ceremony? Well, you know best. It's really unethical to tamper with a clown's property, but, well, if murder's involved, well, it's a matter. Fortune and drugs. This I'd like to see. So, Fraser becomes the mouse, and uh, you, Inspector, the cat. Yeah. What makes you say that? Well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? The guy called Fraser said he'd either collect the parcel or have me deliver it. All you have to do is wait his instructions, then, uh, bingo, you got him. I should tell you that the information I received was in connection with the narcotics. I stumbled upon the murdered man by accident, so to speak. His corpse lends credence to the information. Oh, well, let's open the wretched package and put ourselves out of our misery. Yeah, with a million bucks worth of snow. Yippee! Your sense of humor, Cannon. Hold it to you. There. Holy smoke. Well, uh, what is it, cocaine? Flower cannon. Plain, ordinary flower. I don't get it. Uh, somebody got it. The real parcel, I mean. And what real parcel? Well, surely it's inconceivable that a man would send you all the way to Pell Street to pick up a parcel of flower, bearing in mind that the man's an American and it's not April the 1st. Well, uh, I'm as confused as you are, Inspector. Did I say I was confused? A man is sent to pick up a valuable parcel of narcotic. Somehow he finds out what the parcel contains. It's to be left in his office for an indefinite period until a mysterious voice on the telephone calls for it or asks for it to be delivered. No other person handles the parcel, and yet, when it's opened by the police, it's found to contain plain, ordinary flour. Now, I wonder what happened to the fortune in narcotic. Jeremy, are you suggesting that Cannon stole it? What's your explanation, all that? No, 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 wait a minute. Look, suppose I enter the storytelling contest. A cop gets the tip off that the junkies in Pearl Street are holding a parcel of dope at number 84. So he goes to investigate. But a messenger has already taken the parcel away. Description of messenger given by old crone of boarding housekeeper. But before the messenger got there, somebody rang the changes and handed him a parcel of flour. One of the boarders in 84 got to know about it, so he got the chop. The only dope the cop finds is a dead one with a bullet in his gizzard. How's that? The story... It shows an inventive imagination. Unfortunately, Cannon, the dead sailor was very dead. In fact, he'd been dead for three days. It seemed inconceivable that Inspector Bottomley should suspect Cannon. And yet it was a rum situation. Everything Bottomley said was true. Only Cannon had handled the parcel. And although we might never hear from Adam Fraser again, it, it was ridiculous to think that he'd deliberately have Cannon pick up a worthless package of flour. The inspector left, leaving in his turn a sullen and rebellious cannon, whose resentment turned suddenly into action as he swept from the office determined to make Bottomley eat his words. Uh, hire a Miss Fraser. Would that be the gentleman? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Immigration stamp, Thursday the 23rd, 
arrived aboard the steamship Salem, docked at East India Dock, Port of London Authority. Uh, I just want to know the name of the captain of the SS Solomon. Uh, how can I get hold of him? Yes, is Solomon. Well, that's Captain Mike Tager. Well, as to how you'll find him, I don't know. His ship's sailing under a new skipper on her voyage to the east. He's been transferred. If I was you, I'd ask at the shipping line. Uh, a tall blonde girl, uh, very good looking. She uh, uh, she lost her hat in the tube station, you see, and. Uh, well, I'd like to return it to her. She said she worked in a, a boutique in Charing Cross. Mm, there are so many boutiques and hairdressing establishments here nowadays. It's all these young men with their long hair and guitars, you know. Yeah. Uh, could I see the hat, Pat? Mm, oh, yeah, here. Yeah, hmm, yeah. mm, ah, yes, that is made by Alphonse. Three streets down. Come to think of it, I know the lady you seek. A charming girl. Uh, uh, what's her name? Name? Oh, it's uh, Jeannie Tager. Yes, we have the home address of Captain Tager, sir. He does work for us, after uh, all. May, may I have it, please? It's a matter of some urgency. Oh, certainly, sir. Yes, here it is. Uh, number 84, Pell Street. Hey, Chief. Chief, I'm hot on the scent. Nose to the trail like a bloodhound. In fact, I figure I have this whole caboozle set up and sewn up. Well, where did you go? Oh, I've covered half London. I know the name of the ship that brought Hiram Fraser to this country... I know the name of the skipper, and I've traced that broad in the tube station. Well, good for you. Uh, now, look, I'll be away for 24 hours, and after that, I'll have the guy who engineered this dope racket. It'll take less than 24 hours, Cannon. First, you have a job to do, to deliver a package to a man called Charlie Johnston at the Bullen Gate in Pitman Lane. Tonight. Can't, uh, can't somebody else go to you? I don't think you quite understand, Cannon. Adam Fraser has sent for his parcel. He's what? Yes, on the phone an hour ago. What's her name again? Charlie Johnston, the Bull and Gate. Johnston. Bull and Gate. Did you tell Bottomley? Well, yes, yes. The, the inspector's been informed. Well, that's great. So all I have to do is deliver the package and wait for the long arm of the law to nab him as he accepts delivery. <laughs> Nothing could be simpler. Uh, do you mind if I sit down here? Help yourself, lad. Thanks. Now, you here on business or pleasure now? Well, a bit of both, really. If you're looking for a berth, I got a few open for seamen and greasers. What's your rating? Uh, no, no, no. I, uh, I wasn't looking for a berth aboard ship. And what else in the Bull and Gate? Uh, as a matter of fact, I came to see a man called Charlie Johnston. I, uh, I don't suppose you know him. Johnston? I'll say I know him. He sailed with me as first mate aboard the Salem. Salem? Not a bad old tub. More than I can say for Charlie Johnston. I've seen many a better first mate than him. Ah, but these days, you have to take what you can get. Then, uh, you'll be the skipper of the song. X. The company's transferred me to a bigger packet. Passenger line. Point. I prefer cargo. It has less tantrums. Uh, Captain Tager. You know my name. Uh, we, we've never met before, but, uh, I know your daughter, Jeannie. Is that so now? She didn't tell me she knew any Americans. Oh, well, no, we, we just met casually. Um... Tell me, which which one of these guys is Johnston? Now, he's the big fella at the end of the bar. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to deliver this package to him. Maybe we could uh, have a drink when I'm through. Huh? Uh, I'll be here. Okay, I, I won't be a minute. Ah, uh, there. Uh, are you Charlie Johnston? That's me. What can I do for you? Well, the name's Ken, and assignment's unlimited. I have to uh, hand you a parcel. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, from Mr. Fraser, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Well, here you are. Thanks. Yes, that's nice and efficient. Have a drink? Thanks. Yeah, a beer. Uh, two pints of wallop, Julie. Are you the nervous type? Hmm? Uh, no, why? Well, you keep looking towards the door as though you was expecting someone. Oh, uh, thanks, Judy. Uh, have one yourself. Well, mate, cheers. Yeah, mud in your eye. Say, um, uh, I'll need a signature for the parcel. Oh, sure, yeah. Got an invoice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, here you are. Uh, and, and the address as well. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's printed here. There you are. Thanks. Are you, uh, you going to be here long? Yeah. Now, for an hour or so? Why do you ask? Oh, no, no, no. 
No reason. I, I, I was offered a berth with Captain Tager's new ship. He's over there in the corner. Uh, was, you mean? He's just left. Huh. Oh, well, you know, he, he said to come back to his table. <laughs> uh, that's Tager all over. Never could rely on him. Well, don't let it worry your shipmate. You're better off without a berth under him. Oh. Uh, thanks for the drink. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. So long, shipmate. The assignment's unlimited. Chief, it's Cannon. Oh, yes, Cannon. What happened? Nothing. Not a thing. Are you sure you told Bottomley? Of course I'm sure. Well, I handed over the parcel to Johnson. He just took it, and I had a drink with him, and I got him to sign a receipt. Still nothing. I waited outside, and he's just driven off in a new car, and nobody followed him. Chief, there, there just weren't any police there at all. I can't understand it, Cannon. Neither can I. Listen, Chief, I'm going to 84 Pell Street again. I've got an idea that Captain Tager knows more about this than a little. If Bottomley gets in touch with you, tell him where I am, okay? Check. Tread softly, Cannon. Yeah, sure, Chief, like a cat. And my claws are bared. Oh, this is it. Captain M. Tager. Okay, Captain, this is where you sing. Yes? Hi, Jeannie. Remember me, Cannon. I owe you a hat. Oh, yes. Uh, do you mind if I come in? Suppose not. Thanks. Hello, shipmate. Johnston. Come in, shipmate. Come right inside. Better do as he says, Cannon. It's not the first time he's used a gun and meant it. Meaning what? That you shot Seaman Ridley when he found out about your filthy racket. You talk too much. Fraser shot him anyway. I didn't. Tiger's not the only one who talks too much. All right, buddy. Where's the snow? The what? You heard. The cocaine in that parcel that you swapped for flour. No, mister, I didn't swap anything. That parcel was full of cocaine when you got it. I was here watching the old dame hand it to you. When you got it, it was the real McCoy. What happened to it? Drop dead. The girl first, Charlie. Use a knife. It's quieter. What are you going to do to my daughter? Muss her up some. The face, Charlie. Uh, you better tell him where it is, Tega. He means business. What the hell? Hey, hey, call me, Charlie. You two play that. You're all under arrest. The cops. That's right. A nice reception committee. And we've heard enough to send you to the gallows and your colleague with you. Cannon sat down on a sofa in 84 Pell Street and scratched his head as the murder squad hustled Fraser and Johnson away. Bottomly, now all smiles began to explain. You see, Cannon, Captain Tager knew that Johnston, his mate, and Fraser, his passenger, were trying to smuggle narcotics into the country. Uh -huh. It was he who informed us at the yard. But Fraser had made arrangements to have the parcel removed to a safe place. <laughs> and where safer than your office at 33 Half Moon Street? But Captain Tager couldn't get hold of the parcel before the boarding housekeeper passed it on to you. And I let Johnston discover the switch, reasoning that he'd come here looking for you and the captain. Well, we heard everything. Uh, but uh, how was the switch made? I did it. I'm sorry, Mr. Cannon. When you chased after my hat, I swapped parcels. Daddy had made one up just like yours, and I thought you wouldn't notice the difference. Oh, uh, so I got double-crossed. Triple-crossed, Cannon. <laughs> Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Today we're going to delve into the strange story of a Chinese bell. A bell whose ringing is a summons for the dead to live and the living to die. 
as you shall see in the story I call Death is the Judge. Our story begins in a small curio shop in New York's Chinatown. Dr. John Williams, one of the finest brain surgeons in the Middle West, and his wife are celebrating their 20th wedding anniversary by a trip to New York. They have stopped in at this curio shop for sentimental reasons, just as they did on their honeymoon 20 years before. Oh, John, it's the same. It's exactly the same as it was. <laughs> Doesn't look as if a thing had been sold since we were in here last. It certainly doesn't. If it wasn't that old Ki Wong is dead now, I'd be tempted to believe we'd gone back 20 years when we came through the door. Even the smell of incense and ginger is the same. Mm. We must buy something, John, even if it's only a trinket, just for sentiment's sake. If you want a trinket, how about this statue of Buddha here, huh? It only weighs about three tons. Oh, silly. <laughs> but what about one of these bells, John? We need a dinner bell. How would this one do, hmm? That would be better for a temple gong, darling. Better try again. All right, John. Oh, I have it. This lovely little bell of rose crystal. Why, why it's the exact color of that rose crystal pendant old Ki Wong sold us on our honeymoon. The lady has found something that pleases her. Uh, yes, this crystal bell. How much is it? And please don't make the price too high. The price is not high, but the lady would not want it. But I do want it. Why should you think I wouldn't? Once it was a most unlucky bell. Now it is broken. My honored father, Ki Wong, broke it to break the evil fortune that followed it. Broken? Where? Looks all right to me. It is broken because it will not ring. The clapper is gone. That's right, Mary. The clapper is missing. But I could easily have a new clapper made. It is not possible. Only the clapper carved when this bell was carved out of the same block of rose crystal will make this bell ring. But that's ridiculous. I never heard of such a thing. Oh, we can test it easily enough. Suppose I tap it with this silver pencil. That ought to make it ring. I am happy to have you try. Huh. That's odd. It won't make anything but that dead sound. I'll bet I could make it ring. <laughs> You're welcome to try, my no, dear. No, I, I don't mean now. I mean once I got it home. When my honored father took out the clapper... He meant that this bell should never ring again, and it never will. But why, Sam Key? Because bell was stolen, and so carried evil fortune with it, and because it is a bell of life. It came from a temple in Tibet. Only lamas were permitted to lay hands on it. But obviously someone else did. That is why it is unlucky. When my father received it 20 years ago, he took out the clapper and disposed of it. I do not know where or to whom. But why? Just just what was he afraid of? He dare not risk having this bell ring, for it belonged to the High Lama of a tribe that believed the ringing of this bell will bring the dead back to life. You mean this bell? Yes, yes. You, you look skeptical. But it is true. When someone died whose life was too precious to spare, this sacred bell was rung beside his body and death eh, eh, let go his hold. The dead return to life. You mean you, you really believe that? It is true. But I, I have not told the whole story. This carving here upon the bell, it is Tibetan, it says... Who rings this bell cheats death, but death will not be cheated. A little cryptic, I'd say. It means that when the bell is used to rescue someone from death, another whose span of life is not yet over is taken by death instead. You mean that the Grim Reaper keeps his quota filled even if he has to take somebody who's not on his list? It is so, Doctor. John, you're talking as if you believe the whole thing. It's, it's just nonsense, of course. <laughs> but what a lovely topic for conversation it'll make. Oh, I just simply won't leave without this bell now. But if it won't ring, what good is it? I'll make it ring. Leave that to me. If the lady wishes the bell, the price is $5. Well, the lady wants it, so she'd better have it, I guess. Oh, <clears throat> I don't want to risk breaking it while we're traveling, though, uh... 
Can you mail it to our home address? Of course. The name is Dr. John Williams, 1767. And so, a week later, shortly after Dr. Williams and his wife had returned home, a small package reached them. As he unwrapped it, Dr. Williams' curiosity was stirred again, and in his study he tried once more to make the strange bell of rose crystal ring. Hmm, curious. It really won't ring, no matter what I tap it with. Hmm. Hello, John. Oh, hello, Mary. You're home from the hospital early, dear. Yes, I felt a little tired today. But look what just came in the mail. Oh, why, it's my crystal bell. Hmm. Oh, John, it's lovely. It's even more beautiful than I remembered it. Yes, but I'm afraid Sam Key was telling the truth when he said only the original clapper will make it ring. I've tried everything I can think of. (laughs) The trouble with men, darling, is that they're not logical. What do you mean? Well, if the ball is of rose crystal, a rose crystal clapper should make it ring, shouldn't it? The logic is perfect, but how can we test it? By using my rose crystal pendant, of course. I'm wearing it this afternoon so we can try it out right away. Here, see? Uh, Now what? You hold the bell, and I'll tap it with a pendant. All right, tap away, but I bet it doesn't ring. You'll see. Now listen. There. What'd I tell you? It did ring. Of course it did. (laughs) I was sure it would, even if Sam Key's story was true. John, don't you see? Don't I see what? Well, my crystal pendant is the bell's missing clapper. The missing clapper? Mm-hmm. Good heavens, I almost believe you're right. Well, I am right. As soon as Sam Key told us how his father took the clapper out of the bell and sold it 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. well... I was positive he'd made it into the pendant that he sold us 20 years ago. It should be impossible, but it certainly looks as if it must be true. After all these years, the bell and the clapper have come back together again. Hmm. You know, I knew there was something queer about that bell the minute I saw it. Queerest feeling came over me that I... I just must have it. I'm not sure that I like that thought, oh, Mary. silly. I know you have believed that story Sam Key told us. But I didn't. Now, I have my bell complete. Now, all I have to do is unfasten the pendant and attach it to the bell again. But, Mary... Now, help me do it, John. Look, the pendant's loose. It'll come off the chain if I twist uh-huh. it. Uh, yes, here it is. Mary, are you sure this is wise? Now, if I tie it inside the bell with this thread... Darling, please hold it so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, there. Now, it's as good as new again. Listen. Mary, I... Uh, uh, John. John, what is it? I, I don't know. I I don't feel well. Oh, you're tired, darling. Now, please sit down. Sit down here. I, I will. Well, I feel better now. It was just a moment's dizziness. You're working too hard at the hospital. That's what's the trouble. Well, maybe. I admit I had a strenuous day. I spent two hours on a brain operation. Mm. Splendid boy. He looked a lot like our David. But he'll be good for another 50 years now, with luck. Just the same. You must take it easier, John. Now, you sit still here while I fix you some spirits of ammonia, and then... Well, that's probably for me. Now, you sit still. I'll answer. Hello? Yes, Dr. Williams is here. Who's calling, please? The hospital? Oh. Uh, yes, I'll tell him. Uh, goodbye. Mary, what's happened at the hospital? It's an emergency case, John. Another brain operation. And, oh, darling, you are so tired. Can't be helped. I'm the only brain surgeon in town these days. Uh, Help me get into my coat, will you? Uh, Where's my hat? Oh, here you are, dear. Thanks. Now let me straighten your tie. There, you're ready. Uh, I'm going to drive you over, and you can relax until we get there. All right, then, but let's get going. The almost five miles to the hospital. Nurse, another sponge, please. Here, Doctor. Dr. Williams, the pulse is very faint. The breathing has become dangerously weak. I'll have to try adrenaline. The hypodermic, nurse. Uh, Yes, Doctor. I'll get it ready. The patient has stopped breathing, Doctor. And there's no pulse. Quick with that adrenaline. We've got to get the pulse started again. Here, Doctor. Good. That ought to start the heart action again. 
There's still no pulse, Doctor. We'll try artificial respiration. Yes, Doctor. Oxygen, nurse, quickly. Keep the pressure steady, nurse. Johnson, any pulse yet? Not yet, Doctor. The adrenaline doesn't seem to have taken effect. Well, it must. Nurse, give him more oxygen. I'm going to continue the artificial respiration as long as there's a single chance. <laughs> I'm afraid it's no use, Doctor. No sign of a pulse at all. Dr. Williams, please rest now. You've done everything that anyone could. But he hasn't shown a sign of life, not for half an hour. Yes, I'm afraid we're beaten. If anyone could have saved him, you'd have done it. But death had, well, too strong a grip on him for anyone to bring him back. Too strong a grip. Yes, I do rather feel as if I'd been wrestling with someone for this poor fellow's life. And lost. Well, Doctor, don't feel too badly. In room eight, there's a boy who has a full life ahead of him, thanks to you. I suppose I have to look at it that way. Now, help me off with these things, will you, nurse? Of course, Doctor. There's the gloves and the jacket. Now, what did I do with my coat? I just threw it down somewhere when I arrived here. I was in such a hurry. I've got it, Doctor. Let me help you. Oh, thanks, Johnson. <laughs> what the deuce have I got in this pocket? That bell, I must have jammed it into my coat without thinking in the rush to get here. Oh, look out, catch it. Oh, I have it. Oh, that was close. <laughs> Might have smashed on the floor. Here you are, Doctor. Thanks. I almost wish it had broken, though. For some reason, I hate the sound of it. But my wife... Dr. She... Williams. Uh, yes, nurse? The patient. The color's coming back in his face, and and I can feel a pulse now. What? Now, let me see. Yes, you're right. His heart's beating again. Look, he's beginning to breathe. Quick, start the oxygen yes, again. Doctor. I'm going to give him an injection of plasma. Make the preparation, please, Johnson. Yes, Dr. Williams. How is the pulse now, nurse? It's getting stronger, Doctor. And his respiration is gaining, too. Yes, Doctor. What? I've never seen anything like it. It's almost a miracle. Now, where's that plasma? Here, Doctor. I have everything ready. Good. Nurse, disinfect the arm, please. Right away, Dr. Williams. Oh, here comes Dr. Bronson. How's it going, Williams? Been having trouble? Oh, hello, Bronson. Yes, a little trouble, but I think we're in the clear now. For a while, I thought the patient was gone, but now he's going to pull through, I'm sure of it. Good. Doctor, I'm afraid I have bad news for you about your other patient, though. What do you mean? The boy in room eight. The one you operated on this afternoon. Yeah. He died suddenly just a couple of minutes ago. Just went like that for no reason at all. Dr. Williams' second patient, who had come back seemingly from death itself, did live. But when the operation was over and Dr. Williams was driving back to his home with his wife, he was strangely silent and preoccupied, so that when his wife spoke to him, he did not seem to hear her. Don't you want me to drive, John? John, I'm speaking to you. Oh, uh, oh, what, Mary? I said, don't you want me to drive? Oh, no, thanks, Mary. I'm perfectly all right. It's just that I was thinking. About that operation? Yes, the nurse told me about it. It was wonderful that you saved him. That's just it. I didn't save him. He was dead. Dead, do you hear? Then for no reason whatever, he came back to life. But you injected adrenaline and... I injected adrenaline half an hour before he showed signs of life. Then he revived. For no apparent reason whatever. Well, perhaps the adrenaline took a delayed effect. Perhaps. But there was no more reason for it than there was for the boy in room eight to die suddenly as he did. But you have said yourself, John, that in medicine, nothing is ever absolutely certain. That's true. But just the same, that boy's sudden death bothers me. I want to know why he died. Well, an autopsy would tell you, wouldn't it? An autopsy? Yes. Mary, I'm going to turn around and go back to the hospital right now. I'm going to perform that autopsy myself. But, John, you mustn't turn here. There's too much traffic oh, here. Oh, there's nothing coming now. I'll just swing around. More. John! John, look out! That car coming around the curb! Look out! Well, stand back, all of you. Come on, get back. Now, lady, drink this. I'll make you feel better. Thank you, officer. 
You were in an accident and knocked out for a couple of minutes. But you're coming around all right. Just drink this and lie quiet. An accident? Yes. My husband, where is he? I'm sorry, ma'am. Oh, he's hurt. Where is he? I, I, I must go to him. Uh, he's right here, ma'am. When I come along on my motorcycle after it happened, I pulled you both out. But he wasn't breathing. John. John, speak to me. It's no use, ma'am. I'm afraid he's gone. Oh, John. John. Sure, get back, all of you. Get back, I say. Now, <laughs> oh, ma'am, the ambulance will be here in a minute. If there's anything to be done, they'll do it. There's nothing. I've been a doctor's wife long enough not to know death when I see it. Just let me sit here. Where I can see him. I know how you feel, ma'am, and I hate to bother you. But if you could just tell me how it happened for my report. You see, the other driver says... It wasn't my fault. I couldn't help it. He pulled right out in front of me. He didn't even signal. I, now, take it easy, go- mister. Or you'll make that bump on your head worse. Officer, where's my bag? There's some smelly salts in here. I, I, I feel faint. Well, here's your bag. I took care of it. Thank you. I'll feel better in a minute. And here's something that was in the bag, ma'am. Fell out and I put it in my pocket. Uh, it's a bell. I'll put it in your bag if you like. Mary. Thank you so much. Oh, Mary. All right. John. John. Was that a bell ringing? It seemed so, so loud and clear, like an alarm waking me up. What's happened, Mary? It was an accident, John. But you're all right. You're all right. An accident? Are you hurt? No, John, no. no please, please lie still. He's trying to sit up. And only a moment ago, he was dead. Gee, I'm glad he's okay, even though the accident wasn't my fault. Hey, mister, I'll, I'll give you a hand. I... Uh, officer. Officer, I... What's wrong? I told you to be careful. You got quite a bump on the head. Boss, I feel... I feel so weak, so dizzy. Oh, oh, oh. Well, he's keeled over. Where are those smelling salts? Here, let me look at him. I'm a doctor. John, you should exert yourself. Oh, please, Mary. How is he, Doc? This man is dead. Though Dr. Wilson protested that his injuries were not serious, he returned to the hospital where Dr. Bronson treated him, finding nothing wrong save a slight concussion. His wife took him home in a taxi cab, promising to see that he stayed in bed for a day or two. That night, however... Neither Dr. Williams nor his wife could sleep, though they remained awake for uh, different reasons. Mm-hmm. Eleven, twelve. Mary, is that you? I, I was counting the strokes. It's midnight. You should be asleep. <laughs> Can't go to sleep. Not until David gets home. David? Where is he? The movie? No, he came to me this afternoon and said there was a party at his fraternity tonight. He asked me if he could borrow the old car for the evening, and I let him have it. But he's not back yet, John. I can't help worrying. Especially after what happened to us. Well, I'll give him a talking to in the morning. A boy of 17 isn't old enough to be out until all hours. You ought to be asleep yourself, John. How's your head? It's all right. Just throbs a little. All I had was a slight concussion. John, are you sure? Of course I am. Didn't you hear Bronson say so? What are you getting at? The bell. The crystal bell. Well, what about the bell? Your first words were about hearing it ring like an alarm wakening you. And it, it had just rung. Well, what of it? It rang and I heard it as I was regaining consciousness. But at the hospital, the bell rang in the operating room. And your patient came back to life. He, he heard the bell ring, too. Oh, don't be silly, Mary. My patient revived for natural reasons. As for me, I was just knocked out. And, but both times, somebody else died, John. At the hospital, the boy in room eight. And after you... returned... The driver in the other car died. Pure coincidence. The boy probably had a blood clot on his heart. The driver had a fractured skull. It's a common occurrence for men with fractured skulls to keel over without even realizing they're hurt. But Sam Key told us that when the bell rang, the dead would return to life. And someone living would die. Oh, stuff and nonsense, Mary. You've been a doctor's wife long enough to know that such thing isn't possible. But, John, I... No, no buts about it. It's impossible, do you hear? Yes, John. Of course it's impossible. 
Oh, I do wish David would get home. I feel so uneasy about him. He'll be home any minute now. He knows that he's supposed to... Oh, it's the telephone. Well, I'll answer. No. No, let me... No, stay in bed. I'll answer. All right, John. It'll only be a moment. Hello, Dr. Williams speaking. Uh, The police? What is it? What's happened? An accident. My son... Where is he? Is he badly hurt? The car turned over and burned. And my son? I see. The Rockford Village Morn. Yes, I'll come at once. John, what was it? Mary, I, I told you to stay in bed. It was just an emergency call. It's David, isn't it? Yes, it is David. I can tell by your face. Where is he? What's happened to him? He's been in an accident, Mary. He... David is dead. Is that it, John? Yes, Mary. Take me to him. Oh, John, you've got to take me to him. <laughs> Uh, this is the place, mister. The Rockford Village Morgue. Cross the pavement, go down those steps, then along the walk to where you see that little light over the door. Well, thank you. Mary, you must wait in the cab for me. I want to come with you. Now, you mustn't. Promise me you'll wait here. I want to come with you. I want to see my son. Not yet. Promise you'll wait for me. Oh, all right, Johnny. I'll wait. Be careful of those steps, mister. They're pretty steep and it's awful dark. Yes, I'll be careful. I'll only be five minutes or so, Mary. comes your husband back now, ma'am. John. Oh, John. Was it David? Please get back in the cab, ma'am. No, John, I must know. Was it David? Yes, Mary, it, it was David. Oh, I have to go to him. Mary, stop. No, let go of me. I'm going to David. Mary, stop struggling. You can't go to I him. must. I, I must. Mary, don't you understand? You mustn't see him. I'm going, John. What have you got in your hand? It's the bell, the crystal bell. What are you doing with it? Here, give it to me. No, I'm going to ring it. Oh, give me that bell. No, I won't. I'm going to ring it, I tell you. There. There, I've rung it. I've rung it. David. David, did you hear? Mary, you're out of your mind. I'm not. I know what I'm doing. David. Can you hear me? Now give me that bell. There. In heaven's name, what are you trying to do? It brought back your patient. It brought you back. And it'll bring back my son. Mary, come to your senses. It's just a bell. It's not. I know it's not. You were dead. And I saw it bring you back to life. You mustn't believe that. And even if the bell were more than a bell. Don't you understand? The car turned over and burned. I had to identify David by his fraternity ring. And the driver's license in his wallet. I don't care. He's my son. David! David! Mary, get into the cab. I won't. Not until I have my son back. David! Mary, won't you please? Mother! Mother! John. David. Mother! David. Mary, don't you understand? He was burned, burned horribly. Mother, Dad, where are you? Mary. Let go of me. He's my son, and I'm going to him. David! David! Mary, come back. Mary, don't go down those steps to the morgue. David! David! Mary, come back. Come back. Hey, mister, watch yourself. Look out for them steps. Mary! Mary! (laughs) Mister, look out! Mister, are you hurt? Gosh, she fell all the way down the steps. Mister, are you all right? Here, let me help you. Dad! Dad, here I am. I'm all right. I was 
wasn't in the car at all. It was one of my fraternity brothers. I lent him my driver's license and... Dad. Dad, what is it? What's wrong? He started this way and fell down these steps. But why is he so still? Dad. Dad, speak to him. John. John, speak to us. David's all right, do you hear? David's come back to us. He's come back from the dead. He doesn't answer. He isn't breathing. David. He's dead. Yeah, lady. I guess he is. You see this glass bell he was holding? When he fell down, it broke. Looks like one of the pieces of it went straight into his heart. The bell killed him. Dr. Williams was dead, but his son is alive and well, even today. Although it wasn't because the bell rang. Of course not. Anyhow, the bell is broken, so there's no way of proving whether or not it had strange powers of life and death. Or whether it was just a coincidence that each time it rang, one of the dead lived and the living died. But if I were you, I'd certainly play safe if you hear a bell ringing tonight... Don't answer it. It might be ringing. Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train each week at this time. have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Cameron Prudhomme, Eleanor Phelps, Donald Buker, Juan Hernandez, and Mort Lawrence. Original music was played by Charles Paul. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled Meet Me at the Morgue, another strange and shivery tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Ralph Paul speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... Nine hours to live for Nick Carter and the Death House Mystery. And now, a late news bulletin. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight... Johnny Waldron, the blonde-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. Just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned. Nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was for 
something much more dramatic. He has to see the great detective, Nick Carter. Now, just what this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not even been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and is probably at this very moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. He's at number one. We moved him to number one this morning. It sees a shorter ways to walk to the chair. Number one. You all ready to go? Yeah, the barber was in and shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How's you taking it? Oh, there ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing at all. The only request he's made is to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective, huh? Now, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter... What made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to know what's in his mind. Or maybe I'm just a softy about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. Well, I don't believe that you got any sympathy for a criminal. Uh, not you. Not when a man's a killer. Yeah. Here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hi. Hello, Waldron. Oh, Mr. Carter. You got five minutes. All right, guard. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you did come. Gosh, I was afraid you wouldn't. Well, I must admit, I was surprised when the warden called me and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I, I imagine you were. Gee, it was sure nice of you to come. Let's skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter... You think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, didn't follow your case too closely. But you had a fair trial. You were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe that, that I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, Johnny. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I asked you to come out here for. When I got word a little while ago that the governor refused my last request for a reprieve, I... I just made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself if I hoped any longer. Why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm, I'm going to be gone in, in just a few hours now. But I could go a lot easier if, if I thought that, that maybe someday the world would know the truth. They'd know that, that Johnny Waldron was innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get your reprieve. Oh, wait. Let, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. I guess I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial. But sitting here in death row, waiting, the idea came to me that, that maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. Of course, I'd be gone, but, well... You see, there's there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living, and and it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she she stuck by me swell. She's she's a wonderful woman, and I don't want the world to look on her as as the widow of a murderer, Mister Carter. All I'm asking is that that after I'm gone, in your spare time, will you try to prove that they executed the wrong man, J just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. What? There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that... that... No. No, I, I, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I've only got a few more hours to live, and I, I don't... If you don't want me to do anything for you, Johnny, you better tell me everything you can about this. No. No. You'll find them for yourself once you start looking. <laughs> Well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on it. I don't have any. Cards were stacked so well against me, but go see Laura. She's never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Uh, lawyers. I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the fielding jewels tucked away someplace. When they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded pretty fast. Even if you decide to do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I, I wouldn't be able to pay you for your trouble. You, you'd have to do it just, just as a favor to a dying man. 
You don't know where the jewels are? Well, no, Mr. Carter. How could I know? I didn't do that job. Look, you, you go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. All right. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, Garrett. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I I don't suppose you believe me. <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man is being sent to the chair, huh? He tells that to everybody. Did it ever occur to you, Guard, that he might be telling the truth? No. Why? Well, so long, no. Johnny. Good luck. Oh, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter. And, and, and thanks for whatever you can do for me, sir. I'd very much like to know what happened to those fielding jewels. Huh? Oh, 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 yes. Well, maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. Think so? I wonder. Say, guard, uh, how, how long is it until I... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight hours more. <laughs> Nick Carter's office. Oh, Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. And the district attorney has been trying to reach you. Well, what's the trouble? They want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. Hmm? The DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Oh, great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the D.A.? Well, when Nick Carter goes to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Well, tell him to hang on to the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript from the Walden trial. Dig up what you can out of our files about Walden. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. Meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. But we're going to have to work fast. They throw the switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur. It was brought out of the trial that he ingratiated himself with the old lady every chance he got. Oh? You know, Mrs. Fielding was an invalid. Waldron used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her and all that sort of thing. Mm. He was inside the house a great deal. Then, um, let's see now. Oh, the gun was traced to Mrs. Fielding's stepson, Tom Fielding. But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. Her stepson lived there with her? Yes, just the two of them. Mm -hmm. Waldron and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? On a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, the library of the house. Tom Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open and the jewels and money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Tom Fielding, might have known the combination of the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of all of them. The defense harped on that at the trial, but Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy cooked his goose. I see. See. How did Walter strike you, Nick? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Patsy. If we could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels... It would look pretty grim for that party. Yes, it wouldn't look good, that's sure. Oh, Nick, look at the time. Ah, 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. Oh, no, Patsy. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do. Well, my name's Nick Carter. And here's our first stop, Patsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do, Miss Bourne? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Since Johnny's been away, I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. I'm no heart for it anymore. Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... I know you went to see my husband. I heard on the radio. Yes, that's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? Besides, we don't have any money to pay a famous detective. Mrs. Waldron, the only fee Nick Carter ever asks is that justice be done. Now, Mrs. Waldron, tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. But have you proof, Mrs. Walden? Proof? No. Just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that, 
I know, because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. Prosecution tore his alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. Oh, yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night. That I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bourne? You understand when I say the world can stand against your man, but if you know he's right and good and true, you... <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, isn't there any way at all it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? No. No. You don't think of providing alibis for staying in your own home. It isn't much, I know, but it's ours. Tom Fielding has offered to help me. Now Johnny's going to be... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband's convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way is he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. His testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Of course not. Mr. Fielding had himself to protect. That's right, Nate. Fielding was under suspicion. Just this afternoon he called me again. And where's the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where's the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Walden? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions. Oh, but I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day. If Johnny didn't have to die. Oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry, please. <laughs> But please don't cry. You have to excuse me. Just that. I can't stand to think. I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours. Johnny will be gone. <clears throat> Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question. All right. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet, you know. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question them. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Walden, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right? What do you mean? He's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding. That's who you think did it. Oh, I never dared think it out loud before. He was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels. Oh, they were just money fat. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? You talk to him, Mr. Carter. All right, I will. We'll go right over to the Feeling House now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. Tenth and fifth. Mm -hmm. Come on, Patsy. Let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. <laughs> There's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Feeling to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Walden said that's bothering me. It's something else. Something else? Well, what is it, Nick? I wish I knew. But there's something that doesn't fit into the picture the back of my mind somewhere, but I can't quite get the key to it. And if you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. And he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Well, this hunt club's pretty swanky, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Fancy place. Still has doormen and porters. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Uh, ladies aren't permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. <laughs> I guess it does. You better wait for me here. Yes, I guess I'll have to. Oh, Nick. Hmm? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. Hmm? 
Ring again, Nick. Fielding wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Betsy. Not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, maybe we can uncover enough evidence without seeing Mr. Fielding face to face. What are you going to do? A little high-class lockpicking in the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura. There we are. All right, come on in. Stay behind me. Gee, it's dark in here. Shut the door and I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. Let's see. These old houses, the library is usually back this way, off the center hall. Come on. All right. You think there's anybody beside us in the house? I hope not. Ah, here we are. This is the door. This must be it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the library. What are we looking for? Well, right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm-hmm. Safe. Oh, oh, it, it's behind that portrait up here. That oh. was in the testimony. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Betsy. Well, turn on that small lamp, will you? Mm-hmm. Take a glance through the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Say, Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living. He's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet. It's filled to the hilt with pre-war stuff. Oh, and look at this black market stuff. Half a gold tip cigarette, Miss Bowen. Yes, thank you. I will. That's a shame on you. How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here right now and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding saw you about to open his face? Oh, Nick! You okay? Yes, I I guess so. They shot through that window there. And the bullet went right in the side of the desk here. We better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Betsy. Got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now. Well, who do you think shot at us, Mr. Fielding? Oh, Patsy, will you pick that bullet out of the desk? It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. Say, you're taking this attempt to murder us awful lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Not murder? No. You were standing by the wine cabinet not four feet from the window. And I was a perfect target standing here. No, Patsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Well, I got the bullet out. Looks like a 32. Ah, there we are. Patsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in the safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, Patsy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Waldron's reprieve. Now, wait a minute. Wait oh, a minute. I know he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Waldron was telling the truth. Patsy, put down that phone. Yes, Nick. Now, get me police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron... I still have two hours, Patsy. If Waldron's innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Nick, why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? Only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't add up, Patsy. And I've got to know what it is before I go any further. This is her door, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Well, Patsy, it's hard to explain. When I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Feeling had them in his safe. Why, it's obvious, Nick. He didn't get along with his stepmother, and he... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Walden's door? Oh, no, don't do that, Nick. I'm sure she's here. She's, she's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anybody. Let me call her first. Mrs. Waldron? Mrs. Waldron? Oh, sorry, Patsy. We haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? It's here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick. Hmm? Look here. There's a gold-tipped cigarette in this ashtray, the same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Hmm, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in here at the end. He's been here. I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? What well, that a man like Feeling would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Say that again, Patsy. What? 
Well, a man like Feeling wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place like... I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Come on. We've got to get back to Feeling's library or there'll be another murder. You know, Patsy, there are times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. I hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Feeling up yet, or do you think he'd be at his home? He's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time and come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Now, he's here, all right. Watch your step, Betsy. And don't worry about me. I slipped the latch in the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. No, nope, still open. All right, come on. Where do you think he is? The library, probably. Oh, I hear someone, Nick. Yeah, they're both here. Well, that's Mrs. Waldman's voice. Open the door, Nick. The door's locked. I'll try to pick it. Oh, Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. Stay away from me! Help! Help! Oh, he's killed her. There. Oh, Mrs. Waldron. Oh, thank heaven you came. He was just going to shoot me. I got the gun away from him and... Oh, you I... shot him. Yes, Mr. Carter. But it was self-defense. Anyone can see that. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, Mrs. Walton. It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be safe. He won't have to die in the chair. Nick, you've only got seven minutes to call it. Seven minutes to twelve. Hurry, Mr. Carter. Just a minute. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walton. Here, have a cigarette. A cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Thanks. Wait a minute till I get my cigarette holder out of my bag. So, you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick, not going to make it. No, Mrs. Waldron. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was pretty clever, but you made a couple of mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your apartment tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your apartment, all pinched in at the end from having been smoked in a holder, I knew you'd lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it here. Go on, prove it. Another thing. Patsy, hmm? take a look at Mrs. Walden's hands. My hands? Why, oh, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Walden, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy apartment of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. A gun. Huh? Yes, and I know how to use this gun, too, and I'm going to. Uh, oh! So sorry to hate you, Mrs. Walden. Patsy. Yes? Take a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't got anything on me. You can't get he's me still for still breathing, anything. Nick. Good. Phone for an ambulance. Quick. Okay. Oh, but Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive she and her husband frame Fielding? Not yet, Patsy, but I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. But Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Waldron the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes. It was. He is. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Pansy? Yes, it was Lieutenant Riley. And you were right, Nick. That gun you took from Mrs. Walden was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere, but hers were all over it. Did they check with the bullet when you picked out of that desk? The one that was fired at us? Yes, and it came from the same gun. Fine. And what about Fielding? Did Riley say? He's going to live. What's more, he regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, Nick, that Mrs. Walden was certainly clever. She was planning the jewels in Fielding's safe when he came in the room and caught her. So she... She held him at the point of her gun and knocked him out, bound his wrists and ankles, gagged him, and hid him away in another room. What? How did you know that? Very simple, Betsy. The marks where he'd been tied were still on his wrists when I examined him, and oh. also there was a bump on his head. Nick, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Feeling's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Walden's apartment the second time? Curious, huh? Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Walden that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. Oh, I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. 
And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. But why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? That's if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he killed himself. But how would that help Johnny Waldron? Well, if it was done right, it would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. And she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding and save Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. Well, Nick, what happens in your next week's story? Well, I want to tell you the story of the time that I quite accidentally stumbled onto a terrible crime. Or to be more correct, I stumbled onto evidence that a terrible crime had been committed. That doesn't sound like a very unusual thing for you to do. Except for one little fact, Mr. Ripley. We didn't know where or when the crime had been committed. In spite of the fact that we heard the story of the murder from the victim's own lips. As a matter of fact, we even heard the murder committed. And we were powerless to do anything about it. If you're trying to make me curious about it... We are. You're certainly succeeding. Well, it's as unusual a tale as I've had the pleasure of telling in a long while, I assure you. So, until next week, so long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark... Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conray. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. much choice left, mister. You can throw your gun away and they'll hang you. Or you can keep it and try to use it on me. Either way, you're going to die. Have gun. Will travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Mr. Paladin? Mm. Oh, hey, boy, bring you brandy. Mm. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, set it down. Yes, sir. Well, do you want me to read it to you? Oh, I beg your pardon. I should think so. Reading over a guest's shoulder is hardly the proper behavior for an oriental gentleman. You go? Go where? Where uh, newspapers say. Uh, blood feud rages in New Mexico. 38 men already die. Job for you, Mr. Paladin? Maybe so, hey boy. Let's we'll see. Violence flared again in Ren Seabree feud when Juan Carlos Morita killed James Seabree in a gunfight. Morita, a notorious killer, had hired his gun to the Ren faction. Mr. Paladin make money. One side high Morita's gun, other side high Misa Paladin's gun. Uh, hey, boy, you've sold me. 
Guess you better send a wire. Yes, sir, Mr. Paladin. Right now. If dandruff dulls your hair, leaves your scalp itchy, please listen. You can get rid of annoying dandruff so fast today, no one should suffer any longer. With Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo, unsightly dandruff's gone in three minutes. It's the quickest, easiest of all leading shampoos. Besides that, using Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep embarrassing dandruff away. Simply apply in the unique Fitch manner. Before you wet hair, rub in one minute. This way, Fitch Shampoo penetrates right down to the scalp. Next, add water. Lather one minute to wash every trace of dandruff out of your hair. Then rinse one minute. All that loosened dandruff goes down the drain. In three minutes with Fitch, one rubbing, one lathering, one rinsing, dandruff's gone. And while removing dandruff, Fitch can also brighten hair up to 35%. To get rid of dandruff problems forever, brighten hair too, use Fitch regularly. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today, only 59 cents. It was late afternoon when I rode into the New Mexico town, but the summer sun was still merciless, reflecting off the adobe buildings. The dirt street seemed almost deserted. The town was motionless, except for something that swung slowly from a jerry-built scaffold in the middle of the street. It was a hangman's noose, and beneath it lay the body of a dead man. Raise him. I should get him up. I never argue with a shotgun. That's better. This him, Mr. Seabreath? Where do I get a look at him? No, he's not Marita. Let him put his hands down. You, John Seabreath? That's right. How long has that body been lying there? We hung him this morning. Who is it? Marita's brother. And one Marita is supposed to come for him. Is that it? That's it, mister. Now, who are you? Paladin. You're late. Let's go inside. I don't want the job. You heard of Marita's reputation, mister? It's scary. It doesn't scare me. I just don't want this job. I've paid you $500 in advance. You'll give the money back, mister. Gladly. Here. You're mighty squeamish for a man with a gun for hire. Marita has killed nine human beings. To hunt an animal or kill her, you do whatever you have to. So you leave the brother's body unburied until Marita comes. No thanks, Mr. Seabree. I understand that Marita is a cold-blooded killer. I know he killed your son in a gunfight that was no contest. I came here to take him for you. But I bury the dead, Mr. Seabree. Good day, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like a room. My horse is outside. All right, I'll take him to the livery. You uh, staying long, mister? Uh, just the night. Can I get a bath? Well... Water's real scarce here, mister. You get a pitcher full and you can do anything you want with it. (laughs) It's real warm. I know. Uh, you the, uh, gunfighter? I'm the man Seabree brought in. Well, Marita killed nine men, some say more. He needs dying. Who are you? Well, my name's Haskell, John Haskell. You know Marita? He was born here. Beyond that, did you know him? Well, he, he was a friend of mine. Uh, used to be. Now you want him dead. I told you, mister. He needs dying. The town was still quiet the next morning as I walked across the street to get my horse. One of Seabree's hands was dozing in a chair near the stable door, a shotgun in his lap. As I came out of the sunlight and walked toward the stall, I had a feeling that someone was behind me in the shadows. And I was right. Mister, is this your fight? No, it 
this my fight? Are you Morita? I am Juan Morita, and I will advise you to stay inside. He moved out of the door like a panther. The man in the chair was dead before he could raise his shotgun. Morita caught Seabree's other man as he came lurching onto the street. And then came Mr. Seabree himself. Only this time it was different. Morita's shot only wounded them. I'll get you next time, Morita. I'll get you. There will be no next time for you, John Seabree. Morita. I thought you said this was not your fight. You don't kill a man that way. Stay out of this. You place. don't kill him when he's lying on the ground, when he can't reach his gun. <laughs> I tried to get to him, but I was too late and I was too slow. Before I could draw, Morita swung his gun butt down on my head. Say, right now, you may have something worth $1,000 to you under the hood of your car and may not even know it. Something worth a 1000 silver dollars. A regular filter check is important to today's cars. So important that Fram Corporation is offering $60,000 in cash to get you to check your filters now. Last year, in preparation for Fram's silver anniversary, 10,000 secretly numbered Fram filter cartridges were distributed all over the United States and installed during regular servicing. These filters are worth varying amounts from $1 to $1,000. You may have one in your own car and not even know it. A Fram filter worth 1,000 silver dollars. Check your oil filter and air filter now. If there's a specially numbered Fram filter in your car, you'll win up to 1,000 silver dollars and your dealer will win the same amount. Get in on Fram's big silver treasure hunt. Check your filters now. The trail I followed after Juan Morita was long, hot, and dry. The desert knows how to keep its secrets. And I had been riding for three weeks when I finally came to another small adobe town and went in to see the sheriff. Something I can do for you, mister? That depends. I'm looking for Juan Morita. Oh, that's so. You know him? Yes, I know him. By sight? How long you been after him, mister? About three weeks. Do you know where he is? I know where he is. What did he do, mister? Pay you to protect him, or are you just afraid? How long has it been since you read a paper, mister? Go on, pick it up. Might learn something. Amnesty. What amnesty? Read it for yourself. Three years of violence ended today when a general amnesty was declared in the bloody Wren Seabree feud in New Mexico. Is this true? Yeah, it's true. Go well, on, read the rest of it. The amnesty was called by Major General Thomas Hardy. The involved principals have laid down their arms and taken oaths to keep the peace. General Hardy said anyone breaking the amnesty would be summarily court-martialed and executed. Among those taking the oath was Juan Carlos Morita. And you don't break the amnesty. It'd start the whole thing up again. Where is he? He's on his way home. To Seabreeze Town? That's right. Now, you better listen, mister. They mean it about this amnesty. You kill him, you hang. It had to stop somewhere. Let it lie. It's done. Not quite. Almost, but not quite. Mister, I know Morita. I respect him. He says he wants to hang up his gun. I believe him. Now, give him his chance. He'll have a chance. The small campfire was nearly out, but there were still embers. The long hunt was coming to an end. Juan Morita had been there. He couldn't be far away. In fact, at the moment, he was closer than I wanted him to be. Your gun belt. <laughs> Let it drop. Be quick. <sighs> now turn around so I can see your face. Ah. The man who was there with John Seabrick. I was there. That day when you shot a wounded man in cold blood. John Seabrick put a rope around my brother's neck. My brother was 18 years old. He did not even shave yet. 
And John Sibre let him lie dead in the street. How many men did your brother kill? Your 18-year-old brother. What do you sell his life for, Marita? I do not want to kill you. How many men, Marita? I do not want to kill again. I do not even know you. I have no hate for you. How, how much are Sibri's people paying you? How much am I worth? No charge. I want you for myself. But why? I am nothing to you. You should have made the first shot count. If you'd killed Sibri with the first shot, I wouldn't have given you a second thought. You had better stop thinking about me, mister. I am going now. If you follow me, I will kill your horse. Do not make me do that. You'll have to kill me, too. I could do that, mister. Yes, I guess you could. His gun was pointed right at my belly. He could have killed me, but he didn't. He stood there, and he started to tremble. And then, very slowly, his gun hand dropped to his side. No. No, I will not kill you. I will not kill again. I put my life in your hands. Here. I give you my gun. Mister, I give you $200, all I got. You take me home alive. Don't let anyone lay a gun on me until I get there. Man should die among his people. I will not wear a gun again. Who's going to win the thoroughbred Kentucky Clubs? Thoroughbred, who's going to win that horse and make it pay? Lots of money will Kentucky Club. Pipe tobacco has to find a winner. So the horse is here. The time is near. Get your entry blank today. Yes, enter the annual Derby Day contest sponsored by Kentucky Club's nine brands of pipe tobaccos. First prize, a thoroughbred bay coat, son of famous oil capital, who won over $580,000. Jockey Ted Atkinson helps select this prize coat. You name him and he's yours. He could win a fortune for you. Get Kentucky Club Derby Day contest entry blanks free at tobacco counters now. Hey, who's going to win the thoroughbred Kentucky Club's thoroughbred? Who's going to win that horse and make it pay? Want the money? Well, Kentucky Club, pipe tobacco has to find a winner. So the horse is here, the time is near. Get your entry blank today. <laughs> long ride home for Marita. We had time to get to know each other in the silences and in the times when we talked. Let's rest the horses a minute. All right. Oh, oh boy. Paladin? Yeah? You think it is possible they will let me come back? You think they can let themselves forget? I don't know, Marita. Some won't. Some may try, I don't know, but if it were me, I'd ride west. I wouldn't try to go back. No. No, my people say a man is like a tree. You tear out his roots, he dies. No man wants to die. I have killed 12 men, Paladin. I remember the faces of each of them. I do not forget. You think I have a right to live? You have a right to try a man speaks of death, but he is not sincere. I want to live. I want to get married. You think I'm crazy? No, Marita. A little optimistic, maybe, but not crazy. Marie, she's a woman with a tender spirit. I would give my eyes to know that I could grow old together with her. You will see her, Paladin. and you will tell me if she's not a woman to behold. I'm sure she is. I will not live a week. I will not wear a gun, and I will not live a week. I was an altar boy, and now I have killed 12 men. I cannot forget. And if I cannot, Paladin, can the others? Then why go back? To try? Let's go. Morita was making a good try, and it wasn't easy. There was sullenness and suspicion through the town the day we got back. The hangman's rig still stood in the middle of the street, and there was talk that it was waiting for Marita. But he kept his word. He didn't put on a gun. And on the night of the fiesta, it looked like he might make it. You see, Paladin? You see, my Maria? I told you she is a woman to behold. You were right, one. 
She's lovely. The senor is very kind. And we will marry and we will have children and we will live together until we are old. Is that not so, Maria? Oh, Juan. It is so. <laughs> I drink too much. I talk too much. This is for you, Paladin. You dance with my Maria. I will be back in a little bit. It will be my pleasure. Maria? Would you forgive me, Mr. Paladin, if I asked you to come aside with me for a moment? I would like a chance to talk with you. Always at the service of a pretty woman, Maria. Francis. That Juan, tonight he is drunk. Tonight he remembers how much we used to love each other. Do you think he will remember tomorrow when he's tired or angry or feels he must kill someone? I don't speak for him, Maria. Do you love him? A man like that? If you're a woman, he can stir you. I do not know if I love him anymore, Mr. Paladin. But I do not want to marry him. And tell him so. He has killed 12 men, senor. Do you know how simple it would be for him to kill another? Who? Another. No. No more, Maria. The killing is finished. I believe him. I'm going to marry someone else, Mr. Paladin. He is not a gunfighter. I'm afraid for him. Tell Juan. He won't strap on a gun. He won't kill this man. And if he tries? If he tries... I won't let him. What is this you will not let someone do, Paris? I won't let you put on a gun, Morita. I get my word. Why should I break it? I don't think you will. But, Mari, she thinks I will. Is that it? Why, Mari? Why? One. It is said, Paladin, that only a fool does between lovers. Why, Mari? I cannot marry you, Juan. But I love you. It is too late. Too much has changed. You have changed. Another. There is another. While I was away. Who is he, Maria? I love him, Juan. I believe you. Tell me his name. Do not kill his him. His name. You know my name, Juan. I know your name, John Haskell. I called you friend. Do you have a gun, friend? I own one. In the street. Tonight. Morita. Do not make me come after you, Haskell. Die big, friend. Maybe she will cry for you. Morita, you gave me your word. Maria, she gave me her word too, Mr. Paladin. And so it was not over after all. There was to be another shooting in another dusty street. And it could only come out one way. Man doesn't learn much about gunfighting working behind a hotel desk. But Haskell wouldn't hide. He came outside the hotel, wearing his gun belt awkwardly. Morita's shot caught him in the shoulder. Then it was up to me. After all, I had also given my word. Follow him. Do not stand in front of him. You're not going to shoot him again, Morita. Do not make me kill you. You're not good enough to fight me. We'll see. I said it. It seems a long time ago. I do not wish to kill you. You have a choice, Morita. You can throw away a gun, and they'll hang you for breaking the amnesty. Or you can fight me. I will not hang. He lay there in the street, in the shadow of the hangman's rig. Juan Morita had tried, but he couldn't live without his gun. At least he didn't hang. Drink, Mr. Paladin. Mm. Hey, boy, bring a brandy. Mm. Oh. Oh, thanks, sir. Just sit down. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Paladin. Mm. You want hey, boy, to read paper with you? Find job for you like the last time? No, hey, boy. 
Not like last time. Oh, but, uh, Mr. Paladin, big hero. Stop feud, kill big killer. No. You're not a hero if you kill a man who wanted you to do it. What Mr. Paladin mean? Never mind. Just get me another drink. Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman McDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Julian Fink and adapted for radio by Marion Clark. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lillian Bayef, Clark Gordon, Lawrence Dobkin, and Barney Phillips. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. Suspense. is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is one of the most compelling actresses in America today, Miss Agnes Moorhead. Miss Moorhead returns to our stage to appear in a new study in terror by Lucille Fletcher called Sorry, Wrong Number. This story of a woman who accidentally overheard a conversation with death and who strove frantically to prevent murder from claiming an innocent victim is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Sorry, Wrong Number and the performance of Agnes Moorhead, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Operator, I've been dialing Murray Hill 70093 now for the last three quarters of an hour, and the line is always busy. I don't see how it could be busy that long. Will you try it for me, please? I'll be glad to try that number for you. One moment, please. I don't see how it could be busy all this time. It's my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor, and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. Hello? Uh, hello? Is Mr. Stevenson hello? there? Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, George. Yes, sir. This is George speaking. Hello? Who's this? What number am I calling, please? I'm here with our client now. He says the coast is clear for tonight. Yes, sir. Where are you now? In a phone booth. Now, don't worry. Everything's okay. Very well. 
Now, you know the address. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. Be sure that all the lights downstairs are on, eh? There should be only one light visible from the street. At 11.15, a train crosses the bridge. It makes a noise in case her window is open and she should scream. Oh, hello. What number is this, please? Okay. I understand. Now, make it quick. As little blood as possible, huh? Our client does not wish to make us suffer long. Will a knife be okay, sir? Well, a knife will be okay. And uh, do you remember the other details? Yeah, yeah, I know. Remove the rings and bracelets and the jewelry in the bureau drawer. That's right. Our client wishes it to look like simple robbery. Don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. All right, then. Be sure that... Oh, 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 how awful, how unspeakably awful. Your call, please. Operator, I, I, I've just been cut off. I'm sorry, what number were you calling? Why, it, it was supposed to be Murray Hill 70093, but it wasn't. Some wires must have got crossed. I was cut into a wrong number, and I, I, I've i just heard the most dreadful thing, something about a murder. And, operator, you'll simply have to retrace that call at once. I beg your pardon. May I help you? Oh, I, I know it was a wrong number, and I had no business listening, but these two men, they were cold-blooded fiends, and they were going to murder somebody, some poor innocent woman who was all alone in a house near a bridge, and we've got to stop them. We've got what to... What number were you calling, please? Well, that doesn't matter. This was a wrong number, and you dialed it for me, and we've got to find out what it was immediately. What number did you call? Oh, why are you so stupid? What, what time is it? Do you mean to tell me you can't find out what that number was just now? I'll connect you with the chief operator. Oh, I think it's perfectly shameful. Now, look, look, it was obviously a case of some little slip of the finger. I, I told you to try Murray Hill 70093 for me. You dialed it, but your finger must have slipped, and I was connected with some other number. A and I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. Now, now, I simply fail to see why you couldn't make that same mistake again on, on purpose, why you couldn't try to dial Murray Hill 70093 in the same sort of careless way. Murray Hill 70093, I will try to get it for you. Thank you. <sighs> I'm sorry, Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you at 20... Operator! Operator! Uh, operator, will you answer me? Your call, please. Well, you didn't try to get that wrong number at all. I asked you explicitly and all you did was dial correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, what number are you calling? Oh, can't you for once forget what number I'm calling and do something for me? Now, I want to trace that call. It's my civic duty, it's your civic duty to trace that call and apprehend those dangerous killers. And if you won't... I will connect you with the chief operator. Please. Oh. This is the chief operator. Oh, uh, chief operator, I want you to trace a call, a, a telephone call immediately. I don't know where it came from or who was making it, but it's absolutely necessary that it be tracked down because it was about a murder that someone's planning. A, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman. Tonight at 11.15. I see. Well, can you trace it for me? Can you track down those men? I'm not certain. It depends. Depends on what? It depends on whether the call is still going on. If it's a live call, we can trace it on the equipment. If it's been disconnected, we can't. Disconnect? If the parties have stopped talking to each other. Oh, but, but of course they must have stopped talking to each other by now. That was at least five minutes ago, and they didn't sound like the type who would make a long call. Well, I can try tracing it. May well, I have your name, please? Mrs. Stevenson. Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Now, but, but listen... And your telephone number, please. Oh, uh, Plaza 42295. But if you go on wasting all this time... Why do you want the call traced, please? Why? Well... Oh, no reason. No reason. I, I mean, I, I merely felt very strongly that something ought to be done about it. These, these men sounded like killers. They're, they're dangerous. They're going to murder this woman at 11.15 tonight, and I thought the police ought to know. Have you reported this to, to the police? Well, no, no, not yet. You want this call checked purely as a private individual? Yes, yes, but meanwhile... I'm sorry, Mrs. Stevenson, but I'm afraid we couldn't make this check for you and trace the call just in your say-so as a private individual. Well, I... We'd have to do something more official. Oh, for heaven's sake. You mean to tell me I can't report that there's going to be a murder without getting tied up in all this red tape? Why, it's perfectly idiotic. Well, all right, all right. I'll call the police. Thank you. I'm sure that would be the best way to... Oh, ridiculous. 
ridiculous. It's perfectly ridiculous. All this red tape. Oh. Your call, please. Uh, the police department. Get me the police department, please. Uh, thank you. Bringing the police department. Okay. Police station, precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Uh, police department, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Elbert Smythe Stevenson of 53 North Sutton Place. I'm calling up to report a murder. I, I mean, the murder hasn't been committed yet, but I, I, I just overheard plans for it over the telephone, over a wrong number that the operator gave me. I've been trying to trace down the call myself, but everybody is so stupid, and I, I guess in the end you're the only people who could do anything. Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it, it was a perfectly definite murder. I, I heard their plans distinctly. Uh, uh, two men were talking, and they were going to murder some woman at 11.15 tonight. Uh, she lived in a house near a bridge. Are you listening to me? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. And, and there was a private patrolman on the street. He was going to go around for a beer on 2nd Avenue. And, and, and there was some third man, a, a client, who was uh, paying to have this poor woman murdered. They were going to take her rings and bracelets and, and, and use a knife. Well, it's, it's unnerved me dreadfully, and I'm not well. Uh, I see. Uh, I... When was all this, ma'am? Uh, well, uh, about eight minutes ago. Oh, I, then you can do something you do understand. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? Uh, Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Stevenson. And your address? Uh, 53 North Sutton Place. 53 North Sutton Place. That's near a bridge. The, the Queensboro Bridge, you know. And, and, and we have a private patrolman on our street. And, and, and 2nd Avenue. And what was the number you were calling? Murray Hill 70093. But, but that wasn't the number I overheard. I, I mean, Murray Hill 70093 is my husband's office. He's, he's working late tonight, and I was trying to reach him to ask him to come home. I'm an invalid, you know, and uh, it's the maid's night off, and I hate to be alone, even though he says I'm perfectly safe as long as I have the telephone right beside my bed. Well, we'll look into it, Mrs. Stevenson. Well, and we'll see if we can check it with the telephone company. But the telephone company said they couldn't check the call if the parties had stopped talking. I've already taken care of that. Oh, you have? Yes. And personally, I feel you ought to do something far more immediate and drastic than just check the call. What good does checking the call do if they stop talking? By the time you track it down, they'll already have committed the murder. Well, we'll take care of it. Don't you worry. Well, I'd say the whole thing calls for a search, a complete and thorough search of the whole city. Now, I'm very near the bridge, and I'm not far from 2nd Avenue, and I know I'd feel a lot better if, if you sent around a radio car to this neighborhood at once. And what makes you think the murder's going to be committed in your neighborhood, Oh, ma'am? well, I, I don't know. Only the coincidence is so horrible. 2nd Avenue and uh, uh, patrolman and the bridge? 2nd uh, Avenue is a very long street, ma'am. I know. And you know how many bridges there are in the city of New York alone. Oh. Not to mention Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx. I know. How do you know there isn't some little house out on Staten Island on some little 2nd Avenue you've never even heard about? Oh. How do you know they're even talking in, about New York at all? But I heard the call in the New York dialing system. Uh, maybe it was a long-distance call you overheard. Oh, uh, telephones are funny things. Look, lady, why don't you look at it this way? Supposing you hadn't broken in on that telephone call. Supposing you'd got your husband the way you always do. You wouldn't be upset, would you? No, I suppose not. Only it, it, it sounded so inhuman, so cold-blooded. Well, a lot of murders are plotted in this city every day, ma'am. Well, we managed to prevent most all of them, but a clue of this kind is so vague. I... Isn't much more use to us than no clue at but all. But surely you... Unless, of course, uh, you have some reason for thinking this call was phony and that somebody may be planning to murder you. Me? Oh, you... Well, no, I hardly think so. Well, I, I mean, why should anybody? I, I, I'm alone all day and night. I, I see nobody except my maid, Eloise, and, and, and she's a big girl. She weighs 200 pounds. She's too lazy to bring up my breakfast tray. And the, and the only other person is my husband, Albert. He's crazy about me. He just adores me. Wait. On me hand and foot has scarcely left my side since I took sick 12 years ago. Well, and there's nothing for you to worry about. Well, I... Now, if you'll just leave the rest of this to us, we'll but take care of it. what will you do? It's so late. It's nearly 11 now. We'll take care of it, lady. Well, will you broadcast it all over the city and send out squads and, and, and warn your radio cars to watch out, especially in suspicious neighborhoods like mine? Lady, I said we'd take care of it. I... 
just now. I've got a couple of other matters here on my desk that require immediate attention. Good night, ma'am, and thank you. Oh, you, you idiot. Oh. oh, now, why did I hang up the phone like that? Now he'll think I am a fool. Oh, why doesn't Albert come home? Why doesn't he? Oh. No. Your call, please. Operator, for heaven's sake, will you ring that Murray Hill 70093 number again? I can't think what's keeping him so long. I will try it for you. Well, try, try. Oh. So nervous. Murray Hill, 70093, is busy. I will call you... I can hear it. You don't have to tell me. I know it's busy. Oh. Oh, if... If I could only get out of this bed for a little while. If I could... If I could get a breath of fresh air or just lean out of the window or... Or see the street. (laughs) Hello? Albert? Hello? 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 Oh, what's the matter with this phone? Hello, hello. Hello? Hello? Oh, for heaven's sake, who is this? Hello? Hello, hello. Your call, please. Hello, operator. I don't know what's the matter with this telephone tonight, but it's positively driving me crazy. I've never seen such inefficient, miserable service. Now, 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 look. I'm an invalid, and I'm very nervous, and I'm not supposed to be annoyed. But if this keeps on much longer... What seems to be the trouble, please? Well, everything's wrong. I haven't had one bit of satisfaction out of one call I've made this evening. The whole world could be murdered for all you people care. And now, now my phone keeps ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing every five seconds or so. And when I pick it up, there's no one there. I'm sorry. If you will hang up, I will test it for you. I don't want you to test it for me. I want you to put that call through, whatever it is, at, at once. I'm afraid I cannot do that. You can't? And why? Why, may I ask? The dial system is automatic. If someone is trying to dial your number, there is no way to check whether the call is coming through the system or not. Unless the person who is trying to reach you complains to his particular operator. Well, of all this stupid... And meanwhile, I've got to sit here in my bed suffering every time that phone rings, imagining everything. I will try to check the trouble for you. Check it, check it. That's all anybody can do. Oh, what's the use of talking to you? You're stupid. (gasps) I'll fix her. Of all the impudence... Oh, how dare she speak to me like that? How dare she speak to me like that? Oh. Oh. She answered. Your call, please. Young woman, I don't know your name. But there are ways of finding you out. And I'm going to report you to your superiors for the most unpardonable rudeness and insolence that has ever been my privilege. Give me the business office at once. You may dial that number direct. Dial it direct? I'll do no such thing. I don't even know the number. The number is in the di- directory, or you may secure it by dialing information. Now listen here, you... Oh, what's the use? Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, I'm going out of my mind. Not a... Hello? Hello? Stop ringing me, do you hear? Answer me. Who is this? You realize you're driving me crazy? Who's calling me? What are you doing it for? Now stop it, stop it, stop it, I say. Hello? Hello? If you don't stop ringing me, I'm going to call the police, do you hear? The police! (laughs) Oh, if Albert would only come home. (laughs) Oh, let it ring. Let it go on ringing. It's a trick of some kind. And I won't answer it. I won't. I won't, even if it goes on ringing all night. (laughs) Now, what's the matter? Why did they stop ringing all of a sudden? What time is it? 
Oh, where did I put that clock? <laughs> Five to eleven. Oh, oh, they've decided something. They're sure I'm home. They heard my voice answer them just now. That's why they've been ringing me. Why no one has answered me? Oh, I'm afraid of again. Oh, oh, where is she? Why doesn't she answer? Oh, I'm afraid of Why doesn't she answer? Your call, please. Where were you just now? Why didn't you answer at once? Give me the police department. I'm sorry. Just a minute. Oh. Oh. I'm uh, sorry. The line is busy. I will call you. Busy? Busy? But that's impossible. The police department can't be busy. There must be other lines available. The line is busy. Oh. I will try to get them for you later. No, no. I've got to speak to them now or it may be too late. I've got to talk to someone. What number do you wish to speak to? Please. I don't know, but there must be someone to protect people beside the police department. I, 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 a detective agency. A, a... Uh, you will find agencies listed in the classified directory. But I don't have a classified directory. I, 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 I mean, I'm too nervous to I look it up. I will connect you with information. Know. Perhaps she will be able to help you. No, no. Oh, you're being spiteful, aren't you? You don't care, do you, what happens to me? I could die and you would <laughs> Oh, stop it! Stop it! I can't stand anymore! Hello? What do you want? Stop ringing, will you? Stop it! Hello? Is this Plaza 42295? Uh, yes, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry. This, uh, yes, this is Plaza 42295. This is Western Union. Uh, I have a telegram here for Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Uh, is there anyone there to receive the message? Uh, uh, yes, I, I'm Mrs. Stevenson. The telegram is as follows. Mrs. Albert Stevenson, 53 North Sutton Place, New York, New York. Darling, terribly sorry. Tried to get you for last hour, but line busy. Oh. Leaving for Boston, 11 oh. p.m. tonight on urgent business. Back tomorrow afternoon. Keep happy. Love, signed, Albert. Oh, no. Do you wish us to deliver a copy of the message? No. No, thank you. Thank you, madam. Good night. Good night. Oh. Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. He couldn't do it, not when he knows I'll be all alone. It's some trick. It's some trick. Some fiendish, some fiendish trick. I know. Oh, I'm so nervous. Operator, try that Murray Hill 70093 number for me just once more, please. You may dial that number direct. Oh. You. Oh. number of Henchley Hospital. Henchley Hospital? Yes. Do you have the street address? No, no, it's somewhere in the 70s. It's a very small, uh, private and exclusive hospital where I had my appendix out two years ago. Henchley, H-E-N-C-A. Well, will you please hurry and, and uh, please, what is the time? You may find out the time by dialing Meridian 
7212. Oh, for heaven's sake, I've no time to be dialing. The number of Henchley Hospital is Butterfield 70105. Butterfield 70105. Henchley Hospital, good evening. The nurse's registry. Who was it you wished to speak to, please? I want the nurse's registry at once. I, I, I want a trained nurse. I want to hire immediately for the night. I see. And what is the nature of the case, madam? Nerves. I, I, I'm very nervous. I, I need soothing and, and companionship. You, you see, my husband is away and I'm... Have also... you been recommended to us by any doctor in particular, madam? No, but I really don't see why all this catechizing is necessary. I, I, I just want a trained nurse. I was a patient in your hospital two years ago and after all, I, I do expect to pay this person for attending me. Well, we quite understand that, madam, but these are war times, you know. I know that. Registered nurses are very scarce just now. And our superintendent has asked us to send people out only <laughs> on cases where the physician in charge feels it's absolutely necessary. Well, it is absolutely necessary. I'm a sick woman. I'm I'm very much upset. Very. I'm, I'm alone in this house and I'm an invalid and, and, and tonight I overheard a telephone conversation that upset me dreadfully. In fact, if, if someone doesn't come at once, I'm afraid I'll go out of my mind. I see. Well, I'll speak to Miss Phillips as soon as she comes in. And what is your name, ma'am? Miss Phillips? And when do you expect her in? I really couldn't say. She went out to supper at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? But it, it's not 11 o'clock yet. Oh, oh, my clock has stopped. I thought it was running down. What time is it? Just just 15 minutes past 11. What was that? What was what, madam? That, that click just now in my own telephone. As though someone had lifted the receiver off the hook of the extension telephone downstairs? Well, I didn't hear it, madam. Now, about this... But I, I did. There's there's someone in this house. Someone downstairs in the kitchen. And they're, they're listening to me now. They're listening! <sighs> I won't... I won't pick it up. I... I won't let them hear me. I won't let them hear me. I'll be quiet... I'll be so quiet. And they'll think... Oh. oh, but if I don't call someone now, while they're still down there, maybe there'll be no time. Oh, I've got to... Oh, somebody's got to help me. Somebody's got to help me. Oh. Your call, please. Operator, I'm... I'm in desperate trouble. I'm sorry, I, I cannot hear you. Please speak louder. I... I, I, I don't dare, I... There's someone listening. Can, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Oh, but you've got to, you've got to hear me. Oh, please, please, you've got to help me. There's, there's someone in this house. Someone who's going to murder me. And, and you've got to get in touch with, you oh, oh, there it is. There it is, did you hear it? He's, he's put it down. He's put down the extension phone. He's. He's coming up. Ah! Oh, he's, he's coming upstairs. Okay, okay, give me the police department. The police department. Oh, give me the police department. One moment, please. I will connect you. I can hear him. Oh, I can hear him. He's coming nearer. Oh, I know it. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry, please. Police Department. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Must have got the wrong number. Precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Police Department, Martin speaking. Police Department, Martin speaking. Oh, Police Department? Police Department. I'm sorry, must have got the wrong number. D don't worry. Everything's okay. <laughs> And 
so closes Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Agnes Moorhead. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Mr. Donald Crisp and Mr. John Loder will star in the suspense play called The Extra Guest. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, and Lucille Fletcher, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Jello Puddings present... Henry! Henry Aldrich! Coming, Mother. The Aldrich family, based on characters originated by Clifford Goldsmith, and starring Ezra Stone as Henry with Jackie Kelk as Homer. And here they are. Just a taste of Jello Puddings, and believe me, you will know, they are made by famous... J-E-L-L-O Yes, and more people eat Jell-O puddings than any other prepared puddings in the world because you never tasted anything better. Jell-O chocolate, butterscotch, and vanilla puddings, a trio of treats, chock full of old-fashioned homemade goodness. Try it. See if you don't say that Jell-O puddings are richer, creamier, more all-round delicious. They're made with milk and nourishing, and they cook to perfection in just about five minutes. But the great thing about Jell-O puddings is you never tasted anything better. And now for the Aldrich family. As summer arrives, everybody makes plans for a change of scenery. But a teenage boy needs no such change. For every new activity his impulsive mind touches on opens up new avenues toward trouble and excitement. It's Saturday morning, and the scene opens in the Aldrich front hall, where Henry is on the telephone. Is everything all set, Homer? Sure. I hope you like mustard sandwiches. I love them. With a little chili sauce. Yeah? Are you bringing something to wash them down? Sure. His water. Well, anyway, once we get out to McCorkle's Rocks, we won't care if we eat or not. We won't? I'll get my bike and come right over. Well, look, why don't I come over there? I want to get out of the house. Why? My mother's on the warpath. Boy, wouldn't you know she'd pick the first decent day this year to decide the garage had to be painted? Gee whiz, does she expect you to paint it? Well, she's working on my father right now. But something tells me she'll be after me in a minute. You mean your father's putting up an argument? With my mother? Don't be crazy. He's pretending he's asleep. Well, in that case, in that case, you better get out quick. That's what I say. If I can just get past the breakfast dishes. Gee whiz, Homer. I don't know why it is every time I plan something with you, some member of your family tries to throw a monkey wrench into things. I'll get out, Henry. Don't worry. I'll be over there in five minutes. Well, okay. What's that, Mother? Hello, Henry. Yeah? I'll be right over, just as soon as I bring in the washing. Listen, Homer, why do you let your family walk all over you like that? Gee, I don't know. Why don't you stick up for your rights? Sure. Okay. Sure. I'll be there as soon as I bring in the washing. Homer, I'm counting on you. Sure. So long. Goodbye. Henry! Yes, Mother? What are you doing, dear? Oh, uh, gee, I'm not doing anything. Well, then please come out here and do the breakfast dishes. Well... Mother, when I said I wasn't doing anything, I didn't mean I wasn't doing anything. I mean... Henry, don't stand out there and yell. I know, but... Henry! Father, is that you? It is. And, Henry, do you see this package? Sure, only I thought you went to the office, Father. I started to, but... Henry, wait until you step outside. What's outside? Summer, my boy, summer. The sun's shining, the birds are singing. It's no day to sit in an office. Look here. Let me show you what I bought. Gee, Father, why? You'll see. You'll see. Oh, uh, seeds. Yes, sir. Vegetables, flowers, enough for a whole late planting. And I've got another surprise for you. You have? I'm going to turn this entire day over to the garden and to you. To me? Well, I've been pretty busy this winter, son. <laughs> I haven't been able to see as much of you as I would have liked. I know, but You're I... You've got to remedy that. 
You and I are going to spend one grand day working in our garden. Today? Yes, sir. We'll putter around in the sunshine and catch up on each other's news. Maybe top the whole thing off with a soda at the Haven's drugstore. How's that sound? That sounds swell, Father. Only... Only what? Well, Homer and I... Well, gee, if I had any idea you were planning on... Oh, you made some plans with Homer? Well, that's all right, son. I don't mind if Homer joined them. Well, the only thing is... Yeah? Well, it's just that Homer was kind of looking forward to... To, to these other plans we've made. Oh, I see. Father, I... That's perfectly all right, Henry. Naturally, I wouldn't force you to spend the day with me. Father, I don't want you to think... Please don't give it another thought. Just forget the whole thing. Gee. Gee, what kind of seeds have you got there anyway? Nothing at all, just the same old thing. And please excuse me. But, Father, I'd be very interested in seeing them. Henry Aldrich, I've never been so ashamed of you in my life. I just feel as though I've failed somewhere along the line as a mother. You mean you've been listening? Henry, do you realize that you spend practically 365 days a year with Homer Brown? That's right. And all that time your father is out working his fingers to the bone so he can feed and clothe you and give you a good education. Gee, Mother, I didn't mean to hurt his feelings. Well, you did, dear. Gee, what do you think I should do? I'm sure I don't know. The whole thing is entirely in your own lap. Mother, where are you going? I'm going to leave you alone so you can think things over. Why, Sam, what are you doing out there? I'm sitting, Alice. Can't you find any place more comfortable than the stairs? I don't want to be comfortable. Now, Sam. Alice, please go on with your housework. Well, what are you going to do, dear? I'll either go to the office or get a haircut. I haven't decided which... Oh, I'll answer the phone. Thank you, Sam. Hello? Hello, Sam. This is Will Brown. Yes, Will. Look, I only have a minute while Elizabeth's talking to the milkman. You doing anything today? Not a thing. What do you say we run out to Fletcher's Pond and get in some fishing? Well, I had planned on working in the garden, but... On a hot day like this? Bring your back over a hole and shovel? Well... When you could stretch out in the grass and watch the clouds roll by? Will, you're 100% right. I don't know what I was thinking of. I'll be right over. No, I'll come over there. Huh? Elizabeth's got our garage on her mind, and if I... Do... Uh-oh, here she comes. What's that? Yes, sir. Yes, indeed, Mr. Uh, by all means, I'll drop in at your... What? I'll drop in right away, and we'll sign the contracts on that, uh, that deal. What? Uh, goodbye. Will. Will, what are you talking about? Father. Will. Yes, Henry? Father, I've been thinking it over in G. Let's go. Let's go where? Out to the garden. Uh, Henry, uh, why don't we just leave the garden for some other day? Gee, Father, you don't have to pretend with me. Huh? Uh, well, look at it this way. The sun's boiling hot. And the first thing you know, you're breaking your back over a hole. Well, of course, if you'd rather not. Oh, no, don't feel that... Well, I mean, naturally, what I want to do is work in the garden with you, of course. Well, then I guess it's all settled. I guess. Yes, I guess it is. Listen, Henry, why don't you come right out and tell your father? And break his heart, Homer? She was. Are we going to have to spend the whole day planting your garden? Listen, Homer, can you casually look down at the other end of the garden without my father seeing you? Sure. What's he doing? He seems to be having an argument of some kind with my father. Yeah? Listen, Henry, just tell me one thing. What? Do you really want to go out to McCorkle's Rocks with me? Because if you don't, just say so. I'll understand. Sure I do, Homer. Sure I do. But first I have to think of some way to get my father occupied. Here, you be planting this row. But if I'm going to spend the day working, I might just as well be home painting our garage. Painting your... Painting your... Homer. What? Homer, you're a genius. Who, me? Listen, listen, I know how I, how I can get my father to kick me out. Yeah, gee whiz, how? Look at our garage, Homer. Isn't it a mess? Now that you mention it, sure. Well, all I have to do is get my father interested in painting it, and I'll be free. I don't follow you, Ham. Whenever he gets painting the garage, he always throws me out. That's one thing he'll never let me touch. Why would you want to? Why do you think? Because he won't let me. But, Henry, where are you going? To start the ball rolling. Sam, all you have to do is come right out and tell Henry. Tell me what, Father? Uh, well, uh, nothing, Henry, not a thing. Uh, how's the garden coming along? Mm, just fine. How's your end? We're getting there. Well, look... Father, 
Have you happened to notice our garage recently? Isn't it a sight? Why, uh... Don't you think it could use a coat of paint? Why, yes, Henry, that's an excellent idea. Look at it, Will. Isn't it a sight? It looks all right to me. Will. What? You stay right here, Father. I'll go and get the paint. You do that, son. Sam, have you gone crazy? Look, Will, this is our chance to get away and go fishing. Yeah? For as long as I can remember, Henry's wanted to paint the garage, and I've never let him touch it. Is that right? But today, Will, I'm going to let him paint the whole thing himself. <laughs> Busy, Elizabeth. I'm glad you phoned. But I won't keep you, dear. I just wondered if you had any large paint brushes. How large? For painting a garage. Oh, you're having your garage painted? No, Alice. I'm painting it myself. Really? And I might even fall off the ladder and break my neck. What's that? And then perhaps they'll be sorry. Who, Elizabeth? Will and Homer. Honestly, Alice, those two would go to the ends of the earth to avoid a little work. Well, are you sure they wouldn't do it for you, Elizabeth, if you asked them nicely? Alice, dear, I've asked them nicely in every other way. Oh, well, men are all the same, I guess. Well, I guess I'm pretty lucky. Are you, dear? Yes, it's quite a coincidence, but Sam and Henry are getting ready to paint our garage right now. They are? Well, how long did you have to work on them? As a matter of fact, I didn't say a word about it. They always seem to know what I want done without my even having to say. Really? Well, well, of course, Homer and Will think a lot of me, too. Oh, certainly. I don't believe in judging a man by how much work he does around the house, do you? Oh, of course not. And, Elizabeth, if you want to come and pick it up, I'd be glad to lend you a paintbrush. All right. And, Alice, do you think people will talk if I come over in my overalls? <laughs> behind the garage, son. Uh, well, Henry, have you got all the paint out? Yes, sir, and here, Father, I thought you might like to start with this big brush. Henry, I have a big surprise for you. You have? He sure has, Henry. Yes, sir, you may keep it. Keep what? That brush. Father, what for? Well, I've been pretty unfair in the past, Henry, when you wanted to paint the garage. I realize that now, so you have my permission to go to it. But, but, but... but... Can't quite believe it, eh, son? Well, it's a fact. But, Father, I can't be trusted with a paintbrush. <laughs> Why, who said so? You said so. Says I was wrong, Henry. You go ahead and enjoy yourself. I know, but gee whiz. I'm getting right out of your way and leaving you a clear field. Hey, Henry. And Homer can help you. The paint's already in. Yeah, well, listen, Homer, I have something to tell you. <laughs> Did you see his face, Will? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anybody so surprised. I have to hand it to you, Sam. It worked like a charm. Now, I'll just dash in the house and grab my fishing tackle. Okay. I'll only be five minutes. Say, these are pretty nice brushes. While I'm waiting, do you mind if I daub a little red trim around the door here? I don't mind if Henry doesn't. Just a few inches here. I can't resist red paint. Help yourself, Will. Is that you, Sam? Yes, Alice. Oh, oh, I didn't know we had company. Good morning, sir. What's that? Why, Elizabeth. In those, with your back hurt. I thought... Elizabeth came over to borrow a paintbrush, Sam. Oh, well, they're all out in the backyard. <laughs> Excuse me. How are you, Elizabeth? Oh, not too bad, Sam. I've been having a little trouble, though, with my... Uh, with, with my... Well, I guess he's gone. We might as well go out and get that brush. Oh, yes, and I do appreciate your... Elizabeth, what are you staring at? My goodness, what do you see out in the backyard? Unless my eyes deceive me, I see my husband, Will, and my son, Homer. Yes? Painting your garage. <laughs> My goodness. Excuse me. Elizabeth, where are you going? Will Brown. Hello, Elizabeth. Homer. Gee whiz, Mother, what are you doing over here? Is anything wrong, Elizabeth? Will, put down that paintbrush. Put it down? No, on second thought, keep it. You too, Homer. Now march, both of you. March? In which direction? In the direction of our garage. Listen, Mother, I'll come quietly. Only gee whiz, let go of my ear. Now march. Right, left, right. They're a miracle of goodness, a marvel of speed. Those sensational new Jell-O tapioca puddings. Newest members of the famous Jell-O pudding family. Try these delicious new desserts, and you'll find here's another reason why more people eat Jell-O puddings than any other prepared puddings in the world. There's luscious, light, and delicate Jell-O vanilla tapioca. There's rich, candy-good Jell-O chocolate tapioca. And newest of all, there's Jell-O orange coconut tapioca. 
tempting orange flavor with coconut added. A creamy, smooth treat of tropical goodness. All three Jell-O puddings are ready prepared, quick as a flash to fix, and nothing to go wrong. All you do is add the milk, then cook in an ordinary saucepan. And Jell-O puddings cook to perfection in just about five minutes. So remember, now you can get Jell-O vanilla tapioca, Jell-O chocolate tapioca, and newest of all, Jell-O orange coconut tapioca. Ask for Jell-O tapioca puddings. A miracle of goodness, a marvel of speed. And now, getting back to the troubles of Henry Aldridge. After having made plans to go on a picnic with Homer, Henry was led to believe that his father wanted to share his company today. But actually, Mr. Aldridge is anxious to get away fishing with Will Brown. As a result of their efforts to get away from each other, each has lost his partner. It's just after lunch, and the scene opens in the Aldridge living room. Henry? Yes, Father? Do you think you should be whittling in the living room? I'm being careful, Father. Besides, what else is there to do? You have a point there. It isn't that I'm not enjoying your company, Father. Oh, of course. It's grand having this day together. Sure. How, um, how's business? I had any interesting cases lately? Yes, but uh, they're rather complicated. You wouldn't understand. Oh. Uh, how's school? It's fine. It's all over. <laughs> The baseball team tied Abbott City last week? Yes, that's too bad. Too bad? I guess you didn't hear me, Father. They tied. Yes, It's but... the closest we've come to winning in two years. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that's fine. Gee, do I feel sorry for Mr. Brown and Homer painting their garage. They don't have any rights at all. Apparently not. Wouldn't you think on a nice day like this, Mr. Brown would let Homer go out in the woods if he wanted to? You certainly would. What was that you said about going out in the woods? That's what Homer and I planned on doing today. But I thought you wanted to stay around home. Well, it was you who wanted to do that. No, I want to go fishing. You do? Well, gee whiz, Father, why didn't you say so? I love fishing. Well, say, what are we sitting around here for? Let's go. Sure, boy, I'll go and get my pole. I'll dig some worms and then... Oh, Sam! Uh, Henry and I are going fishing, Alice. Today? Sure, sure. sure. and are we going to have fun? Sam, you must be joking. What do you mean? Well, my goodness, you certainly can't walk out and leave our backyard in the state it's in. What's the matter with it? Well, the garden half dug up, packages of seeds all over the place, and what's more important, the garage half painted. Alice, we'll paint the garage tomorrow. Why can't you go fishing tomorrow? Because the paper says it's going to rain. Well, dear, how can you paint the garage in the rain? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I'll answer the phone. You two stay right there. Father, why don't we stick up for our run? Hello? Alice, this is Elizabeth. Oh, hello, Elizabeth. I just called to tell you how nicely things are going. <laughs> Honestly, I'm so pleased. Really? I wish you could see what a good time Homer and Will are having. Well, what are they doing? They're painting the garage. I've been watching them from the window. Will's painting one side and Homer's painting the other, and I've never seen them so engrossed in anything. Well, isn't that nice? Sam and Henry painting your garage must have set a good example. Sam and Henry? Yes. How did you ever train them to be so helpful, Alice? What? Well, I believe in taking the bull by the horn. Yes. And and when I have a problem to face, I feel the only thing to do is, well, face it. Oh, that's so true, Alice. Oh, would you excuse me now, dear? Of course. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. <coughs> Sam! What is it, Alice? Please come here. Just take the bull by the horn. Yes, <laughs> Yes, I will. Now listen, Alice. Now listen, Sam. You listen to me. <laughs> Coming along, dear. Why, uh, fine, Mother. But don't bother coming over. Well, I just wanted to thought I'd come and see how you were getting along. Well, listen, Mother, you wouldn't. Homer Brown. I'm going to paint over. Do you mean to say you spent an entire hour playing tic-tac-toe with perfectly good paint? Not entirely. I painted the strip along the bottom. And what's this over here? What's what? This heart with Agnes Love's Homer printed inside. Oh, you should be ashamed of yourself, smearing a thing like that all over the garage. But, Mother, she said she didn't care if the whole world knew it. Where's your father? He's around the other side. Wait till he sees this. Will! But, Mother, I'm going to paint over it. Will! What do you want, Elizabeth? I want to tell you what your son's been doing. Look, Elizabeth, why don't you run along in the house? Since you apparently weren't interested enough to... Will Brown! Now, look, Elizabeth. May I ask whose artwork this is? Mine. Oh, 
<laughs> but don't get excited. I'm going to paint over them. What are they? Smallmouth bass. <laughs> this one here's a guppy. Oh, honestly, Will, I don't know what to say to you. Now, look, do I tell you how to do your housework? But, but these horrible fish, what will the neighbors think? I'll have them filled in before the neighbors even see them. Besides, it's nobody's business but my own. But, Will... If a man has to work, there's no law that says he can't enjoy himself, is there? All right, Will, go ahead and do it your way. But don't expect another meal in this house until that garage is painted properly. Don't worry, Elizabeth. Father... Yes, Homer? Father, can I have another can of paint? What happened to all the paint we had in the garage? We used it. You mean to say we haven't any more? I guess not. Say, those are pretty good submarines. Well, come on. We'd better get down to the paint store and get some. I'll say. Uh, what do you mean, submarine? <laughs> Henry, hold still. How can I? Well, lean back against the garage. But the turpentine's running down my face and it stings. Well, that's unfortunate, but I either have to scrub your head or cut your hair off. Now, take your choice. Scrub. All right. Hold still. Gee, what time is it? It's 2.30. It's no use, Henry. No matter how fast we paint, we won't get any fishing done today. Unless there was some way to speed things up. For example? Well... Look, did I tell you about that swell gadget I saw in Springer's Hardware? No, what is it? It's a paint sprayer. You take the fan belt off of your car, see, and attach the sprayer, and boy, you can paint a whole house in four hours. You can? Sure. What are you doing, Father? Taking the fan belt off. <laughs> then we'll walk down to Springer's and look at one of those things. Do you mean it, Father? Yeah, just hand me that wrench, please. Sure, and then I can go hunt up my fishing pole. <laughs> Yes, Alice. This is a little embarrassing, Elizabeth, but are Henry and Sam over there? No, they aren't. And neither are Will and Homer. You mean they've disappeared too? Well, that settles it. Settles what? I know very well where they've gone, Elizabeth. The whole four of them. Where? Fishing. Out at Fletcher's Pond. Alice, they wouldn't dare. They've been talking about it all day, and if I know anything about men, that's where they are. I can't believe it. What sort of condition is your garage in? You wouldn't believe it if I told you. Well, ours is the same. And do you know how I feel, Elizabeth? How? If we let them get away with this, we'll never be able to do another thing with them. I'll do whatever you say, Alice. You're so good at managing them. All right, I'll be right over with the car to pick you up. But where are we going? Out to Fletcher's Pond and take the bull by the horn. <laughs> in the house, Will. The only thing is I should be getting home. Only I don't dare. Oh, come on in for a few minutes. You can explain to Elizabeth how we ran into each other down at the hardware store. Yeah, but how am I going to explain that I can't find any of the right color paint? Well, just... Just stand up for your rights, Will. Tell her you'll finish painting the garage next week. Yes, but you haven't seen what I painted on the... Oh, well, I never liked our neighbors anyway. <laughs> Father, I've been all through the house and Mother seems to be out. She is? Sit down, Will. Why don't I make some lemonade and we'll all relax for a while? That'd be great. Henry, go make some lemonade. <laughs> oh, me? Father, you mean we don't have to go home? Not right away. Did Mother say so? I said so. You, Father? Gee, I sure wish they'd had one of those paint sprayers left. Henry, let's not talk about paint. Let's enjoy ourselves while we can. Say, Father. What? Didn't you leave your car in the driveway when we went down to the hardware store? Yes, of course. Well, look out the window. It's gone. Good heavens, you don't suppose your mother took it, do you? Sure, that's probably it. But I took the fan belt out. She won't get ten miles with it. Is that the phone? I'll answer it. How about that lemonade? Hello? And let me speak to Matt. Uh, Wait a minute. Who is that? Alice, is that you? Sam, hey, aren't you... Did you go... Are you at home? Of course I'm at home. Oh, my goodness. Where are you? I'm calling from a roadside stand out near Fletcher's Pond. You're where? And, dear, I don't know quite how to tell you, but there seems to be something wrong with the car. Oh, is that so? Alice, what did you do to it? I didn't do anything. 
Elizabeth and I were just driving along, and it got very hot inside, and then the whole thing started smoking. Now, look, Alice. Before you get angry, Sam, I give you my word, I didn't race the motor. And I know I put the emergency brake off before I started. I see. Well, we'll discuss that later. Yes, Sam. And, and do you think you and Will could come out and get us? Yes, I suppose we'll have to. But on our own terms, you understand. Yes, sir. All right, goodbye. Goodbye, dear, and thank you. Will, boys! Yes, Sam? Yes, Father? Collector tackle, everyone. We're going fishing. gratitude, Henry. That's gratitude for you. Now, listen, Homer. If you don't want to go over to Agnes's for dinner tomorrow, okay. Well, gee, Homer. Only I happen to know they're having jello butterscotch pudding for dessert. And I guess they'll be glad to have me eat your dish of it, too. Now, wait a minute, Homer. Yes, better change your mind in a hurry about that invitation, Henry, because you never tasted anything better than jello puddings. Jello chocolate, butterscotch, and vanilla puddings. A trio of treats. And that's why more people eat Jell-O puddings than any other prepared puddings in the world. Sure, Jell-O puddings are nourishing. Sure, they're luscious to look at. And sure, they're easy to fix. But first and foremost, Jell-O puddings taste so grand. Smooth as cream. Chuck full of old-fashioned homemade goodness. Jell-O puddings made with milk cook in just about five minutes. But above all, they're a treat to eat. That's Jell-O puddings. You never tasted anything better. <laughs> from our vacation on September 30th. Until then, a happy summer to all of you from all of us. Goodbye, folks, until September 30th. The only time we started this was stolen as Henry with Jackie Kelvin Homer is written by Patricia Jodry and Bell Dinsdale with music by Jack Miller. Mr. and Mrs. Aldrich are Howe Jameson and Catherine Ross. And this is Dwight Weiss in New York saying, The Aldrich Family was brought to you by Jell-O Pudding. Just a taste of Jell-O Puddings, and believe me, you won't know it They are made by famous J-E-L-L-O. Listen again Thursday, September 30th. Same time, same station, to another sparkling half hour with the Aldrich family. Remember the date, September 30th, and goodbye till then. Starting next week at the same time, listen to the Armed Services Review, starring Burgess Meredith, with Irving Berlin, Marlena Dietrich, and Herb Schreiner as guest stars. <laughs> Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal.
of the boys said you wanted to see me. Yeah. It better be important, mister. I don't make a habit of coming running with some saddle punk whistles. Maybe you hadn't ought to make a habit of calling people saddle punks. <laughs> no offense, just an expression. Sure. I came up from the Pecos country. Been here in Dodge about a week. Maybe you've seen me around. I've seen you. I've been talking to people. Oh? Everybody tells me you were a big shot back in Abilene. Had all the games sewed up, three or four saloons paying off, a couple of hotels and so on. Then the boom busted and you come here, and you got nowhere. Know why? You're talking, you tell me why. Dylan. Fella named Matt Dillon, a U.S. Marshal. You tried to scare him and he wouldn't scare. Tried to buy him and wouldn't buy. Tried breaking him, wouldn't break. So? Be worth $5,000 to you if I kill him? Might. All right, get it in gold. Keep it handy. My heart? Yeah, you're hired. <laughs> Chester, I know you've been sick and you still got a cold, but is there anything else wrong? What do you mean, Mr. Dillon? Well, you haven't said three words in the last 20 minutes. That's not like you. Well, Mr. Dillon... Did you ever get a funny feeling somebody was keeping an eye on you? Well, yeah, but... Uh... Well, I got one right now. <laughs> Chester, I think you got a touch of the heebie-jeebies. Maybe, but I tell you, I know there's Well, as somebody... far as I can see, there's nobody in the whole place even paying any attention to us. Somebody is. I had the same feeling the day the Butler brothers come back from Santa Fe. Yeah. I didn't even know they was in town, but I knew somebody was getting ready to call us. And about six that evening, they made their play, remember? Yeah, I remember. I was one of the pallbearers the next day. Well, it's the same thing now. There's going to be trouble, Mr. Dillon. You can bet on it. <laughs> I think you got the wind up over nothing, Chester. Why, the town's never been quieter. Jail's been empty for two weeks. Only new faces around is that bunch of trail drivers that came up from the Pecos. They're all strangers. None of them got any reason to hold a grudge. Oh, uh, there you be. What? I've been looking all over for you, Marshal. Oh, hiya, Billy. Waited over to the jail for nigh on to an hour. I got to talk to you, Mr. Dillon. Uh, I I'm sorry, Billy, but every time I give you money, you, you buy yourself a bottle and then oh, stay blind drunk uh, for two uh, days. Uh, it ain't money this time, Mr. Dillon. I got something to tell you. Oh? What? Something I hear. These couple fellers talking over to the liver stable. They didn't see me. I was back at the water trough. <clears throat> sort of, well, resting, you might say. Yeah, I know. Well, well, you know how it is, Mr. Dillon. The man gets dry in this prairie country and he just... What were they came. talking about, Billy? <clears throat> about you. One of them offered to kill you for $5,000 in gold. And the other one took him up on it. There, what did I tell you? Who were they, Billy? Did you know them? No, sir. It was dark, and I didn't recognize their voices. They was already there when I woke up, and they left right after that. Well, maybe they... Maybe it was just some kind of a joke. Oh, it didn't sound that way to me. No, sir, it's no joke, Mr. Dillon. I told you I felt it. There's somebody in this room right now, somebody who's been hired to kill you. Yeah, but who? I don't know. <laughs> figure who'd want to do such a thing, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I can figure a dozen or two, Chester. Well, if... Chester, if was... look, as far as Dodge City is concerned, I'm the law. Now, there are plenty of men here who'd think they'd do better without any law. I guess there's nothing personal. Well, personal or not, it's got me jumping sideways at my own shadow. Ah, here we are. Come on. Well, morning, Marshal. 
Haven't seen you since the robbery last month. Attempted robbery, Mr. Greeley. Yeah, so it was, thanks to you. Well, Mr. Dillon, the bank's at your service. What can I do for you? Give me some information, if you will. Well, if it isn't confidential... It is, but I want it anyway. Well, I hardly know what to say. Perhaps you'd better step into my office. This way, gentlemen. Thank you. After you, Mr. Greeley. Now, just what was it you wanted to know? I want to know whether one of your customers has drawn $5,000 in gold from the bank in the last few days. Any particular person in mind? No, that's what I want to find out. Well, I hope this won't go any farther, Marshal. So somebody did, huh? Who was it, Mr. Greeley? I certainly wish to make it clear that I don't approve of this man, but after all, he is a good customer. And it's not my place Yeah, yeah, to... I know. Who was it? Lawson Hale. Lawson Hale? Yeah, he took the gold out just this morning, as a matter of fact. Said he was working on a cattle deal of some sort. Yeah, figures all right. Hale's tried to move in on this town ever since he came here. Every time he's tried, I've stopped him. I do hope you'll regard this as confidential. As yeah, you sure, sure. Well, Chester, we know who one of them is now. Yeah, but who's the other, Mr. Dillon? The one who's actually going to do it? Some punk who wants $5,000 real bad and doesn't care how much he has to do to get it? That sure doesn't narrow it down any. Yeah, I know. Sure quiet tonight, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Not many people out. No, not many. The moon is throwing quite a bit of light. Yeah, I guess it is. Kindly makes a target out of a man. Yeah, kind of. If somebody was out to shoot somebody, this would sure be a good night for somebody to do it. I suppose so. Mr. Dillon. Hmm? Do you mind if I make a comment? Well, I thought that's what you were doing, Chester. Let's go on back to the jail and stay off the streets. This way you're just asking for it. Chester, if it's going to come, it's going to come. I'd rather meet it halfway than to sit and wait for it. Asking for it? Asking for it? That's what you're doing. It's been two days now. It gets on your nerves. When you go out to bring a man in, you know you may have trouble and you're ready for it. But, but this way, and not knowing who or when or where. Or... Yes, right. Well, I understand, I... Mr. Dillon. It, it, it kindly bothers a man. Yeah. Let's walk down the Texas Trail. <laughs> Good to see you, Matt. You've been avoiding us the last couple of days. <laughs> Busy, Kitty. Something bothering you, Matt? Bothering me? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever gave you an idea like that? Mr. Dillon. What is it, Chester? Lawson Hale just come in. He's down the bar there. Oh, yeah. Maybe you ought to have a talk with him. Well, that's one way. That's the one I haven't tried yet. Excuse us, will you please, Kitty? Well, sure, Matt. Whatever it is, be careful. Yeah. Aveline was wide open. Yeah. I had it right in the bottom of my hand. Is that so? The minute a trail driver hit town, the boys would grab their pay and they'd head yeah, straight. Yeah, well, well. Something I can do for you? Yeah, I want to talk to you, Mr. Hale. Well, I don't see anything stopping you. <laughs> well, we'll move down the bar a ways, if you don't mind. It's kind of private. Sorry, Marshal. I'm fine right here. I said we'll move down the bar. <laughs> if it's that important. Pardon me, boys. The Marshal's all head up about it. Oh, sure. <laughs> far enough? Yeah, this is far enough. Lawson, I understand you've hired yourself a gunman. 
Sent him out to get me. Offered him $5,000 in gold. I don't know what you're talking about, Dylan. Wouldn't care to tell me his name. No, I don't think so. You see, I don't know anything about it. What's he waiting for? He's had two days now, and he hasn't made a move. Like I said, Dylan... Why don't you I... do the job, Hale? You're wearing a gun. Maybe save yourself some money. I've got no quarrel with you. You mean you're yellow? Scared to call your own play. I said I've You're got a no... weaseling, no-good coward, Hale. I let it ride for the time being. Yeah, I thought you would. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. Let's go get some fresh air. Well, I guess he's just not the kind to take chances, Mr. Dillon. And not when he's got a hired killer out prowling somewhere. Chester, I'm going to run him out of Dodge if it's the last thing I ever do. Dodge can stand it. If I only knew who he'd hired, then I could force the play myself. This blasted business of having to leave it up to the other man. Waiting, waiting. Near the... Over there by the stable. Yeah, I saw the flash. Maybe you got it, Mr. Dillon. I don't know. Let's move in and find out. Yes, sir. Watch yourself, Chester. You may be playing possum. Yes, sir. The flash was right here by the corner. Yeah. Well, that's that. Looks like you got away, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's gone. Took one shot and then ran for cover. He'll be back. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Sunday afternoon, Robert Trout with the World News brings you up to the minute on CBS Radio. A special feature on this program every Sunday is a flying visit from one of our noted overseas news correspondents. Remember, tomorrow, for well-rounded views of the news at home and everywhere, don't miss Robert Trout with the news of the world on most of these same CBS radio stations. And now for the second act of Gunsmoke. My cold sure no better tonight, Mr. Dillon. My, that fire sure feels good. Yeah. Yes, sir, the old jail seems kind of cozy when a man's ailing like I am. Anyway, it's sure a lot better than prowling those streets waiting for somebody to put a bullet in the back of your neck. Yes, sir. Will you stop squeaking the chair? Well, sorry, Mr. Dillon. He yelled at me like that, Junior, as I'm feeling. Two more days gone by and he hasn't made another move. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. That cottonwood sure burns up fast. I guess I better shake down the stove, throw another chunk of wood. Wait a minute. Huh? Wait a minute. There might be a way at that, Chester. Loss and hail. That's the only fact we're sure of. Loss and hail. It'd be kind of hard to prove anything, Mr. Dillon. Who said anything about proving it? I got an idea. Come on. Which one will we try first, Mr. Dillon? Uh, the Texas Trail, I guess. He'll either be there or at the Longhorn. All right, Mr. Dillon. What you gonna do? 
Gonna arrest him. Since he won't fight. We saw him back down the other night. Yes, but you got no evidence. M- Mr. Dillon, you can't make it stick. I don't intend to, Chester. Well, then I don't see what... What I can do is scare him. And if I figure him right, I think he's gonna scare easy. Hmm. Maybe so, but all the ah, same... Ah, look. Look, there he is, Chester. Just came out of the Longhorn. A couple of fellows with him, Mr. Dillon. You, you don't suppose one of them could be... No, nah. no, they're hanging around for the free drinks. There's not an ounce of nerve in the three dozen of them. Come on, let's take him. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're right. The whole herd. The whole herd. <laughs> Hale? Yeah? Hold it just right where you are. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble now, Marshal? No trouble. Unless you want to make some. You're under arrest. What for? I'll think of something later. Stick out your hands. Whoa, Taking me in without even making a charge? I'll remind you there's witnesses here. Yeah, so I notice. When they're not hanging around you, they're around somebody else. What have you done, Hale? Hired them, too? I asked you what the charge was, Marshal. Vagrancy. Vagrancy? As far as I know, you've never had any visible means of support as long as you've been a Dodge. I'll match any dollar of yours with a hundred better ones. Well, that's fine. That'll help pass the time. Now stick out your hands. Oh, look here, Marshal. Shut if you up. think you... All right, Chester, put the cuffs on him. Yes, sir. All right, hold still now. Dillon, up. I'll break you for this. It's been tried before. All right, boys, break it up. The party's over. You've had your last free drink out of this pump. All right, you, let's go to jail. Keep walking, Hale. It's the last cell on the left. I'll break you, Dylan. So help me. Well, you've been trying it for a year. I'm still around. But you won't be after this. I'll take this up. And Hold help. up. Wait till Chester gets the door unlocked. Haven't used this cell for so long. I've almost forgot which keys is. There we are. Vacancy. I'm living in the best room in the commercial house. Inside, Hale. Now go on, move. No. Now stick your hands up. You won't need those cuffs in here. All right. Make yourself at home. Shut the door, Chester. Yes, sir. Dylan, you've got nothing to hold me on. I'll be out of here by tomorrow noon. Oh, I doubt that. In fact, there's a pretty good chance you'll never get out of that cell. Not alive, at least. What are you talking about? According to the law, I've got a right. The law, huh? You've broken it every chance you've got. Tried to break the men who serve it, like you've tried to do with me, for instance. But when your own neck gets caught, you start hiding behind the law. Nevertheless, the law... All right, law. fine. Right now, the law out here is kind of sketchy. Some things it covers, some things it doesn't. Well, that's where I come in. Now, this little affair between you and me is one of the things the law doesn't quite cover. So I'm going to run it my way. That kind of talk won't help you any, Dylan. You hired a man to kill me. Offered him $5,000 to get me out of the way. You can't prove that. He's made one try and he's missed. He's still around Dodge. Somewhere waiting and he's going to try again. But I don't know who he is. So all the odds are with him. That is your problem, Dylan, not mine. I don't know anything about that. You know what'll happen, though, if he does get me. The first thing Chester's going to do is come straight back here to the jail and pump a couple of bullets through these bars here. Huh? Your boy may kill me, Hale, but you're not going to live to profit by it. Oh, he wouldn't do it. Shoot down a helpless... Pr- oh, neither one of you would do it. Chester and I have been friends for a long time. Why don't you ask him whether he'd do it or not? No question about it, Mr. Dillon. Of course I'd do it. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Well, you hired somebody to shoot Mr. Dillon in the back. I don't see where you got any kick coming. Well, there's your answer, Mr. Hale. That's why I arrested you. Come on, Chester. Let's go look the town over. Well, no, no, it's, it's tonight that he's going... 
Who's going to do what? I don't know, Marshal. I don't know anything about it. Now, that's too bad. If I knew his name, I'd have a lot better chance, you know. So would you. Well, we'll see you later, Hale. Or anyway, Chester will. No, Dylan, you can't do it. You, no, go, don't go out. He'll get you short. Dylan, no, wait. I, I'll tell you his name. All right. He's uh, a trail driver. He came up from the Pecos last week. I doubt if you know him. His name is Ed Granger. Ed Granger? Yeah, I've seen him around the bars. Dark-haired, surly-looking, scar across his cheek. That's him. Of course, I'll deny all of this in court, you understand? Yeah, sure, I understand. Come on, Chester, let's go get him. Look, he's here all right, Mr. Dillon. Over there by the pine. Yeah, looks like he's by himself. What you gonna do? Rest him? Well, there's no evidence, Chester. The only way I see is to make it personal. Let's go. Yes, sir. Now, I want you to stay out of it, Chester. Just cover me, that's all. Whatever you say, Mr. Dillon. Your name Ed Granger? Might be. What about it? You know who I am, don't you? Judging by the star, I reckon you're a U.S. Marshal. You ought to do better than that. After all, I'm worth $5,000 to you. Yes, yeah, sure. Who says so? Lawson Hale. What? Your memory's getting better, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Mark. Sure you do. That deal you made with Hale. He told me all about it after I threw him in jail and persuaded him a little bit. Well, I told you, I don't know anything... You're about... wearing a gun there, Granger. Why don't you draw it and go for $5,000? Take a chance. This fellow you're talking about's in jail. I reckon he wouldn't have anybody working for him now, would he? You tell me. I got no reason to draw on you, Marsh. Not unless my back's turned, huh? I think you're as yellow as Hale is. This won't do you any good. I ain't drawing. You tried to kill me night before last, Granger. Can you prove that? If I could, you'd either be in jail or you'd be dead. Well, since you can't prove it, what's the argument? Just that I don't like the idea of somebody trying to shoot me in the back... If you're any man at all, we'll settle this here and now. Now, leave me alone, Marshal. I haven't done any... <gasps> now, you still figure you got no reason to draw on me? No reason. I ain't drawing. You got ten minutes to get out of town. And when you're out, stay out. Don't come back now or ever. You understand Yes, sir. You can start right now. Must be nearly midnight, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, about that, I guess, Chester. My... This is sure one day I'm glad is over. <laughs> yeah, so am I. At least I can breathe a little easier now. Mm -hmm. I think I'll get this fire built up a little bit, Mr. Dillon. No, le leave it, Chester. Let's go take care of our prisoner first. Huh? Hey, we still haven't got any evidence. What are we going to do about him? Same as with Granger. Turn him loose and run him out of town. We should have done it months ago. You got the keys? Yes, sir. Right here, Mom. Mr. Dillon? Huh? What are you looking at? Uh, 
stranger must have stopped by here on his way out of town. He he must have got Hale over at the window for a talk and then grabbed him and cut his throat right there. Yeah. Figured Hale had sold him out, I guess. Got a bulletin on the wire, Chester. Wanted for murder, Ed Granger. All right, sir, Mr. Dillon. I guess Hale got pretty much what he bargained for. He hired himself a killer in order to kill him. He got it. Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character originally created in the motion picture The Third Man with zither music by Anton Karras. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man. Yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. Harry Lyme had many lives. And I can recount all of them. How do I know? It's very simple. Because my name is Harry Lyme. Don't get me wrong, I love Budapest. From Budapest come goulashes and shardashes. Shardashes being something you dance and goulash being something you eat if you go for all that paprika. Me, I love it. So, when I got that telegram, I took the first train to Hungary. Maybe I'd better tell you about the telegram first. Dear Mr. Lyme, it said, my bank is going to be robbed and I need your help. It was signed Fekety, evidently a man's name, nobody I knew. I knew all about bank robberies, however, and I was dying to help. Besides, as I say, I love paprika. So I started packing right away. Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, Too Many Crooks. Before calling at the bank, I stopped at a cute little flower shop I happened to notice across the way. Uh, good morning. Uh, would you give me something for my buttonhole? Well, Lily. Lily, what are you doing here? We have some very pretty pink gardenias. Oh, come on, Lily, don't tell me you don't remember me. And how are all the Corellis? The who? Huh? Don't give me that, Lily. My name is Lulu. Well, it used to be Lily, and you used to be a blonde. And the Corellis, as you know perfectly well, because you used to work for them, are the best bank robbers in Central Europe. Well, what about it, honey? Here are your gardenias, Harry. Now get out of here. Okay, honey, okay. No need to get in a hassle. I'm telling you, Harry, get out. I never was one to argue, so I took my gardenias across the street and the bank. Mr. Fekety will see Mr. Harry Lyme. You can go in now, Mr. Lyme. Oh, thank you. Mr. Fekety will see you. Yes, that's what I gathered. Uh, this way, please. And thank you. Oh, Mr. Lyme, yes. will you please extinguish your cigarette? Mr. Fekety does not approve of smoking. Thanks. I'll bear that in mind. Mr. Lyme. Come in. Come in and shut the door. There's a date. 
Do you mind if I sit down, Mr. Fackety, or is there a rule against that? Sit down, sit down. You're a very impertinent young man, but I don't mind that. I am an impertinent older man. We ought to get along together very nicely. What's your proposition, Mr. Fackety? Yeah. What do you mean? Just what I said. What's your proposition? Uh, listen to me, Lime. I don't make propositions. I consider them. Have it your own way, Fegarty. I'm a big boy now, and I'm not so easily impressed. Uh, what do you mean, impressed? All this big desk, double secretary, Mr. Fegarty will see you now. Mr. Fegarty doesn't approve of smoking, busy executive hoopla. May go down very well with the bumpkins who give you their money to invest. It doesn't mean a thing to me. You sent for me, didn't you? I crossed three national borders to get here and lost a lot of time, so don't ask me what's my proposition. <laughs> what's yours, Mr. Fackety? <laughs> very good, very good indeed. You're just the man I hoped you were. <laughs> Have a cigar. Wouldn't that be breaking the rules? I make the rules, Mr. Lamb, and I don't like cheap tobacco smoke. Now, do I enjoy being forced to distribute these very costly custom-made Havanas to every, or what is it you call them, bumpkin, who comes into my office? I think you'll enjoy these. Thanks. Light? Thanks. Good. Now that we're a little more at ease, uh, suppose you tell me something about yourself. Why? What do you mean, why? I wish you'd stop asking me what I mean by everything I say, Faculty. I said why, and I meant why. You put private detectives on my trail, you found me. You made me a very substantial down payment on services to be rendered. And now, when I get here, you want me to tell you about myself. That's just plain silly, old man. It's obvious that if you went to all that trouble and expense to get me here, you knew about me already. I'm the one to ask the questions, <laughs> not you. <laughs> better and better. Mr. Lime, if you were just a little less notorious as a cook, I'd offer you a vice presidency in my bank. I forgive the insult, Mr. Fegarty. Uh, what do you mean, insult? There you go asking me what I mean again. I meant insult. Now, don't you get pompous on me, Lime. You are a crook, a well-famous one. You don't want to deny that. What I don't want is very simple, Mr. Fegarty. I don't want to be a vice president of your bank. Oh? Oh, 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 oh I follow you now. <laughs> don't worry, Lime. Right. I promised you $20,000. That's right. Or it's equivalent to Hungarian pencils. Oh, wait a minute. And you'll get it without having to serve as an officer of this You bank. promised me $20,000, old man. There weren't any gimmicks in the agreement about the joke money you folks pass off on each other locally. I know. I carry my own microscope for reading the fine type. Very well, very well. $20,000 it is. Uh, <clears throat> Don't you want to know what I expect you to do for Mr. it? Mr. Fekete, you keep making me repeat myself. I told you before that I'm a big boy now. If you're giving me 20,000 bucks, I can relax, not worry about asking you silly questions. You're going to get around eventually to telling me what you expect me to do for it. Hmm. Uh, did you ever hear of a bank giving a reward? Yes, but only after a bank robbery. Exactly. Uh. Exactly. Only after a bank has been robbed. I'm reversing the procedure line. I'm giving the reward first. Oh, so that's the little caper, is it? You want me to rob your bank for you? Well, not at all, not at all. A reward is usually given for apprehending the thieves who have robbed the bank. What I want you to do, Harry, uh, I may call you Harry? Maybe? Certainly, old man, call me Harry if it gives you any fun. Well, Harry, what I want you to do is to apprehend the robbers before the robbery is committed. <laughs> Very clever, don't you think so? Uh, have another cigar. <laughs> my business, I may get in the way of an awful lot of screwy deals, but I can tell you that never in a long career have I been offered in complete seriousness a loopier proposition than Mr. Feckett is. It seems the key to the whole affair was Mr. Feckett, his junior officer in the bank, a certain Mr. Fodor. Lordis Lost Fodor is the full name, Harry. Hmm. He's one of our vice presidents. I see. And I tell you this right now, the man is an unprincipled criminal. Oh? And come here and I'll show him to you. Come this way. You can see him through the glass pan. Oh, yes. There he is. Oh, that one? Second desk to the right. Uh, with all those silly hairs pasted over his bald head. <laughs> That's the man. He was not very dangerous to me. Fodor? Dangerous? He is the brain of a backward bird and the charm of a worm. Now that I look back on it, I can't imagine how I ever persuaded myself to be jealous of Jealous? I don't follow you, old man. If I have a fault, Harry, it is this. I do tend to be jealous. Lulu often chides me about it, and I have promised to curb the instinct, but there... There's a part of my case. Lulu, you mean the girl in the flower shop across the way, that Lulu? She's the only Lulu I know, Mr. Lyon. How does it happen that you are acquainted with her? You see this carnation? I see it, yes. Lulu sold it to me, overcharged me, scandalously, as a matter of fact. Poor Lulu is a working girl, she must live. How does it happen you know her? What makes you think I do? You know her name? Oh, one of the other customers called her that while I was still in the shop. As it happens, it was this little fellow you've just pointed out to me over there, the vice president, uh, Fodor. Dad, vice president. I hate to keep harping on these commercial matters, faculty old man, but just how does my $20,000 reward come into the picture? Uh, let us retire to my inner office, Harry, and I will tell you. Okay, come. old man. Uh, sit down, please, Harry. Have another cigar. My pockets are bulging with cigars now, old man. Let's concentrate on the 20000 Certainly, certainly. Oh, Miss Carver, Miss Carver, 
Yes, Mr. Feckative? Uh, no matter who calls, don't disturb me. Not on any account. I'm having an important conference. Yes, Mr. Feckative. Oh, jealousy, Harry. Jealousy is a terrible yes, thing. Yes, yes, certainly is. Now about this reward. Uh... Jealousy is the green-eyed monster who doth mock the meat it feeds on. That's how the poet Shakespeare expresses yeah, the it. The poet Harry. Shakespeare said a mouthful. And now... But still, if it had not been for jealousy, I would never have followed this photo into Lulu's shop. And if I hadn't done that, I would never have discovered the digging. Digging? What digging? What would you say, Harry, if I were to tell you that running under the street from Lulu's flower shop to this bank, there is a tunnel? A tunnel? What would you say if I told you that? Well, eh? I'd say, well, 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 what do you know? That's what I'd say. That's what I said when I found out about it. And that's why I say now that I mustn't ever forget to be grateful to jealousy. Particularly since I've discovered that there's nothing between Lolo and Voto. Or nothing serious. And uh, do you know what I'd say to that? No. A couple of rude words. Yeah, but why? Why? You find him scrabbling away together like a couple of chubby moles, digging away in the general direction of your bank vault, and you say there's nothing serious between them? There isn't. I'm sure of that. I have Lulu's well. And besides, what could she possibly see in a fat little identity like Fodor? No, the only one who thinks it's serious is Fodor. And that's the whole point. Fodor is a dupe. A mere cat's point in the conspiracy. Oh, yes. And who's the mastermind? I am. Uh-huh. And what does Fodor think about that? He languishes in ignorance. He knows nothing. And to think that he aspires, he dares to aspire to my position in the bank. And how does Lulu fit in? I must tell you that Lulu has given me some reason to hope that she will someday make me the happiest man in the world. And how would she do that? By giving up Fodor or sending you a big bouquet of roses? Let's get down to cases, old man. Wedding bells can ring out from Buddha to Pest and back again, but I won't be there to throw any rice unless I get paid. What is it exactly you want from me? Lessons on how to help Fodor and Lulu rob your bank? Fodor's going to do with the robbing. And besides, it isn't my bank. I'm only a salary officer. And then Fodor gives you the money to give to Lulu. Is Certainly that not. it? Certainly not. That would be silly. Uh, that's just what I was thinking. No, no. Every day, Fodor is supposed to take the paper money from the various cages and place it in the vault. Yeah. This is his responsibility. Yeah. Tonight, however, he will not do this. He will leave the money outside the vault, hidden in a large filing cabinet. Oh, yeah. Oh, the entire plan has been carefully worked out, I can assure you. All I can say is this folder of yours is a very cooperative type of cat's boy. Don't man. call him this folder of yours. He isn't. He's no folder of mine. Have it your own way, old man. What comes next? You, I suppose. Hmm? You come a half hour later with a dark lantern and a gunny sack. You wrap up the money, join Lulu, who's been waiting for you across the street in the flower shop, and the two of you, hand in hand, move off down the road into the sunrise and also into the very choicest Hungarian huska. Hmm? What is a huska? A jail or prison, a place of forcible incarceration, a lock up for bad little bank robbers. Not at all, not at all. It is Fodor who goes to prison. Oh, yes, and how do you work that? That is one of the things I want you to arrange. Oh, I see. I'm going to have to earn that 20000 I think we'll start by having it deposited in my name and in somebody else's bank, old man. Why now? And why another bank? Well, every bank in Budapest isn't going to be robbed tonight, so I think I'd prefer one of the others. And I'll take it now because I know you wouldn't want me to go to the police with what is, after all, a fairly sordid little story. Go to the police, but that's blackmail. Oh, watch your language, old man. Blackmail's a nasty word. You know, all I want is protection for my poor little 20000 I'll give you service for it, too, but I want to be absolutely positive that you're ready to meet your payroll. Very well. You'll have your money, but you will help me. I'm going to need a few more solid facts, old man. Well, it all began with this insane jealousy of mine for four Oh, yeah? I took to following him. He used to go into Lulu's flower shop at night long after it was closed. And one time he left the shutter unfastened and I went in. There were no lights in the shop itself, but I could hear voices from the basement below. I opened the trap door very carefully so as not to be hurt. And what do you think I saw? You saw Lulu, Fodor, and three men all hard at work digging a tunnel. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. How did you know? I didn't, I guess. After all, you told me there was a tunnel. But the three men, how did you know about them? Uh, still guessing. It's pretty obvious that Mr. Fodor and Lulu couldn't dig much of a hole without getting some help. Tell me this. It was Lulu who persuaded you to call me in on this deal, wasn't it? How did you know that? Still just guessing, old man, just guessing. Now, let me guess on for a minute and stop me when I'm wrong. When you saw what Lulu and Fodor were doing... You went home and brooded for a while, and a few days afterwards, you confronted her. It was the next day. Okay, it was the next day. And Lulu admitted she was planning to rob the bank, but said she was just using Fodor, and you were the only one she really cared about. And if you joined the party, it's you she'd run off with leaving Mr. Fodor holding the bag. Uh, an empty bag. How am I doing? Oh, you are a clever man. Sure I am. That's why Lulu had you sent for me. You see, the idea is that Fodor will hide the money outside the vault and leave. Then, according to the arrangement, as he understands it, Lulu will come through the tunnel at night with her helpers and take the money back under the street through the tunnel. Uh, who did she tell Fodor these helpers were? She said one of them is her brother and the other two are cousins. And what did she tell you? That's what she told me. Uh, why? Nothing, nothing, old man. I don't know. Just, 
Give me one more guess, hmm? Oh, go ahead. After Foda leaves the money, what you do is crawl back through the tunnel with a sack of currency clenched in your teeth. But no, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? You'd run into a couple of brothers crawling in the opposite direction. Uh, I, I'm not to have anything to do with the tunnel. Oh. You see, Foda leaves the money out just before closing time. That way, he's implicated, and we have a scapegoat. So there's nothing to stop me from letting myself in with my key at night and walking away with the money. Who could suspect me? It's a perfect crime, Harry. Would you say so? Yes, yes, it's quite a crime if you look at it in one way. Uh, but tell me about the brothers. What are they supposed to think about all this? Oh, they don't know about it. Lulu hasn't told them. But the news will reach them eventually. And what then? They must be implicated somehow, along with Photo. But I must be protected. I'm Lulu. That's what you're here for, Harry. Have another cigar. Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man. And now, Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with today's story, Too Many Crooks. Naturally, the first thing I did after making my farewells to Mr. Feckety was to go across the street and pay a call on Lulu. Harry, yeah? listen to me carefully. I'm listening, honey. There's a little cafe on the hill above the old city. Do you know the place? Mm -hmm. There's a gold roost on the roof. Well, what about it? Go there and wait for me. You never can tell when Fodor Feckety will be bursting in here. They keep jumping across the street to check up on each other and buying geraniums. <laughs> Go to the cafe and I'll be with you as soon as I can close well, up what, here. What about the boys below? Oh, what do you mean? The construction crew, the Corellis. Oh, um, Feckety told you about the Corellis? I would have found out anyway, Lily. Lulu. Okay, what happens to them if you shut up the store? Isn't there a way out? No, but they won't be finished work before I'm back. And besides, what they don't know won't hurt them. Lily, or rather Lulu, it looks to me as though just about everybody around here is due to be hurt by what they don't know. I found the gold rooster and sat down on the terrace of the restaurant to wait for Mr. Feckety's fiancée. Over a glass of tokai, I tried to add up the situation as of then. As far as I could see, the whole setup was like a Picasso painting. No matter how you looked at it, it was cockeyed and upside down. Hello, Harry. Don't order anything for right. me. I haven't time. Don't worry, Lily. I'm not here to celebrate. We can have our party after I know who's going to pay the check. I wish you'd call me Lulu. Okay, Lulu. Now, here's all the sense I can make out of this little caper. You came here with a Corelli no, gang, right? No, they came first. Oh. Then they sent for me to work in the flower shop for a front. The tunnel was their idea. Then you sent for me. That was your You're idea. You're right. Hmm? That photo thinks he's going to divvy up with the Corellis and marry you on mm, the proceeds. Something like that. And Feckety thinks something like the same something. The president thinks he's going to put it over the vice president. What about the construction crew? You mean Walter and yes, the others? the Pirellis, the original burglars. What are they going to get out of this? According to Feckety, it's going to be the old double cross. But if I know you, Feckety's in for the same gentle treatment. Harry, why should anybody get anything out of this except... Okay, Harry, okay. Book a couple of spaces for us on the first milk train out of Budapest. But be sure to get reservations on the bulletproof car. I wish you'd call me Lulu. <laughs> A lot of trusting Hungarian depositors line up at the bank, leave their hard-earned pengos at the impressive-looking gilt cages for what they fondly believe is safekeeping, and hurry home to have their evening plate of goulash. Closing time comes and goes. Feckety doesn't leave. He just pretends to and stays skulking in his office. Meanwhile, Fodor takes the big packages of pengos, which, as you know, is Hungarian for money, Dutifully to the door of the vault. He slams the vault loudly. This being for the benefit of the janitor, who is deaf anyway and doesn't hear, and quickly stows the loot in the empty filing cabinet which he has thoughtfully left nearby for just this purpose. He then goes home and passes a very restless night. The moon rises over the city and winks at its own reflection in the Danube. A lot of good Hungarians are in their beds. The others are all in a nightclub called the Arizona, dancing the Shardash. They do not come into this story, so we'll leave them dancing. Down onto the street, the Corellis, those adept bank robbers, continue to dig. They are putting the finishing touches on their tunnel, and we will not listen in on them because their conversation is very vulgar indeed. <laughs> 
in his luxurious office, Mr. Feckety sits biting his nails and dreaming of a long West Indian cruise with Lulu in an adjoining deck chair. As the gang in the tunnel understand it, when the clock strikes 12, they are to open the secret trap door which they have previously prepared inside the bank, a section of tiling near the vault, go to the filing cabinet and take out the money which Porter has left there, thus eliminating the noise and inconvenience of breaking into the vault and, first closing the loose tile after themselves, scuttle back with the loot under the street into the flower shop, out into the night and as far away from Hungary as possible. As I say, that's the way the gang in the tunnel understand it. This is also the arrangement as Mr. Fodor understands it, with a trifling difference that he expects Lulu to stop by for him with his share of the profits. Like Mr. Feckety, he is biting his nails and dreaming of tropical cruises. And what of Lulu? Uh-huh, what of Lulu indeed? It is Lulu's little plan to foozle everybody, Corelli, Fodor, and Feckety. She's led them all on to just this point. It is the point of departure. Lulu's departure. Lulu and all those neatly wrapped packages of pingos. The trouble is, it's all just a little bit too much for one little girl to handle alone, so Harry Lyme's been sent for. Harry is supposed to assist at the general foozling of one and all, and then, in due time, of course, he's to be foozled as well. Lulu will send Harry off to mail a postcard, and when he gets back, Lulu will have continued her travels alone, with nothing to keep her company but the loot. That, as I say, is the way Lulu understands it. The clock, high in the steeple of San Stefano, strikes twelve. This is the signal. Mr. Corelli, that celebrated expert with his two able assistants, starts toward the bank. The tunnel was not built for comfort, and the going on hands and feet is a trifle rough. There's a bit of genteel cursing, but hearts are high. At the sound of the clock, Mr. Feckety removes the bound bundles of money from their place of safety and checks once again the bolts and fastenings which keep the loose tile in its place. In the darkness, Mr. Feckety smiles. He is satisfied that, contrary to the Corelli's expectations, the bank end of the tunnel is firmly and irrevocably closed. Still smiling, he starts toting the money toward the side door for which he, Mr. Feckety, is the perfectly legal possessor of a key. On the outside, Lulu, with a high-speed car, is supposed to be waiting for him. Unfortunately, however, a moment earlier, Harry Lyme, on the flower shop end of the tunnel, has persuaded Lulu to go down for a moment and tell the boys not to try lifting that trick tile for at least a half hour. Lulu hates herself now for not having analyzed the merits of this suggestion. She has plenty of time now to think this over because foxy old Harry in the flower shop has bolted down the trap door. The clock has stopped striking, of course, and Mr. Feckety pops out of his bank looking for all the world like a jolly Christmas shopper with his arms loaded with bundles. There is a high-speed car waiting for Mr. Feckety, all right, but it is full of strange gentlemen, and they are all dressed in uniforms. Put up your hands, Feckety. Uh, Put up your hands. You're under arrest. But, but there's some mistake. Oh, not at all, old man. No mistake at all. You see, gentlemen, just as you were told, there he is. And there's the money. Come along now, Feckety. We are taking you in. You, Harry. A police informer. Not a bit of it, old man. I wouldn't dream of telling on you. No, the cops got the tip off from an anonymous letter. And you know how you spell anonymous? L-U-L-U. Lulu. She did it. Lulu. Lulu. That wouldn't be Lulu Hartz, would it? Uh, alias Lily the Twister. Yes, officer, I believe so. There's a reward offered for her capture, isn't there? Huh? I should say there is. What about the Corelli gang? They've got the biggest price on their heads in Central Europe. Oh, that's lovely. It's all beginning to add up when you throw in the generous reward Mr. Feckety posted in the name of his bank this afternoon. Uh, but you're not going to collect that, are Why you? not, old man? After all, you put up the money for me to collect before the bank was robbed, didn't you? You also wanted me to thwart the Corellis, and if you yourself are foolish enough to go breaking the law, you'll just have to tell it to the judge. I'll tell him plenty. I'll tell him about you. Go ahead. I haven't broken any laws, remember, and you'll only help me collect my various rewards. As a matter of fact, Lyme, just what is your connection with this affair? What have you done? Officer, all I did was turn a bolt on a trap door. Nothing at all, really. Just a twist to the wrist. And now, if you've got some spare handcuffs ready, I think we'd better open it up again. The folks down below may be getting a little fretful, and I think they'll appreciate a change of scene. If you'll come with me, officer, I'll show you the place. Really, Mr. Lyme, I can't tell you how grateful. Please, please, old man, don't mention it. Pleasure, I assure you. Won't you have a cigar? Harry 
Time returns in just a moment. You know, friends, I had thought of substituting those fat packages of pengos for the same weight of old newspapers. But the rate of exchange wasn't so good on the pengo just then, so I resisted the temptation. After all, as Mother always said, too many crooks spoil the goulash. It's time for My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball. Hello, everybody. Yes, it's the new Gay Family series, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning. Brought to you by the Jell-O family of desserts. J-E-L-L-O. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O puddings. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O cap. Fioca puddings. Yes, sir. And now Lucille Ball with Richard Denning as Liz and George Cooper. Two people who live together and like it. <laughs> Every day in each American home, an old native custom takes place. An ancient tribal ritual called waking up in the morning. Now, everyone has his own interpretation of how this should be done. For instance, at the Coopers, George opens his eyes, bounds out of bed, flexes his muscles and says, Oh, I'm glad I'm alive. And Liz, not to be outdone, opens one eye, looks around and says, I wish I was dead. And then the daily ritual settles down to serious business as George Cooper is faced with the problem of getting Sleeping Beauty out of bed. Come on, Liz. It's time to get up. Yeah, yeah, I am. Just one more. Um... (laughs) Come on now. Katie's getting breakfast. It's quarter to eight. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, dear. All right. Mm. Well, why don't you get up? Why don't you get lost? (laughs) I'm practically dressed. Oh, sure. How can you sleep so long? You must be part bear. I am not. I'm wearing my long flannel nightgown. (laughs) Here I come, George. I'm getting up right now. One, two. Come on now, Liz. I'll pull the covers off. Oh, just one more minute. I'll tickle your feet. I'm up. I'm up. Hmm. Get moving. I'll pour cold water on you. No. I'll get my camera and take a picture of you and your curlers and cold cream. I'm up, I'm up, so help me, I'm up. (laughs) (laughs) That works every time. (laughs) Have you started breakfast yet, Katie? No, Mrs. Cooper. Why? Well, I'd like an extra special breakfast for Mr. Cooper. I have a favor I want from him. I have to borrow some money. Money? Mm-hmm. Oh, then I'd better serve breakfast on the paper plates. You can't throw them so far. <laughs> yes, and they don't hurt so much when they hit. Uh, if it's just a little money, I could lend it to you, Mrs. Cooper. No, Katie, this is serious. It's my January budget. I made a New Year's resolution not to go over it, and it's all spent already. But this is only the seventh of the month. The seventh? Say, that's pretty good. I usually spend it by the fifth. Uh, can't we avoid a scene with Mr. Cooper? I don't know how I know, when I get my salary, I'll lend it to you until next month Katie, your salary was in the January budget (laughs) I was afraid of that I only wish he'd broken one of his resolutions And he wouldn't have any right to be mad at me What were his resolutions? He resolved not to drop any ashes on the rug And to clean out every ashtray he uses Well, that's not so easy, you know. I know. It would be even harder if he smoked. (laughs) I forgot that. Well, I'll just see if I can get around him by being so sweet and loving, he just can't get angry when I tell him. 
That's like holding out a handful of grain to a turkey just before you chop his head off. There's, are you out in the kitchen? Oh, there's the old gobbler now. Honey, George! Ah, breakfast about ready? Oh, just about. Oh, George, I'm so lucky to be married to you. Yeah, you're right. But uh, what brought this on? Nothing, nothing. It's just that you're so wonderful. Give me a big early morning hug. <laughs> okay. Oh, hold me tighter. 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 Oh, but Liz. Go on, pretend I'm a sack of walnuts and crack my shells. <laughs> oh, kiss me, George. Oh, you talked me into it. Mm. George, your kisses are just as good as they were ten years ago. How do you do it? I keep them in a deep freeze. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How about me, George? What do I kiss like, hmm? Mm. Give me another sample, and I'll tell you. All right. Hmm. <laughs> well, what do I kiss like? Like you were over your January budget. <laughs> you always know, don't you? I don't believe it. You used all the money I gave you for this month, and January's only a week old. How could you do it? Ooh, I'm a stinker. <laughs> Liz? George, put down that knife. Huh? Oh. Come here, Liz. Yes, sir? In seven short days, you've spent all the money for all our bills for a whole month? Yes, sir. I'd like to hear a reasonable explanation of that. So would I. Can you think of one? <laughs> what happened to the money, Liz? This is serious. I know it is, George, and I'm sorry, but you know how bad I am at mathematics. You must know what happened. Now, now we'll start at the beginning. What was your first mistake? Not paying attention in seventh grade arithmetic class. No! Uh, I mean, after that. Not paying attention in eighth grade arithmetic class. Liz! George, put down that knife! Now answer my questions. Yes, sir. Did you at least pay the January bills? No, sir. The December bills? No, sir. Ask me if I paid the October bills. Liz, did you pay the October bills? No, sir. At least not all of them. Wait till I put this knife out of my reach. Yes, sir. Now, which ones? I'm not sure. I have my own system for paying bills, you see. I'm a fool to continue this conversation, mm -hmm. but what is that system? Well, I take the bills and divide them into three piles. Oh, due, overdue, and not due yet. No, have to pay, ought to pay, and doubt if I ever will pay. <laughs> if they ever hear about this at the bank, I'm washed up. Now, when I sit at the desk, I put the have to pay to my right mm. and the ought to pay to my left. Uh, what about the doubt if I ever will? I just throw those over my head onto the floor. Oh, well. Ask a silly question. Yes, sir. Now, now you've got the bills in three groups. Uh, what do you do then? Well, I pay the ones on the right. Then if I have any more money, I play eeny, meeny, miny, mo with the bills on the left. Mm -hmm, logical. Mm -hmm. How does that work out? Well, I'm usually all right through Weenie and Meanie, but when I get to Miney, there isn't any moo. Oh. <laughs> well, that system leaves you with a pretty sloppy living room, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Well, what happens to the bills that are on the floor? Oh, I pick them up according to a system developed by Hoover. Hoover? The president? No, the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Liz, if you don't mind my asking, on what do you expect to run the house for the rest of the month? George, if you don't mind my asking, give me some more money. Liz, I'm going to teach you a lesson. No matter how much sacrifice I have to make, we'll get by the rest of the month without any more household money. Oh, George, don't be silly. No, I was never more serious. It'll teach you a lesson. We have a roof over our heads, and we'll get by on whatever food there is in the house. Oh, I wish you'd told me that before I went to the grocer's yesterday. They were having a sale, and I made a wonderful purchase. Well, we'll be eating it for the next three weeks. What did you buy? Six cases of beans. Beans? <laughs> oh, Liz, you hate beans, and so do I. Why did you buy six cases? Well, it was such a bargain, I couldn't pass it up. Oh. Well, you'd better develop a taste for them. George, you're not going through with this. I certainly am. We spend no more money for the rest of January. Oh, dear. Well... Goodbye, dear. I, I'm going to the bank. Come on, give me a kiss. All right. Wait a minute. This is strictly business, George. Now, I'm talking to you as a banker. I'd like to make a loan on six cases of beans. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, madam, but your credit is no good. Oh, you're so mean. George Cooper, you're a fiend. And not just an ordinary one. I'm a new man, Liz. Meet George Cooper, king of the fiends. Meet Liz Cooper, queen of the beans. <laughs> Hey, honey, I'm home. Hi, dear. How'd things go today? Just fine. I uh, didn't have any trouble getting along without cash, did you? None at all. What's for dinner? I have the menu right here. Bean soup, bean salad, baked beans, and for dessert, bean meringue pie. Oh. <laughs> Why didn't I think of this earlier? Do you want to back out? No, it isn't that. I had beans for lunch. <laughs> Hey, honey, I'm home. Hi, dear. How'd things go today? Just fine. What's for dinner? Bean burgers. <laughs> and for dessert, a bean sundae. Uh, what's that? Ice cream with beans over it? No. Beans with ice cream over it? Don't be silly. That would be beans a la mode. Uh, well, what's a bean sundae? Beans with beans over them. Oh. <laughs> Hey, honey, I'm home. Hi, dear. How'd things go today? Just fine. What's for dinner? How would you like a nice, juicy sirloin steak? Liz, you, you, you didn't manage to get one. That's right, I didn't. We're having beans. <laughs> How are you fixing them tonight? Oh, you love them, George. We took the beans and froze them into the shape of little hats. They're called beanies. <laughs> Well, if the food is going to be bad, at least the jokes could be better. Yes, sir. You know, George, you could put an end to this as quick as you started it. Come on, let's go out and buy dinner. No, sir. I'm seeing this thing through. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'm not very hungry. I had a big lunch. George Cooper, did you spend money for lunch? No, Mr. Atterbury paid for it. Uh, we were entertaining Mr. Taylor. He's the president of that factory they're building, and he'll decide which bank they do business with. Oh, never mind the details. What did you have? Oh, uh, pork chops. <gasps> pork chops. <laughs> yeah. Two big, thick ones. Oh. George. George, tell me. Does meat still taste the same? <laughs> Liz, let go of my lapels. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I lose my head. The mention of meat upsets me. Yeah. Well, if, if you must know how it tasted, Liz It tasted like beans Everything does George, I don't want any dinner either Let's do something tonight Can't we go to a movie? Yeah, sorry, that costs money Of course, maybe we could get a pass to the legitimate theater Oh, that's a wonderful idea What's playing? The late Christopher Bean Never mind <laughs> We could play bridge with the Sturmses no, no, the way you play, that costs money, too. Hmm. Of course, uh, we could stay at home and play B-knuckle. George, that's not funny. Why does everything have to cost money? I'll put on the radio. It's the only thing that's free, and it'll take my mind off beans for a minute. Silly, beauty, beans! Take it off! This is a conspiracy. Well, we'll just stay home and look at each other. That ought to be pleasant. Well, you don't have to sound so hopeless. Hey, whatever happened to the fine art of conversation? Conversation? Why, George, we couldn't possibly have anything to say to each other. We're married. <laughs> Nonsense. We we'll just sit right down and have a very interesting conversation. All right, George. Let me get settled. All right. You start. Okay. Uh, well, let's see now. Uh, you, you start. No, no. You start. Well, uh, well, uh... That sounds fascinating. <laughs> well, it's your attitude that's killing it. Before we were married, we never had this trouble. Oh, Liz. Remember how we used to park up at Inspiration Point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, sometimes we'd stay there till two in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> I don't recall that uh, we were bored with each other's conversation then. I don't recall that we did any talking at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, this, you know, this is more like it. Yeah. Oh, what fun we used to have. Mm-hmm. Remember the time I took you skiing and we were snowed in at that lodge? And the fun we had until they rescued us? <laughs> What's the matter, Liz? You never took me skiing in your whole life. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, well, remember... Uh... Do you mind if I put on the radio, Mr. Cooper? So remember those big red letters on the box. What, what happened? The lights went out. And the radio went off. Oh, we must have blown a fuse. I'll go and see. Oh, wait a minute. I think I know. George, how soon do they shut off the electricity if you don't pay the bill? <laughs> Liz, don't tell me you didn't pay the light bill. All right, I won't tell you. Now I don't know why they went off. <laughs> Oh, fine. Now we're going to be without lights the rest of the month. Oh, George, you're not going to be that stubborn, are you? Yes, I am. I'm sorry, Liz. All right. I'm going to get into bed, turn on the electric blanket, and stay there for three weeks. Uh, You'd better take a hot water bottle. The electric blanket takes electricity. Hmm. Well, that settles it. Well, there's only one way to keep warm and occupied. What's that? Let's go out in the car and neck. Liz and George will return in just a moment. When the United States was still a young and growing nation, there came forth from all parts of the country idealists to create utopia. For example, there was John Humphrey Noyes, who dreamed up the Oneida community in New York in 1847. It was designed to do away with sin and greed. In order to keep the community alive, small manufacturing industries were started. By 1880 the community living plan had died, and the industries had grown to great proportion and nationwide reputation. Even though John Noy's idea had backfired, his efforts provided a contribution to American industry. Another idealist who seemingly had in mind the health and happiness of Americans was Henry Club. About 1855, Mr. Club got the idea that people would be healthier if they were vegetarians. He thought they'd be happier if they lived in octagon-shaped houses on octagon-shaped parcels of land in octagon-shaped cities. Unfortunately for Mr. Club, he decided to establish Octagonal City, the center of the Vegetarian Settlement Company, in a pretty dusty spot in Kansas. After one look at the hardships to be encountered on the barren plains, nearly every one of the subscribers to the vegetarian community went back to the non-vegetarian East Coast. One after another communal living experiments bloomed, faded, and disappeared. There were the Shakers, the Separatists of Zoar, the Rapatite Harmonists, Brook Farm, and many others, all planned toward better living and better people. Dreamers of the American dream can't be judged merely on the basis of success or failure, for failure can show people of the future what not to do. American men and women built the United States into a great nation because they conceived their ideas and tried them out. This is indeed part of the great American dream, a dream which has become a decisive reality. And now, back to My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning. Liz Cooper has already spent all her household money for January... And much to her surprise, George is making her get along as best she can without any more money. Well, at the last reading, they had been eating beans for a week. And now the electricity is off. Liz is beginning to crack under the strain. Oh, Katie. What's the matter, Mrs. Cooper? What next? Now we're all out of candles. Oh, why does Mr. Cooper have to be so stubborn? Because he's a man. (laughs) I know. My first husband, Clarence, couldn't be rushed into anything either. He took me out every Thursday night for seven years while we were engaged. Every Thursday? Yes. Then we got married and we didn't have anything to do on Thursday night. (laughs) Oh, Katie. Katie, I just thought of a plan. I'm going to charge some groceries and tell George I found the money in an old purse. I'll call Rafferty's Grocery. They carry everything and they always have such good stuff. Rafferty's Grocery and Delicatessen. You can eat it, drink it, chew it, slice it, or smell it. We sell it. 
Oh, hello, Mr. Rafferty. This is Mr. George Cooper. Yes, I need a lot of things today. Uh, send me six lamb chops, two potatoes, uh, corn, peas, sugar, bread, butter, and milk. Oh, and charge it. Now, did I forget anything? Yep, you forgot to check your husband. He stopped your credit. What? Well, if that isn't the dirtiest trick, the nerve of him thinking I'd charge something behind his back. Yeah, too bad, too. Got some wonderful specials. Could give you a real goodbye on beans. Oh, no. Goodbye, Mr. Rafferty. I'm just going to call George up and give him a piece of my mind. Maybe that's George now. Hello, you no-good skunk. This is the operator. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. Your phone is being disconnected. Just because I called you a skunk? <laughs> I said I'm sorry. We will resume service as soon as your overdue bill is paid. Oh, where will this end? Katie, they've disconnected our phone. Well, if that's the way they're going to act, what's the name of this phone company? I'll take my telephone business to someone else. <laughs> Mrs. Cooper, you can't do that. There's only one phone company. Well, I'll think of something. I'll, I'll, I'll get a carrier pigeon. Get two, one for messages and one for dinner. I knew it. They called to apologize. You're too late. I've decided to use pigeons. Liz, what are you talking about? It's no use, George. You can't talk to me. They've disconnected the phone. Hang up. Now, wait a minute. I'm at the phone company. Oh. Everything's all right, Liz. The electricity will be on in a minute, and your credit is good at the market again. Well, what brought this on? I'm calling a truce just for tonight. Oh? Uh, yeah, you, you know that fellow Taylor I told you about. Yes. Well, I'm bringing him home to dinner. He's very important to the bank. Uh, we'll see you later. Wait a minute. I'm mad at you. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll talk about it later, Liz. Goodbye. But, George, I... Oh, darn it. Oh, what's the matter, Mrs. Cooper? Oh, he makes us stick to this ridiculous business until the minute he wants to impress someone, and then he gaily calls a truce. Well, I'm going to fix him all right. How? I'm going to pull a fuse and keep all the lights off... And, and I'm going to wear my oldest dress and pretend we always live this way. And guess what we're having for dinner? Oh, no, Mrs. Cooper. Oh, yes. Get me some sticks and some glue. We're going to have bean on the cob. <laughs> Well, here we are, Mr. Taylor. Well, I must say, Cooper, you have a nice-looking place, but uh, are you sure your wife is expecting us? Oh, I'm sure she is. Why? All the lights are out. Uh, well, we're probably dining by candlelight. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's wonderful. I can't wait to get a home-cooked meal. You know how it is when you're traveling. Nothing but beans, beans, beans. <laughs> oh, you don't need to worry. We won't be having beans tonight. Hey, honey, I'm home. That's funny. No lights, no candles either. Probably a joke of hers. Liz is a great little kidder. Yeah, the lights don't work. Liz, where are you? Yeah, I'll light a match. No one here. Yeah. There's something moving in the corner. Liz, is that you? George, you've come back. <laughs> you haven't forgotten your poor starving wife. What? Did you bring some food, a crust of stale bread, a glass of warm water? Have you gone crazy? Yes, I think I have. Why wouldn't I? Cooped up here for years with no lights and no food. I'm going mad! Well, this is most peculiar, Cooper. Is this some kind of a joke? Yes, of course it is, Mr. Taylor. Liz, why aren't the lights turned on? Lights? Oh... That's that new invention you told me wasn't perfected yet. What are you trying to do? Who's that with you? Oh, now stop it, Liz. What will Mr. Taylor think? How do you do, Mr. Taylor? Hello, Mrs. Cooper. Tell me, Mr. Taylor, what's it like out there? Out where? Out there. I've been cooped up here so long. We can't afford a newspaper, and I never get to the movie. Tell me, what happened to Dewey? Uh, he lost. 
Oh, dear. I was sure he'd take Manila. <laughs> oh, Liz, cut it out. And wh- why have you got on that old house dress? Oh, George, how can you say anything unkind about this dress? Don't you remember? I wore it ten years ago when we were married. Now, Liz! I'm very sentimental about this dress, Mr. Taylor. It's the only one I've ever had. Liz, stop it. Look, Mr. Taylor. Don't speak to me, you cad. What? I simply can't believe that a vice president of a bank would treat his wife like this. And personally, I wouldn't do business with a bank that has an executive like you. Bless you, kind sir. <laughs> this, this whole thing is a very unfunny joke my wife is pulling. Now, now I'll, I'll get our maid and she'll tell you just what's going on. You keep your wife in rags and you have a maid? Oh, she isn't really our maid. He just calls her that. She is, too. Uh, Katie, would you please come in here? Katie, I want you to tell this gentleman what's going on in this house. All right. But first, what about me, son? Didn't you bring some bread for your poor old mother? Oh, no! George. George. George, you're not mad at me, are you? I haven't decided. Now, now, let me go to sleep. Well, you, you'll have to admit I gave Mr. Taylor a beautiful steak dinner. Oh, sure. After you had your fun. Well, maybe you won't be mad at me when I tell you I've got my accounts all straight. I don't owe a cent to anyone. I'm afraid to ask, but how did you manage that? I wrote an article and sold it to the daily paper. An article? Mm-hmm. What about? A hundred different ways to fix beans. <laughs> You have been listening to My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Danning, and based on characters created by Isabel Scott Rorick. Tonight's program was produced and directed by Jess Oppenheimer, who wrote the script with Madeline Pugh and Bob Carroll, Jr. Original music was composed by Marlon Skiles and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The part of Katie the Maid was played by Ruth Parrott. Lucille Ball will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Sorrowful Jones. Be sure to listen to Lucille Ball in My Favorite Husband next week. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Pat Novak. Or higher. Sure, I'm Pat Novak. For higher. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you got to trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here, you shouldn't talk.
It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night, anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to read out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck. You're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay till he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Uh-huh. Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now, and you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about... 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are, buy a beer and talk to the bartender. I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Are you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. Is that supposed to be a gun in your pocket? You get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hit your stomach, back down. (laughs) Now, where's yours, Mr. Timmett? It's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. (laughs) Go easy, fella. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. (laughs) Now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, Leahy. I gotta make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. <laughs>
Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street and we walked in. One look at that lobby and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch, and the legs on it were so warped pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. When we went up to the second floor, we walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except you could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I, uh... Came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. Oh! Oh! You didn't open it fast enough. <laughs> Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side, and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes? Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. What are you going to do? Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well... He's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. 
And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony leave. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaving? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Now, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing and I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. They pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room, arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo, not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy Feldman didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while, and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. 
I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get on there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen. He used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. You mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike, really, but I'm going to send them you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Oh. Do you know where it is? No. Well... You growl, and you bite, and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Well, you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy, you ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. You got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. Oh, I was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer, so I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah? I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. 
Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. He looked big to that copper. Please. Please find him. You got uh, Yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket. You uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off, too, huh? I'll open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, hey, yeah, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. And, and you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking put both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you are rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will... That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They told him. You ask him what you've got. Ask him what's tearing you to pieces. Ask him. They'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask him. They'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, girls. Hello, Mr. Novak. Did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. 
They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. <laughs> If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls... Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out in Arguello. But the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. <laughs> Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. Lee Masters' office, Miss Darlington speaking. Tell Lee to get down to the Met right away. The Met? The Metropolitan Opera House. Maria Del Fuego is dead. Hey, that's the opera singer. The soprano, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. She died of suffocation just before the curtain went up. The doctor there thinks it might have been murder. Goodyear presents... The Sounds of Darkness. Good evening. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of passenger, truck, and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce, and industry, bring you Lee Masters, the blind detective who challenges the sound of darkness. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, you will hear Tony Jay as Lee Masters, James White as Johnny Bridges, and Elaine Lee as Samantha Darlington. Others in the cast are Gordon Mulholland, Patricia Sanders, George Carellin, and Hugh Rouse. Now let's join the world of Lee Masters in tonight's Sounds of Darkness, Murder Makeup. Doc, give it to me. Oh, well, um, I was in the audience tonight, uh, just before the curtain was due to go up. Stage manager, I suppose he was, he came out of the curtains and asked if there was a doctor in the house. Those immortal words, huh? huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's the first time it's happened to me, actually. And anyway, I came around backstage, and Madame Del Fuego was in her dressing room there, and 
Oh, I haven't moved anything, by the way. I examined her. She was dead, and death seemed to be due to asphyxiation. But I don't see how... So that's why we were called in. Okay, Doc, stick around, will you? I want to have a look at that body. Huh? But I, I thought... That's you... right. But uh, Johnny here is my eyes. Come on, Johnny. All right, Johnny. Give it to me. Well, it's a bit of a mess. Her body's across the dressing table. Mm -hmm. As if she just collapsed while she was making up or something. Glass on the floor. Something's been broken. Looks like a bottle or something. On the dressing table. Oh, usual stuff. All kinds of makeup. And a box of chocolates. Opened. It looks like there's just one chocolate being eaten out of it. Mm hmm. Look, uh, just call the doctor, will you, Johnny? Sure. Doctor, uh, could you come here, please? Oh, sure. Yeah, Mr. Masters. Look, uh, Doc, why don't you buy the suffocated angle? Oh, there's no evidence of strangulation, no evidence of having been smothered, and no medical history of heart spasms or any disorder that would have caused paralysis of the respiratory system. Oh, are oh, you checked? Yeah, I checked. I mm. phoned her family doctor. She was in perfect health, apart from her occupational hazard of being about 40, 50 pounds too fat. Mm-hmm. Then uh, how could she have died of suffocation? Oh, paralysis of the respiratory system. But uh, the $64 question is what caused the paralysis? Know anything about South American Indian poisons, Doc? Uh, no. No, I don't. Curare. Used on darts from their blowpipes. Causes paralysis. So the victim dies of suffocation. Hey, say, that would fit the bill. Yeah. Well, it's a possibility. Well, now we have a possible theory. What we haven't got is motive, a modus operandi, and a suspect. In fact, the whole bill of goods we haven't got. So the understudy went on, Miss Harmer. That's right. Tell me, uh, how long have you been dressing Miss Del Fuego? Oh, for the last ten years didn't like her much, did you? Why do you say that? Your tone of voice. Tell me, uh, would the understudy have had a motive for killing her? Look, in this business, understudies are always keen to go on, but I don't think this one was that keen. Did she like Miss Del Fuego? No, she didn't. Nobody did. She was a Yeah, first... yeah, yeah. I, I get the message. You have any reason for killing her? Oh, I suppose in your book, yeah. I need money badly. She wouldn't lend me any. I know that I was in the will for a couple of grand. But you didn't do it. How? I don't even know how she died. She was poisoned. Doctors have established that. Yeah? What about the chocolates? Could could that have been how? Who sent the chocolates? Do you know? No, they, they came tonight. No card or name on them. Opening night present, you know. I don't think so. No, we've had the box analyzed. The rest of the chocolates are okay. If the murderer did put poison in only one chocolate, how did he know that she would take that one? Well, that's easy. It is? Yeah. The bucks she got tonight were assorted. She only liked one kind of chocolate. Cherry liqueur. And that's the only one she ate. Your Valero, isn't it? Uh, si, senor, that's right. Uh -huh. uh, my poor Maria. Always I say she sing like an angel. And uh, now. You liked her? Eh, nobody liked her. She's a terrible woman. Ah, but the voice of an angel. Uh, I am so sorry about my cruel little joke now. Yeah? What was that? The chocolate. I sent her the box of chocolate. I know that she likes them very much. But she's on a strict diet. It was very cruel of me, eh? You sent them? Uh, see, si, see, si, why? What's the matter? She was poisoned. And the only thing she had to eat for three hours before the show was one of the chocolates that you sent her. Johnny, I'm stumped. 
She had nothing to drink. She had nothing to eat except that chocolate. How? I can't begin to think, Lee. Wait a minute. Yeah. That glass on the floor. She, she collapsed and knocked it off, right? Well, that's what it looks like. Throat spray. Opera singers are always using throat sprays, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah that could be it. Uh -huh. Just a minute. Yeah, that would fit. Here's a little bag thing that they squeezed to spray the throat. So that could have been the way it was administered. Uh, Johnny, call the dresser, Miss Harmer, again. So how come her husband brought the spray tonight? She always used to carry the throat spray with her in her handbag. They'd scared of getting a sore throat, you know. Yeah. Well, this evening she forgot to bring it. She phoned her husband at home, told him where it was, and he brought it just before the curtain went up. All right. Johnny, uh -huh. pick up those shards of broken glass with tweezers and rush them down to the labs. I want them checked for traces of curare poison. <laughs> Merchant. So you were playing Pinkerton tonight. That's right. I've been singing with Maria for the past two years. How was that? Well, we sang well together, you know, and, uh, and we, uh, well, it's... Uh, yeah, I've heard all the gossip from the stagehands. I know that you and Miss Del Fuego have been having a love affair. Oh? Huh? Well, you must also know that I have no motive for wanting her dead, then. On the contrary... My office works 24 hours a day, and we've checked. We know that you've decided that you now love your wife since her father died and left her 20 grand. How oh, dare you say that? I'm interested in the facts, Mr. Marchant. Just the facts. How you live your life is your own affair. I'm not condemning. I'm commenting, that's all. Oh, yeah. I suppose I might as well admit it. I did want to end things, and she didn't. She wanted to go ahead and get a divorce, but if you ask me, it's her husband. He's the one. A real gigolo, that guy. Been living off her for years. He was the one who would have suffered if she'd got her divorce before she died. And now? Well, he stands to inherit the lot. Uh, that must be quite a bit of dough. Give me the layout again, will you? All right. Well, there are just two dressing rooms up here. Maria's and Marchin's are stars. This is raised about half a floor above the stage level. The other dressing rooms are down below. Yeah, I get it. Hey, Lee, what about a cigarette? Couldn't you have been poisoned that way? Uh, she was a non-smoker. Did you find that out? No, you told me when you were describing the dressing room and its contents. No ashtray, no cigarettes, no lighter or matches. Besides, singers usually don't. Oh, huh. so what's the answer? Well, seems to me that everyone hated this doll. Everyone had a reason to kill her. And a lot of them had the opportunity. That husband could have been him with that throat spray. You haven't heard from the labs yet? No, not yet. All right. Now, let's go over this dressing room again, now that they've removed the body. Now, tell me again, anything that looks as if it shouldn't be here... No, I don't think so. On the dressing table itself? Well, lots of jars of cream, sticks of makeup, false hair, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, just go through them in detail, will you? All that makeup jazz. Sure. Well, first, there's this... Oh. Hello? Uh, Mr. Bridges? Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, this is police laboratories here. Those uh, pieces of glass. Yeah, what did you find? Oh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. If she was poisoned, she didn't get the poison from the throat spray. You are listening to Murder Makeup. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness brought to you by Goodyear, the greatest name in rubber. Well, that seems to let out the husband. Although he would also appear to have the strongest motive. Well, looks like we're back on the chocolate, sir. If she ate the one and only poisoned chocolate, how the heck are we going to prove it? Yeah, I see what you mean. 
Besides, I, I don't like that. No, for my money, that Valero guy is no killer. Anyway, his only motive seems to be that he didn't like her. Hardly motive for murder. Yeah. Right, now where were we? You were giving me the rundown on the makeup. Yeah, you want me to call them up? Yeah, there should be numbers on each stick. Call out what numbers she has. All right. Uh, these are all open sticks. Nine, eight, fourteen, thirteen, sixteen, twenty. A uh, thin black one, two red ones, carmine and lake. Powder, cream. Now the full sticks. Well, it seems there's a full stick for every half one that she's using. That's funny. Huh? I wonder... Call that dresser again, Johnny. Okay. And Miss Harmer. Yeah, okay. Uh, Miss Harmer. Was it part of your job to see that Miss Del Fuego's makeup was kept complete? Yeah, that's right. Heaven help me if I forgot. Did you forget? Tonight, for instance? No. No, I didn't. Why? It would seem that as well as one stick of each that she was using, she also had a full unopened stick of each number. Yeah, that's that right. right. Very fussy she was about it, too. So where's the number five? Come again? The five, the number five. How come there's no half-used stick and no full stick? But there is. Well, there should be. I mean, there was last night. That I know for sure. You mean that the poison was in the makeup? Maybe. But you see, that doesn't answer all the questions, Johnny. Curari has to get into the bloodstream so it can be administered through the mouth or, as the Indians do, into the bloodstream direct. A cut from an arrow soaked in the poison. Curari in the stick of makeup wouldn't do anything. Huh? No, the makeup would be cleaned off again before the pores could assimilate sufficient to do any damage. And how... That's what we're doing down in the morgue. We must find out. All right. Open up. Yep. Right. Now, what do you see? Oh, well, she's made up all right. Heavy makeup. Sort of yellowish color. Yeah. Cho-Cho-San was Japanese. Come again? Uh, the part she was playing in the opera tonight. Has the body been stripped? Yeah, it's just sort of wrapped in a shroud or something. All right. I got a nice job for you, Johnny. I'm going back to the opera house. I think I know who did this. And I think I know how. you got to make sure for me. Me? How'd I do that? You go over this corpse with a fine tooth comb. Somewhere, more than likely on the face, there must be a scratch where the poison went in. Clean the makeup off her face and have a look. Then come across to the theater and let me know. Miss Harmer, did Mr. Marchant send you out for something just before the show tonight? Why, yeah, he did. How did you know? Yeah, that figures. That's the way he did it. Uh, what happened exactly, Miss Harmer? Well, he doesn't have a dresser, you see, and he's in the dressing room next door. He was here early tonight, before Miss Del Fuego arrived. Is that usual? Uh, no. No, come to think of it, it isn't. Uh-huh. Uh, go on. Well, he asked me to slip back to his flat he'd forgotten his wallet. He said he'd tell Miss Del Fuego, explain where I was. And by the time you got back, Maria had arrived and was nearly finished with her makeup. Is that right? That's right. Fine. Yeah, I think I have the complete picture now. Just wait for Johnny to get back from the morgue to confirm things. <laughs> We aren't going to keep you very long. I know you all want to get home. But my motto in this sort of thing is clear it up right away. 
Now, within a very short while, I hope to have the killer. Yeah, and the rest of you will be able to go home. Right? Now, first of all, I, I must apologize for the inconvenience tonight. I'm afraid all the dressing rooms had to be sealed off and you all kept in this rather drafty green room. But you'll see the reason for that as I explain. All okay, Johnny? Yeah, Lee, and everybody's here. Right. Now, Mr. Del Fuego, huh? you were my prize suspect. Me? Yeah. But I love her, my wife. You loved her dough. Huh? If she'd gone ahead and gotten a divorce from you, you would have lost a tidy sum. But that is so ridiculous. You had the strongest motive and the opportunity. <laughs> Nonsense. Tonight, she forgot her throat spray. You could have arranged that. Huh? Taken it out from her purse and put curare into the spray. What? Yeah, first squeeze she gave and a spray of deadly atomized poison could have gone down her throat. But now you were saying the... Look, I know you didn't. You oh. checked on the glass splinters for traces of poison. Thanks. And there weren't any. That lets you out. Mm. Then, Mr. Valero, see, you see. sent her chocolate. That's right, yes. Yeah, an assortment. You might have known that the only one she wouldn't have been able to resist would have been the cherry liqueur. I didn't know that. You might have introduced the poison into only that one. It would have been difficult to prove that you did it. But I didn't do it. I don't tell her no lie. I don't like her, see, but I don't kill her. No, I, I know that now. Ah. And you were so honest about the whole business that I didn't really suspect you. Which leaves us two suspects. You, Miss Harmer. What? And you, Mr. Marchant. Yeah, both got motives, and both of you could have done it. Now, see here. Now, this won't take long. Just bear with me, will you? Oh, very well. Fine. Right. Now I want to tell you what happened tonight. Miss Del Fuego arrived at her usual time, and she found that her dresser, Miss Harmer, wasn't there, right? You'd sent her out, Mr. Marchant. Yeah, that's right, I did. I told Maria. Yeah, quite. She finds her dresser isn't here, and you tell her that you've sent her out. Now, yours are the only two dressing rooms on this level. Right, Mr. Marsh? Right. Although I can't see... Then, that. Maria Del Fuego starts to make up. Oh, she's old-fashioned in this respect. She doesn't use pancake makeup. She uses the old grease paint sticks. Now, when I was going over the contents of her dressing room... It struck me as rather odd that she had no number five. Well, not everyone uses the same sticks, Mr. Masters, I no, mean. No, but some things you can't avoid. Like in a Japanese makeup, you would achieve this effect with number five and a yellow. Whatever that number would be, wouldn't you? Oh, well, that's what she used, yeah. Exactly. So why no number five in her dressing room? I'll tell you why. It took me some time to figure it out. The reason why there wasn't any number five is that someone made it their business to take it away. Both the stick in use and the full spare one. Well, her dresser, she had the chance. Why, yeah, I know. She's the obvious one to suspect, isn't she? You're mad. I, I didn't do it. I didn't say you did. I said you were the obvious one to suspect. The murderer hoped that if investigations did get that far, that we would suspect you. Well, but let me go on. Why would anyone want to steal two sticks of grease paint? You got any ideas, Johnny? Well, if she had to use that color, that number, then she'd have to get some more, wouldn't she? Exactly. Good boy. Now, tell us what you found on the deceased's face, will you? Sure. A deep scratch with something very sharp. A pin, maybe. I don't have to stay and listen to all this. I'm afraid you do, Mr. Marchant. You see, the murderer stole the two sticks of number five grease paint to make sure that Maria Del Fuego would have to borrow another stick. And where would she obviously borrow that stick? Why, from her next-door neighbor, of course. From the dressing room of her no longer so keen lover, you, Mr. Marchant. Why, you can't prove this. It's all just theory. Stick around, Buster. That's why I had the dressing room sealed. The proof of your guilt is in your dressing room still. It must be. You haven't had a chance to get rid of it yet. Why, you... Get him, Johnny. Okay, get him. Okay, I got him. Fine. You better hold him there till I finish. 
This won't take much longer. But uh, how was she poisoned? Like how, I don't get it. Uh, what does all this uh, business of the sticks of a make approve? Huh? Our friend Marchant there at this moment uh, has on his old. person or in his dressing room a stick of number five grease paint. The stick has been impregnated with curare poison. He stole Maria's sticks to make sure that she would ask him if she could borrow his. He lent her the stick he'd prepared, the poison stick. You got to prove it, Bob. And that's how she was murdered. All right, Johnny. Hand him over to the boys outside. They can take him and book him. You and I had better find that stick of makeup. That's the only proof we've got. business, Lee. <laughs> What's eating you, son? You said yourself that the poison makeup wouldn't explain it. That Karari had to get into the bloodstream, not through the pores. That's right. But you yourself found the scratch where the poison got into the blood. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. That I understand. But how did Marchant know? I mean, he didn't cut her. Someone would have known if he'd scratched her or something. That's right, Johnny. Then how did he know she was going to scratch herself? Well, how did she scratch herself anyway? <laughs> you still don't know her. No. Huh? You know, I had a girlfriend who was a chorus girl once, many years ago. Mm. She told me that the real broads in the business, if they didn't like one of the other girls, had the nasty little habit of sticking pins into their makeup, <laughs> way down out of sight. Yes. Yeah. The girl would use the stick, it would wear down, uh -huh. and the pin or needle would leave a very nasty scratch right down her face. Now do you get it? You mean Marchant had a stick of five impregnated with poison? And with a pin in it. When Maria used it, she scratched herself badly. She would have stopped the bleeding with a septic pencil or something. Yeah. Then she would have made up over the scratch so that it wouldn't show, right? Right. That way, the poison gets into the cut and into her bloodstream. Next thing she knows, she's suddenly paralyzed and she... Dies of suffocation. And the dresser was out of the way. Marchant sent her out. That's right. Any argument about the pin, he would have had an explanation for Maria. And there was no one to overhear. Mm. She had to borrow from him, you see. He was right next door. Yeah, but, uh, motive? Like I said, his wife just inherited 20 grand. It wouldn't have looked so good if Maria had told her that Marchant was her lover. She might just have divorced him and left him without a cent. But uh, how did he get out of this in the first place? There's just as much a clue when something's missing as when it's there, Johnny. Don't forget that. Okay. And that stick of five was missing from her dressing room. That's what started me into thinking. So ends tonight's Sounds of Darkness. Presented for your entertainment by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Makers of world-famous passenger tires, truck and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce and industry. Join us next Friday and every Friday night at 9.30 when Goodyear will again present the blind detective Lee Masters in... The Sounds of Darkness. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. You idiot, you fool, you let him get away. I did not, worker. What could I do? He was in the post office. Did he have the envelopes? Of course he did. He sent them to someone. Sent them? And he's got away. Oh, Staley, you are an idiot. No, not quite. Look, I've got a blotter. Well, what good's that? Look, in the mirror. What he wrote on the envelope is on the blotter. Hmm. Well, at least you use your head. I'll see if we can read it. Box 13, care of Star Times. Box 13, Star Times. There's no Star Times in this city. Uh, but there is in the city he sent his letter to. You're right. Well, we'll find him later. But first, I think I can get what we want from this Box 13. <laughs> And 
And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Hare and Hounds. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll see you later then. So long. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, hiya, Susie. Got the mail? Uh-huh. And I... What do you got there? Eight nice new counterfeit $5 bills. How'd you get them? Well, you see, I had my eyes closed when they were passed on to me. I'm turning them over later to the police. Hmm. Now, how about the mail? Oh, here. And you know, Mr. Holliday, I had the funniest feeling while I was coming back here at the office from the Star Times. What do you mean? I I had a kind of demolition. You mean you blew your top? Huh? <laughs> what do you mean, demolition? You know, like, like when you think something's happening or going to happen. Oh, premonition. I had it. Well, why? I, I felt like I was being followed. I felt eyes looking at me when I was in the Star Times getting the mail. <laughs> and you were followed? It felt like it. Okay, that makes you a big girl now. Let's have the mail, huh? Yes, sir. Twelve letters. Mm, slim pickings. It was such a funny feeling. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, look here. An out-of-town letter. I know. I thought... <gasps> oh! A little nervous this morning, Susie. Uh, I guess so. Come in. Oh, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, may I come in? Oh, please do. Oh. I hope this is not too much of an intrusion, but I... <laughs> may I do something for you? Well, maybe. Is this your advertisement in the Star Times, Adventure Wanted Will Go Any Place to Anything, Box 13? That's right. So you are Box 13? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I had a different picture of you, Mr... Uh, Mr... Uh... Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, my name is Worker, Thomas Worker. <gasps> Oh, I saw you at the Star Times. You were the one who was looking at me. Yes, I guess I was. You followed me. It was charming work. A and you... Oh, thank you. May I ask why you followed my secretary, Mr. Worker? A curiosity. You see, I've been noticing your ad for weeks now. It runs day after day. But naturally, I wanted to see you, uh, what you look like, and, and why you put the ad in the paper. Oh, is that all? Yes, that's all. <laughs> Foolish? Mm, no. Tell me, Mr. Holliday, do you get the adventure you advertise for? Sometimes. Do you receive many replies to your ad? Usually, yes. But you cannot follow them all. Well, no. Do you have any particular reason for asking all these questions, Mr. Worker? <laughs> no, but I lead such a prosaic life myself that your ad intrigued me. I, I finally got up enough courage to go to the Star Times and wait for someone to collect the mail from Box 13. I see. And now that you've found me... I... Well, perhaps you'd care to have dinner with me some evening and, and tell me some of your adventures. Oh, I'd like to hear them very much. I... I'm very lonely and... and... All right, Mr. Worker. I'd be glad to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I must be going. Sorry to have troubled you. And I, I hope I didn't frighten you, young lady. Oh, no. It was kind of fun. Oh, oh, oh my umbrella. <laughs> One can never tell when it might rain. Well, good day, Mr. Holiday, and thank you so much. Don't bother to get up. I'll look you up in the phone book and call you. Please do. Goodbye. What a nice man. Uh-huh. Funny old duck. Well, let's open the mail, Susie, and... Hey. Huh? What's the matter? Where's that letter from out of town? It's right on top of the pile where you put it. But it's not a... a... What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? He's gone. What do you mean? Sure he's gone and... And that letter went with him. <gasps> he... he took it. His umbrella was on top of the pile. Oh, what a nice old man. Gee, he stole a letter. Yeah, and something tells me, Susie, that Mr. Worker will never invite me to have that dinner with him. <laughs> Sure, Worker took the letter. But why? What was in it? Why was it so important? And who sent it? Well, I kept asking myself those questions, and then three days after that little visit from Worker, Susie came bursting into the office. Oh, Mr. Holliday, look. Here, here's another letter from the same place. I, I mean, it looks like the same handwriting. Yeah, it does. Hey, Susie. Huh? You weren't followed this time, were you? Uh-uh. I made sure. Oh, good. What's it say, Mr. Holliday? Listen. Three days ago, I sent you a letter containing a sealed envelope. It contained half of something which is very important to me. 
It was imperative that I get rid of it until I could get to safety. Gee. I'm all right now, so send the sealed envelope to 243 Marlowe Avenue, Bridgeport. Arthur Holmes. Now what are you going to do, Mr. Holliday? Do? Well, I can't send him the envelope because I haven't got it. Mm. And I can't find Mr. Worker because I've got a sneaking hunch that he'll be a little scarce. Maybe you better write to Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, Susie. This looks too good to be handled by a letter. I'm going to find out a few things by seeing Mr. Holmes in person. I went to Bridgeport, found 243 Marlowe Avenue. It was an apartment house. There was no clerk at the desk, but there was a tier of mailboxes. One of them belonged to Arthur Holmes in apartment 6B. So, a couple of minutes later... Mr. Holmes? Oh, Mr. Holmes? I tried the door. It wasn't locked. The apartment was dark. I was fumbling for the light switch when... <gasps> if I say I was fresh as a daisy after that thump on my head, I'd never get to be the father of my country. I was lying on the floor. The room was still dark except for a flashing light that came from a store sign across the street. I lay there for a minute to give the room a little time to stop spinning, then, then I realized I was holding something in my hand. And from where I lay, it felt like a gun. I was just crawling to my feet when... Mr. Holmes, hmm. I've come with the fresh towels. Mr. Holmes! I wanted to clear up a lot more before anyone found me. I ducked behind the door and waited. Mr. Holmes? Why did she scream? Well, who wouldn't? The room was a shamble. Someone had searched it. And lying on the bed in an alcove was a man who certainly would have no further interest in me. Or anything else. There was a hole in his forehead. And I was sure I held the gun that put it there. Sure, I was innocent. But I'd have a hard time proving that. Figure it out. I received the letter from Holmes... Instead of writing, I went to him. I didn't wait for the clerk in the building to call up first. I ducked behind the door when the cleaning woman came in. Well, maybe I should have gone to the police right away, but I was innocent. And I wanted to learn a bit more. Besides, the cleaning woman reported the murder. So a half hour later, I was drinking a cup of coffee and an all-night hamburger and that stand. That's up the late news for tonight. The next edition of the new... Oh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. We have a last-minute flash... A murder was committed tonight in the Roxmore Apartments. Police are looking for a man who answers this description. Medium height, light hair, wearing dark gray flannel suit, blue and white striped necktie, black shoes, carrying light tan top coat. The description of the wanted man was given to the police by the clerk, who remembers this man asking for the apartment of the murdered man, Arthur Holmes. And that's all for tonight. The next edition of the news... Hmm. Another murder. Hear it, mister? Yeah. Getting so a person can't feel safe no more. You're so right. More coffee? No, no thanks, no thanks. Pie, cake? Nothing, thank you. Yeah, they ought to get that guy that done it pretty soon. You think so? Sure. He ain't gonna get far. Well, every cop in the city will be looking for a guy wearing a gray suit with blue and white. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, okay, here's your dime. Yeah, thanks. What's the matter? You... Don't say it. What are you gonna do? Walk out of here. Sure, sure. You stay right where you are and you won't get hurt. Just keep talking to me. Mister, I, I ain't got nothing to say. Then don't say it. Sure, sure. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I didn't kill that man. Well, I ain't said you did. The police said it. They could be wrong. Sure, they could be wrong. Yeah, that's right. Now stay right where you are. Don't say a word to either of the other two in here until I'm out of sight. Understand? Sure, sure. Good night, mister. Come again. Hey, that... Hey, taxi! Taxi! Know where the park is? Yeah, sure. Well, drive to it fast. Yeah. Hey, stop that guy! Somebody let him in the cab! What's all that noise about? I haven't the least idea. Park, huh? Okay. I'd sure like to know what all that noise was about. And they're playing a game. Huh? Mm hmm, sure. Hare and Hounds. Ever hear of it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I played it when I was a kid. Huh. Then I've got news for you. It's no longer a kid's game. The 
stake number two for smart boy holiday. Another notch against me. I ran from the hamburger stand. Well, that would look bad. But I've got one bad fault among others. I'm, I'm very curious. And I was so curious to know how and why the clerk at the apartment house identified me when he didn't even see me. But if somebody paid him off to enlarge this beautiful frame around my neck, well, we'd see. Hey, uh, mister, I, I've been thinking. Ain't that hair and hounds game a little young for grown-ups? I told you it wasn't a kid's game anymore. The whole world's gone nuts. We agree. Say, uh, pull up here, will you? I thought you wanted to go to the park. It's dark there. Huh? Well, it's dark all over. It gets that way at night, mister. Maybe you've got something there. Oh, pull up here by the duck so. Here you are. Keep the chains. Hey, a fiver. Well, thanks, buddy. No, don't mention it. I won't. Not even to the missus. When the cab drove away, I then went into the drugstore to the phone booth. I looked up the Roxmore apartments in the book and dialed the number. Is Eddie there? Eddie. He's the clerk there, isn't he? Who? Charlie. Charlie who? Madison? No, Eddie's the clerk there. I... Okay, okay, keep you, Charlie. Madison? Madison? Charles Madison. There were three Charles Madisons in the book. Okay. Maybe one of the three was the one I wanted. I left the drugstore and went back out into the street. And as I did, the cab I just got out of drove up. Hey, you! Hey, you, wait a minute! Well, this was it. Hey, you! So, you want to play hare and hounds too, huh? Well, I'm sorry, but I warned you. Now, wait a minute. It's no longer a kid's game, not the way I play it! to Heron Howes, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, well, I was adding black marks against my name faster than I could explain them away. And I knew the police would be listening in on the Roxmore switchboard. I hope my act had worked. Now all I had to do was find the right Charlie Madison and get his story. An hour and a half and two Charlie Madisons later. Uh-huh, I'm Charlie Madison. Clerk at the Roxmore? Yeah, why? I'm... I'm a writer. I'd like to get your story. Oh, sure, sure. Come on in. You're married, Mr. Madison? No. You live alone? Sure, sure. Swell. Huh? Get your coat and hat, Charlie. Huh? What for? I'll feel safer out on the street, uh, away from here. I don't get it. Don't you recognize me, Charlie? What are you giving me? I never saw you before in my life. For a guy who never saw me before in his life, you give a pretty accurate description to the police. You're... Yeah. Yeah, I am. How? Now, listen, Charlie. You're not going to get hurt if you play good boy. Don't try another yell. You're breaking my arm. Mm-hmm. One more peep out of you, and I'll work my way up to your neck. What do you want from me? Information. Now, come on. I want to be out of here when the police arrive. Let's go, Charlie. I'm right behind you. And I've got a gun. Sure, sure. Is it back way out of here? Uh, turn, turn to the right. What does this alley lead to? To the street. Then we go the other way. Well, listen, I... Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe you ain't the guy I saw. I know that, Sally. There are other things. All right, stop here. It's dark enough. What are you going to do? Nothing. You're going to talk. Now, what do you know about Holmes? Nothing. You only lived at the Roxmore two days. Just moved in? Yeah. Now, who paid you to identify me? Nobody. No? Uh, who paid you? I don't know who he was. Was his name Worker? I don't know. Honest, I don't know. The short, gray hair, little mustache? 
Yeah. His name's Worker, isn't it? I don't know his name. I guess you don't. But he paid you to say that you saw me go into the home's apartment, huh? I... Uh... Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now let me go. Oh, no, Charlie. You've got work to do. Where's the nearest payphone? Down the street on the corner. Okay, I'll furnish the nickel and you furnish the talk. I don't get it. What do you want me to do now? Help me smoke this work out into the open. What for? I told you, Charlie. I didn't kill Holmes. But I'd have a tough time making anyone believe that after the ring around the rosy I played tonight. Work is the boy I want. Now get moving. Yeah, yeah, sure. The police will trace this call. Don't let them make you repeat anything. It's a trick to hold you here until they can trace where this call comes from. Just say what I... Shh, shh. Hello, police. This is Charles Madison. Listen, there's something else I didn't tell you. There's another man in the Holmes murder, and... I said there's... Don't a... repeat. Keep talking. Look for a man below medium height. Gray hair. Little mustache... I don't know his name. But he carries an umbrella and he wears glasses. That's all. What? Hang up. Well, he didn't hear the last part. He heard it all right. Let's get out of here. Can I go home now? Oh, no, Charlie. I'm beginning to be real fond of you. What are you going to do now? Uh, you like taxi cabs, Charlie? Huh? We're going to ride in one cab after another till the morning papers come out. What for? The papers will carry the latest in the Holmes murder, including your description of the mysterious little man with gray hair, whose name is Worker. But, but Worker will come after me. Ah, now you're beginning to be bright about the whole thing. You kill me. Yes, like he did Holmes. Oh, you won't let him. You gotta let me go. You know, Charlie, I can't seem to work up a flood of tears for you. You frame me for money. I wouldn't have had a chance if the cleaning woman had seen me in Holmes' apartment with this gun in my hand. Well, I, I'll say I lied. Think a minute, Charlie. If you do that, it'll make you an accessory after the fact. What's that mean? Simply that the police would hold you equally as guilty as worker. Or me. Well, then what'll I do? You know, Charlie, I'm a very curious-minded person. I could go to the police. But I'd rather play it through my way. Smoke worker out in the open and see what this is all about. But How? Well, as long as Worker knows you can identify him, he'll try to find you. Get you. But if you don't go to the police, he'll know you're around somewhere, Charlie. By the way, Charlie, how does it feel to be another hare in the game? All right, pull up here, driver. Come on, Charlie, you're tired of riding? It's almost day. Yeah. A stack of morning papers on the corner. Here you are, driver. Keep the change. Charlie, there's nothing gloomier than a city just before dawn. Hmm. I'll get one of those papers. Well, where are we going then? Who knows? I've seen the whole city. Go on, get the paper. They're tied up. Untie them. Yeah. Here you are. Did you leave a nickel? Huh? You have a dishonest streak in you, Charlie. Come on, leave a nickel for the paper. All right, down this alley. Okay, in the doorway. Now we'll see what the papers have to say. Well, you're in, Charlie. Listen. The mysterious disappearance of Charles Madison has led the police to suspect foul play. See, Charlie? What else does it say? Uh, oh, here it is. Madison called the police late last night with another tip in the murder of Arthur Holmes. Madison volunteered the description of another man whose name he said he did not know. Meanwhile, police revealed Holmes... What's the matter? Why'd you stop? Meanwhile, police revealed Holmes' real name to be Albert Henning former draftsman at the Bull Mill Aircraft Company. 
Henning disappeared over a week ago, and executives of the aircraft company stated that Henning was suspected of having taken micro photographs of plans for the Navy's new twin jet fighter. He, he, he was a spy. Uh huh. And that's what he sent to Box 13. He didn't want to be caught with the photographs on him, so he used me as a hideout until he could send for them. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is we got to go to the police now. You're so right, Charlie. You're so right. Come on, I'm through playing games. This has grown a little bigger than Box 13. Both of you. Stay where you are. It's him. It's it's Worker. Yeah. Uh, don't try to use your gun, Mr. Holliday. It's not my gun. It's yours. The one you killed Henning or Holmes with. That's right. How'd you find us? Simple. You see, uh, Mr. Holliday, when I heard over the radio that you would escape from Holmes' apartment, I was a little worried. I knew you'd read or heard about this fool giving your description. I thought you might go to him and perhaps to the police. Yes, as I should have in the first place. That's right, but you didn't. <laughs> I'm glad you like adventure. So, I watched Madison's place, and I've been following you all night to see what you were going to do. And now? <laughs> do you want to guess? No. <laughs> you made it perfect for me. As perfect as Henning did when he double-crossed us and tried to sell those photographs for a higher price. Perfect for you? Yes. Think of this. Here you are in an alleyway with the only man who identified you as the murderer of Mr. Holmes. Now, you still have the gun, and I'll take it. And be careful how you hand it to me. Please hurry. Ah, thank you. Now... I shoot Mr. Madison first, and then you. And how does it look? Pretty smart, but it looks as though... It's my idea. Let me tell it. There was a struggle, shooting, and both of you are dead. Oh, it has flaws, but not glaring ones. Don't, don't. I, I'll, I'll swear I lied to the police, Mr. Worker. I'll say, Holiday killed Holmes. Honest, I will. Oh? <laughs> Better still. I will give you this gun, Madison, and you will shoot Holiday while I stand in back of you. And then you will go to the police and say you got the gun away from him when he was going to kill you. Here. Now, once you kill our friend, Mr. Holiday, you will be a murderer, and you will have to keep your mouth shut. So go ahead, Mr. Madison. Pull the trigger. Go on, pull it! Don't do it, Madison. Don't do it. Worker can't make two shootings look right. Either you pull the trigger, Madison, or I do. It's a little better to live than to die. Hurry, you idiot! I... You won't kill me? No, no. There would be no need for it unless you talk, and you won't. Madison, don't. Hey, you down there. Who's... The police! Hit the ground, Madison. Fast! You stop! All right, you asked for it. Nice shooting officer. Very nice. All right, you two. Get up off the ground. And believe me, I'm very happy to be able to do just that. What's the matter with the other guy? Hmm? <laughs> Nothing. Things are a little too much for him. He passed out. Hey, that's a guy, officer. That's a guy. Sure yeah, okay, okay. You guys stand back. All right. Officer, what kept you? Are you kidding? We've been tracing you all night. One taxi driver after another. One cab after another. You think you're going to get away with passing those phony fives all over town? That's right. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's why I passed them out. What? You know, officer, you have a very efficient police force. Oh, uh, thanks, boys. You mean you, you gave out them phony fins on purpose? Uh-huh. A very definite purpose. I don't get <laughs> it. You think it's funny, huh? Well, see how hard you can laugh at headquarters. Officer, I've never been so happy to be arrested. And boys... Yeah? I'll match every phony five with a good ten. Come on, let's go. Hello? Hello, Susie. Mr. Holiday. Gee, where are you? I was worried. You were worried? Now, listen, Susie, I'm in jail. Yes, sir. You're what? Yeah, get, get a hold of Lieutenant Kling. Tell him I've got to talk to him. But why are you in jail? That's a long story, Susie. I'll tell you all about it when I get back. But technically, the charge is passing counterfeit money. Mr. Holliday, you should be ashamed of yourself. All you had to do was open a charge account. Oh, no. Good night, Susie. <laughs> 
Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. Box 13 is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Adventures in Time and Space. Transcribed in Future Tense. Dimension The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, bring you Dimension X. In these times, even a child knows the meaning of atomic fission, jet propulsion, and electronic transmission. What, we ask ourselves, will the child of the future know? What of the time when science unlocks the secret of life itself? Could it be that one day, such things as constructing human life, or passing back and forth from one dimension to another, will become mere child's play? My name is Sam Weber. I'm an attorney, and a pretty successful one, if I do say so myself. My wife, Tina, and I live in a comfortable 12-room place up in Westchester. Now, I've read a lot of Horatio Alger stuff in my time, and so have you probably, but I'll bet you've never heard anything quite as spectacular as my story. Maybe you won't believe it, but I used to be a completely different guy. Frightened, sickly, nearsighted, a real Mortimer me. <laughs> no kidding. That was five years ago. The big change in me began to take place on a cold December morning in 1945. Uh, just a moment, please. Yes, please. Weber? Yes. Samuel? That's right. Step back. Okay, fellas, bring it in. Oh, just a moment. You must have the wrong address. Watch right. it, buddy. All right, sign here. Is uh, that for me? Weber Apartments. Looks like a coffin. I don't design them, Jack. I just deliver them. Sign here. After much straining, I wasn't in very good physical shape those days, I managed to push the box under my single light bulb. There was a card in a small envelope. Let's see. To Sam from your classmates at the Interdimensional and Cosmic Institute. Merry Christmas. 2145 A.D. Holy jumping catfish. Hey, mister, there must be some mistake. Hey! Holy jumping catfish. <laughs> They were gone, and I didn't even know which delivery company it was. Well, I finally decided to open it up and see what was in it. After about a half hour of fumbling, I gave up. All right, then, don't open. <clears throat> no sooner had I said the word open than it came apart like the skin off a banana. There inside was something resembling a kid's chemical set. Vials, jars, tubes, wires. You never saw so much scientific-looking junk in your life. And on top of it all was a book of instructions. Build a man set number three. This set is intended solely for uses of children between the ages of 11 and 13. The equipment will enable the child to build and assemble complete adult humans in perfect working order. A disassemblator is provided so the set may be used over again. Refills and additional parts may be acquired from the Builderman Company, 928 Diagonal Level, Glunt City, Ohio. Remember, only with Builderman can you build a man. When 
When I left for work that morning, my brain was still reeling with the stuff I'd read in the instruction book. Come and tell no Jack and at law. Just a moment, I will connect you with Mr. O'Jack. Oh, good morning, Mr. Weber. Oh, good lure, Aunt. I, I mean, good morning. <laughs> I've got to get my mind off that book. Only with Build a Man Can You Build a Man. Chapter one, making simple living things. Chapter two, duplicating babies and other small humans. Oh, no. I've got to get a grip on myself. Here, do a little work. O'Brien versus O'Brien. Martin versus the city of New York. Oh, it must have been a dream. Probably go home tonight and find the place empty. Well, 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 if it isn't the poor man's Clarence Darrell. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hello, Lou. I come as a bearer of sad tidings. Well, you don't look very sad. The boss wants to see you, laughing boy. Well, what about? How should I know? Oh, and by the way, uh, <laughs> you'll be very happy to know that I've just been promoted. I'm handling all the criminal stuff from now on. Congratulations. Uh, you know what this means for Tina and me, don't you, Junior? <laughs> oh, well, cheer up. Tina's not for you anyway. Some got it, some don't. I got it, you don't. <laughs> so long, laughing boy. That was my good friend, Lou White. In the year I'd known him, he'd already managed to steal a job I wanted. And he was now working on the girl I wanted. Her name was Tina. Tina Velvet. Good morning, Sam. Oh, good morning, Tina. My, you look good enough to... Yeah? Take to lunch. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam, but I promised Lou. Oh, sure. I hope you're not too disappointed. Me? Oh, no, no. Some got it, some don't. I don't. And that was Tina. I tried to steady my blood pressure as I walked into the boss's office. You sent for me, Mr. Ojak? Oh, yes. Uh, sit down, Weber. Sit down. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ojak. Weber, I've been reviewing the work of my staff counselors for the past six months. I want to know only one thing. Yes, sir. What happened? Uh, I don't understand. You haven't had a single new client in six months. But no one has come in, Mr. Ojak. My boy, in this business, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to go out and create new clients. You've got to show some zip. Yes, sir. Do you have any zip? Oh, yes. Yes, Mr. Ojak. Oh, I, I've got zip, all right. I just can't seem to turn it loose. That's well, all. Well, get in there and punch now, Weber. I want to see a change in you in the next few months. As a matter of fact, I'd better. You got that? Yes, Mr. Ojak. I'll, I'll try to show some zip. I left the office early and went home. Sure enough, there it was, my Build-A-Man set, gleaming a little obscenely in the corner. I walked over to it, gave it a kick, and hollered, Open sesame. Three minutes later, I was flopped down in bed reading... Chapter One. Making Simple Living Things. An hour later, I was fooling around with such complicated items as the junior biocalibrator, which measured everything from blood pressure to hemoglobin content, and the Jiffy Vitalizer, which was actually supposed to put life in your creation, providing you had followed instructions carefully. At 8.30, I made my first simple living thing. Here, boy. Here, boy. Oh, maybe you aren't a boy. Oh, well, let's see. Uh... Uh, according to the book, you are a rubicular oyster hog. Not much to look at, but I made you. Me, Sam Weber, attorney at law. I have created life. Hey, come back here. Come back. Here, boy. Here, boy. Hey, hey, hey. It was no use. My rubicular oyster hog, which was a cross between a field mouse and an oyster, had run out under the door and into the world. I was about to take off after it when there was a knock on my door. 